preface to the condition of the working class in england in eighteen forty four this librivox recording is in the public domain the condition of the working class in england in eighteen forty four by friedrich engels translated by florence kelly preface the book an english translation of which is here republished was first issued in germany in eighteen forty five the author at that time was young twenty-four years of age and his production bears the stamp of his youth with its good and its faulty features of neither of which he feels ashamed it was translated into english in eighteen eighty five by an american lady mrs f kelly vishnevsky and published in the following year in new york the american edition being as good as exhausted and having never been extensively circulated on this side of the atlantic the present english copyright edition is brought out with the full consent of all parties interested for the american edition a new preface and an appendix were written in english by the author the first had little to do with the book itself it discussed the american working-class movement of the day and is therefore here omitted as irrelevant the second the original preface is largely made use of in the present introductory remark the state of things described in this book belongs to-day in many respects to the past as far as england is concerned though not expressly stated in our recognized treatises it is still a law of modern political economy that the larger the scale on which capitalistic production is carried on the less can it support the petty devices of swindling and pilfering which characterize its early stages the pettifogging business tricks of the polish jew the representative in europe of commerce in its lowest stage those tricks that serve him so well in his own country and are generally practised there he finds to be out of date and out of place when he comes to hamburg or berlin and again the commission agent who hails from berlin or hamburg jew or christian after frequenting the manchester exchange for a few months finds out that in order to buy cotton yarn or cloth cheap he too had better drop those slightly more refined but still miserable wiles and subterfuges which are considered the acme of cleverness in his native country the fact is those tricks do not pay any longer in a large market where time is money and where a certain standard of commercial morality is unavoidably developed purely as a means of saving time and trouble and it is the same with the relation between the manufacturer and his quote unquote, hands the revival of trade after the crisis of eighteen forty seven was the dawn of a new industrial epoch the repeal of the corn laws and the financial reform subsequent thereon gave to english industry and commerce all the elbow-room they had asked for the discovery of the californian and australian gold-fields followed in rapid succession the colonial markets developed at an increasing rate their capacity for absorbing english manufactured goods in india millions of hand weavers were finally crushed out by the lancashire power loom china was more and more being opened up above all the united states then commercially speaking a mere colonial market but by far the biggest of them all underwent an economic development astounding even for that rapidly progressive country and finally the new means of communication introduced at the close of the preceding period railways and ocean steamers were now worked out on an international scale they realized actually what had hitherto existed only potentially a world market this world market at first was composed of a number of chiefly or entirely agricultural countries grouped around one manufacturing centre england which consumed the greater part of their surplus raw produce and supplied them in return with the greater part of their requirements in manufactured articles no wonder england's industrial progress was colossal and unparalleled and such that the status of eighteen forty four now appears to us as comparatively primitive and insignificant and in proportion as this increase took place in the same proportion did manufacturing industry become apparently moralized the competition of manufacturer against manufacturer by means of petty thefts upon the workpeople did no longer pay trade had outgrown such low means of making money they were not worth while practising for the manufacturing millionaire and served merely to keep alive the competition of smaller traders thankful to pick up a penny wherever they could thus the truck system was suppressed the ten hours bill was enacted and a number of other secondary reforms introduced much against the spirit of free trade and unbridled competition 
but quite as much in favour of the giant capitalist in his competition with his less favoured brother. Moreover, the larger the concern, and with it the number of hands, the greater the loss and inconvenience caused by every conflict between master and men. And thus a new spirit came over the masters, especially the large ones, which taught them to avoid unnecessary squabbles, to acquiesce in the existence and power of trades unions, and finally even to discover in strikes, at opportune times, a powerful means to serve their own ends. The largest manufacturers, formerly the leaders of the war against the working class, were now the foremost to preach peace and harmony, and for a very good reason. The fact is that all these concessions to justice and philanthropy were nothing else but means to accelerate the concentration of capital in the hands of the few, for whom the niggardly extra extortions of former years had lost all importance and had become actual nuisances, and to crush all the quicker and all the safer their smaller competitors, who could not make both ends meet without such perquisites. Thus the development of production on the basis of the capitalistic system has of itself sufficed, at least in the leading industries, for in the more unimportant branches this is far from being the case to do away with all those minor grievances which aggravated the workman's fate during its earlier stages. And thus it renders more and more evident the great central fact that the cause of the miserable condition of the working class is to be sought not in these minor grievances, but in the capitalistic system itself. The wage-worker sells to the capitalist his labour force for a certain daily sum. After a few hours' work he has reproduced the value of that sum, but the substance of his contract is that he has to work another series of hours to complete his working day, and the value he produces during these additional hours of surplus labour is surplus value, which costs the capitalist nothing, but yet goes into his pocket. That is the basis of the system which tends more and more to split up civilized society into a few Rothschilds and Vanderbilts, the owners of all the means of production and subsistence on the one hand, and an immense number of wage-workers, the owners of nothing but their labour-force, on the other. And that this result is caused not by this or that secondary grievance, but by the system itself, this fact has been brought out in bold relief by the development of capitalism in England since 1847. Again, the repeated visitations of cholera, typhus, smallpox, and other epidemics have shown the British bourgeois the urgent necessity of sanitation in his towns and cities, if he wishes to save himself and family from falling victims to such diseases. Accordingly, the most crying abuses described in this book have either disappeared or have been made less conspicuous. Drainage has been introduced or improved, wide avenues have been opened out athwart many of the worst slums I had to describe. Little Ireland has disappeared, and the seven dials are next on the list for sweeping away. But what of that? Whole districts which in 1844 I could describe as almost idyllic have now, with the growth of the towns, fallen into the same state of dilapidation, discomfort, and misery. Only the pigs and the heaps of refuse are no longer tolerated. The bourgeoisie have made further progress in the art of hiding the distress of the working class but that in regard to their dwellings no substantial improvement has taken place, is amply proved by the report of the Royal Commission on the Housing of the Poor, 1885. And this is the case, too, in other respects. Police regulations have been plentiful as blackberries, but they can only hedge in the distress of the workers, they cannot remove it. But while England has thus outgrown the juvenile state of capitalist exploitation described by me, other countries have only just attained it. France, Germany, and especially America, are the formidable competitors who, at this moment, as foreseen by me in 1844, are more and more breaking up England's industrial monopoly. Their manufactures are young as compared with those of England, but increasing at a far more rapid rate than the latter, and, curious enough, they have at this moment arrived at about the same phase of development as English manufacture in 1844. With regard to America, the parallel is indeed most striking. True, the external surroundings in which the working class is placed in America are very different, but the same economical laws are at work, and the results, if not identical in every respect, must still be of the same order. Hence we find in America the same struggles for a shorter working day, 
for a legal limitation of the working time especially of women and children in factories we find the truck system in full blossom and the cottage system in rural districts made use of by the quote unquote bosses as a means of domination over the workers when i received in eighteen eighty six the american papers with accounts of the great strike of twelve thousand pennsylvanian coal miners in the connellsville district i seemed but to read my own description of the north of england collier strike of eighteen forty four the same cheating of the workpeople by false measure the same truck system the same attempt to break the miners resistance by the capitalists last but crushing resource the eviction of the men out of their dwellings the cottages owned by the companies i have not attempted in this translation to bring the book up to date or to point out in detail all the changes that have taken place since eighteen forty four and for two reasons firstly to do this properly the size of the book must be about doubled and secondly the first volume of das kapital by karl marx an english translation of which is before the public contains a very ample description of the state of the british working class as it was about eighteen sixty five that is to say at the time when british industrial prosperity reached its culminating point i should then have been obliged again to go over the ground already covered by marx's celebrated work it will be hardly necessary to point out that the general theoretical standpoint of this book philosophical economical political does not exactly coincide with my standpoint of to-day modern international socialism since fully developed as a science chiefly and almost exclusively through the efforts of marx did not as yet exist in eighteen forty four my book represents one of the phases of its embryonic development and as the human embryo in its early stages still reproduces the gill arches of our fish ancestors so this book exhibits everywhere the traces of the descent of modern socialism from one of its ancestors german philosophy thus great stress is laid on the dictum that communism is not a mere party doctrine of the working class but a theory compassing the emancipation of society at large including the capitalist class from its present narrow conditions this is true enough in the abstract but absolutely useless and sometimes worse in practice so long as the wealthy classes not only do not feel the want of any emancipation but strenuously oppose the self-emancipation of the working class so long the social revolution will have to be prepared and fought out by the working class alone the french bourgeois of seventeen eighty nine too declared the emancipation of the bourgeoisie to be the emancipation of the whole human race but the nobility and clergy would not see it the proposition though for the time being with respect to feudalism an abstract historical truth soon became a mere sentimentalism and disappeared from view altogether in the fire of the revolutionary struggle and to-day the very people who from the quote unquote, impartiality of their superior standpoint preach to the workers a socialism soaring high above their class interests and class struggles and tending to reconcile in a higher humanity the interests of both the contending classes these people are either neophytes who have still to learn a great deal or they are the worst enemies of the workers wolves in sheep's clothing the recurring period of the great industrial crisis is stated in the text as five years this was the period apparently indicated by the course of events from eighteen twenty five to eighteen forty two but the industrial history from eighteen forty two to eighteen sixty eight has shown that the real period is one of ten years that the intermediate revulsions were secondary and tended more and more to disappear since eighteen sixty eight the state of things has changed again of which more anon i have taken care not to strike out of the text the many prophecies amongst others that of an imminent social revolution in england which my youthful ardour induced me to venture upon the wonder is not that a good many of them proved wrong but that so many of them proved right and that the critical state of english trade to be brought on by continental and especially american competition which i then foresaw though in too short a period has now actually come to pass in this respect i can and am bound to bring the book up to date by placing here an article which i published in the london commonweal of march one eighteen eighty five under the heading quote, england in eighteen forty five and in eighteen eighty five it gives at the same time 
a short outline of the history of the english working class during these forty years and is as follows Quote, forty years ago england stood face to face with a crisis solvable to all appearances by force only the immense and rapid development of manufactures had outstripped the extension of foreign markets and the increase of demand every ten years the march of industry was violently interrupted by a general commercial crash followed after a long period of chronic depression by a few short years of prosperity and always ending in feverish overproduction and consequent renewed collapse the capitalist class clamoured for free trade in corn and threatened to enforce it by sending the starving population of the towns back to the country districts whence they came to invade them as john bright said not as paupers begging for bread but as an army quartered upon the enemy the working masses of the towns demanded their share of political power the people's charter they were supported by the majority of the small trading class and the only difference between the two was whether the charter should be carried by physical or by moral force then came the commercial crash of eighteen forty seven and the irish famine and with both the prospect of revolution the french revolution of eighteen forty eight saved the english middle class the socialistic pronunciamentos of the victorious french workmen frightened the small middle class of england and disorganized the narrower but more matter-of-fact movement of the english working class at the very moment when chartism was bound to assert itself in its full strength it collapsed internally before even it collapsed externally on the tenth of april eighteen forty eight the action of the working class was thrust into the background the capitalist class triumphed along the whole line the reform bill of eighteen thirty one had been the victory of the whole capitalist class over the landed aristocracy the repeal of the corn laws was the victory of the manufacturing capitalist not only over the landed aristocracy but over those sections of capitalists too whose interests were more or less bound up with the landed interest bankers stock jobbers fund holders etc free trade meant the readjustment of the whole home and foreign commercial and financial policy of england in accordance with the interests of the manufacturing capitalists the class which now represented the nation and they will set about this task with a will every obstacle to industrial production was mercilessly removed the tariff and the whole system of taxation were revolutionized everything was made subordinate to one end but that end of the utmost importance to the manufacturing capitalist the cheapening of all raw produce and especially of the means of living of the working class the reduction of the cost of raw material and the keeping down if not as yet the bringing down of wages england was to become the workshop of the world all other countries were to become for england what ireland already was markets for her manufactured goods supplying her in return with raw materials and food england the great manufacturing centre of an agricultural world with an ever-increasing number of corn and cotton-growing irelands revolving around her the industrial sun what a glorious prospect the manufacturing capitalists set about the realization of this their great object with that strong common sense and that contempt for traditional principles which has ever distinguished them from their more narrow-minded compeers on the continent chartism was dying out the revival of commercial prosperity natural after the revulsion of eighteen forty seven had spent itself was put down altogether to the credit of free trade both these circumstances had turned the english working class politically into the tail of the great liberal party the party led by the manufacturers this advantage once gained had to be perpetuated and the manufacturing capitalists from the chartist opposition not to free trade but to the transformation of free trade into the one vital national question had learned and were learning more and more that the middle class can never obtain full social and political power over the nation except by the help of the working class thus a gradual change came over the relations between both classes the factory acts once the bugbear of all manufacturers were not only willingly submitted to but their expansion into acts regulating almost all trades was tolerated trades unions hitherto considered inventions of the devil himself were now petted and patronized as perfectly legitimate institutions 
and as useful means of spreading sound economical doctrines amongst the workers. Even strikes, than which nothing had been more nefarious up to 1848, were now gradually found out to be occasionally very useful, especially when provoked by the masters themselves, at their own time. Of the legal enactments, placing the workmen at a lower level or at a disadvantage with regard to the master, at least the most revolting were repealed. And practically that horrid people's charter actually became the political programme of the very manufacturers who had opposed it to the last. The abolition of the property qualification and vote by ballot are now the law of the land. The Reform Acts of 1867 and 1884 make a near approach to universal suffrage, at least such as it now exists in Germany. The redistribution bill now before Parliament creates equal electoral districts, on the whole not more unequal than those of Germany. Payment of members, and shorter if not actually annual parliaments, are visibly looming in the distance. And yet there are people who say that Chartism is dead. The revolution of 1848, not less than many of its predecessors, has had strange bedfellows and successors. The very people who put it down have become, as Karl Marx used to say, its testamentary executors. Louis-Napoleon had to create an independent and united Italy, Bismarck had to revolutionize Germany and to restore Hungarian independence, and the English manufacturers had to enact the People's Charter. For England, the effects of this domination of the manufacturing capitalists were at first startling. Trade revived and extended to a degree unheard of even in this cradle of modern industry. The previous astounding creations of steam and machinery dwindled into nothing compared with the immense mass of productions of the twenty years from 1850 to 1870, with the overwhelming figures of exports and imports, of wealth accumulated in the hands of capitalists, and of human working power concentrated in the large towns. The progress was indeed interrupted, as before, by a crisis every ten years, in 1857 as well as in 1866. But these revulsions were now considered as natural, inevitable events, which must be fatalistically submitted to, and which always set themselves right in the end. And the condition of the working class during this period? There was temporary improvement even for the great mass, but this improvement always was reduced to the old level by the influx of the great body of the unemployed reserve, by the constant superseding of bands by new machinery, by the immigration of the agricultural population, now too more and more superseded by machines. A permanent improvement can be recognized for two protected sections only of the working class. Firstly, the factory hands. The fixing by act of Parliament of their working day within relatively rational limits has restored their physical constitution and endowed them with a moral superiority enhanced by their local concentration. They are undoubtedly better off than before 1848. The best proof is that, out of ten strikes they make, nine are provoked by the manufacturers in their own interests as the only means of securing a reduced production. You can never get the masters to agree to work short time, let manufactured goods be ever so unsaleable, but get the work people to strike, and the masters shut their factories to a man. Secondly, the great trades unions. They are the organizations of those trades in which the labor of grown-up men predominates, or is alone applicable. Here the competition neither of women and children nor of machinery has so far weakened their organized strength. The engineers, the carpenters, and joiners, the bricklayers, are each of them a power, to that extent that, as in the case of the bricklayers and bricklayers' laborers, they can even successfully resist the introduction of machinery. That their condition has remarkably improved since 1848, there can be no doubt, and the best proof of this is in the fact that for more than fifteen years not only have their employers been with them, but they with their employers, upon exceedingly good terms. They form an aristocracy among the working class. They have succeeded in enforcing for themselves a relatively comfortable position, and they accept it as final. They are the model working men of Messrs. Leone Levy and Giffen, and they are very nice people indeed nowadays to deal with, for any sensible capitalist in particular, and for the whole capitalist class in general. But as to the great mass of working people, the state of misery and insecurity in which they live now is as low as ever, if not lower. The east end of London is an ever-spreading pool of stagnant misery and desolation, 
of starvation when out of work, and degradation, physical and moral, when in work. And so in all other towns, abstraction made of the privileged minority of the workers, and so in the smaller towns and in the agricultural districts. The law which reduces the value of labor power to the value of the necessary means of subsistence, and the other law which reduces its average price as a rule to the minimum of those means of subsistence, these laws act upon them with the irresistible force of an automatic engine, which crushes them between its wheels. This, then, was the position created by the free trade policy of 1847, and by twenty years of the rule of the manufacturing capitalists. But then a change came. The crash of 1866 was indeed followed by a slight and short revival about 1873. But that did not last. We did not indeed pass through the full crisis at the time it was due, in 1877 or 1878, but we have had ever since 1876 a chronic state of stagnation in all dominant branches of industry. Neither will the full crash come, nor will the period of longed-for prosperity to which we used to be entitled before and after it. A dull depression, a chronic glut of all markets for all trades, that is what we have been living in for nearly ten years. How is this? The free trade theory was based upon one assumption, that England was to be the one great manufacturing centre of an agricultural world and the actual fact is that this assumption has turned out to be a pure delusion. The conditions of modern industry, steam power and machinery, can be established wherever there is fuel, especially coals, and other countries beside England, France, Belgium, Germany, America, even Russia, have coals, and the people over there did not see the advantage of being turned into Irish pauper farmers merely for the greater wealth and glory of English capitalists. They set resolutely about manufacturing, not only for themselves, but for the rest of the world, and the consequence is that the manufacturing monopoly enjoyed by England for nearly a century is irretrievably broken up. But the manufacturing monopoly of England is the pivot of the present social system of England. Even while that monopoly lasted, the markets could not keep pace with the increasing productivity of English manufacturers. The decennial crises were the consequence and new markets are getting scarcer every day, so much so that even the Negroes of the Congo are now to be forced into the civilization attendant upon Manchester calicoes, Staffordshire pottery, and Birmingham hardware. How will it be when continental, and especially American, goods flow in in ever-increasing quantities, when the predominating share, still held by British manufacturers, will become reduced from year to year? Answer? Free trade thou universal panacea. I am not the first to point this out. Already in 1883, at the Southport meeting of the British Association, Mr. Inglis Palgrave, the president of the economic section, stated plainly that, quote, the days of great trade profits in England were over, and there was a pause in the progress of several great branches of industrial labor. The country might almost be said to be entering the non-progressive state, end quote but what is to be the consequence? Capitalist production cannot stop. It must go on increasing and expanding, or it must die. Even now the mere reduction of England's lion's share in the supply of the world's markets means stagnation, distress, excess of capital here, excess of unemployed workpeople there. What will it be when the increase of yearly production is brought to a complete stop? Here is the vulnerable place the heel of Achilles for capitalist production. Its very basis is the necessity of constant expansion, and this constant expansion now becomes impossible. It ends in a deadlock. Every year England is brought nearer face to face with the question, either the country must go to pieces, or capitalist production must. Which is it to be? And the working class? Even under the unparalleled commercial and industrial expansion from 1848 to 1868, they have had to undergo such misery. If even then the great bulk of them experienced at best but a temporary improvement of their condition, while only a small, privileged, protected minority was permanently benefited, what will it be when this dazzling period is brought finally to a close? When the present dreary stagnation shall not only become intensified, 
but this its intensified condition shall become the permanent and normal state of english trade the truth is this during the period of england's industrial monopoly the english working class have to a certain extent shared in the benefits of the monopoly these benefits were very unequally parcelled out amongst them the privileged minority pocketed most but even the great mass had at least a temporary share now and then and that is the reason why since the dying out of owenism there has been no socialism in england with the breakdown of that monopoly the english working class will lose that privileged position it will find itself generally the privileged and leading minority not accepted on a level with its fellow workers abroad and that is the reason why there will be socialism again in england End quote. to this statement of the case as that case appeared to me in eighteen eighty five i have but little to add needless to say that to-day there is indeed socialism again in england and plenty of it socialism of all shades socialism conscious and unconscious socialism prosaic and poetic socialism of the working class and of the middle class for verily that abomination of abominations socialism has not only become respectable but has actually donned evening dress and lounges lazily on drawing-room causeuses that shows the incurable fickleness of that terrible despot of society middle-class public opinion and once more justifies the contempt in which we socialists of a past generation always held that public opinion at the same time we have no reason to grumble at the symptom itself what i consider far more important than this momentary fashion among bourgeois circles of affecting a mild dilution of socialism and even more than the actual progress socialism has made in england generally that is the revival of the east end of london that immense haunt of misery is no longer the stagnant pool it was six years ago it has shaken off its torpid despair has returned to life and has become the home of what is called the quote unquote, new unionism that is to say of the organization of the great mass of quote unquote, unskilled workers this organization may to a great extent adopt the form of the old unions of skilled workers but it is essentially different in character the old unions preserve the traditions of the time when they were founded and look upon the wages system as a once for all established final fact which they at best can modify in the interest of their members the new unions were founded at a time when the faith in the eternity of the wages system was severely shaken their founders and promoters were socialists either consciously or by feeling the masses whose adhesion gave them strength were rough neglected looked down upon by the working-class aristocracy but they had this immense advantage that their minds were virgin soil entirely free from the inherited quote unquote, respectable bourgeois prejudices which hampered the brains of the better suited old unionists and thus we see now these new unions taking the lead of the working-class movement generally and more and more taking in tow the rich and proud old unions undoubtedly the east enders have committed colossal blunders so have their predecessors and so do the doctrinaire socialists who pooh-pooh them a large class like a great nation never learns better or quicker than by undergoing the consequences of its own mistakes and for all the faults committed in the past present and future the revival of the east end of london remains one of the greatest and most fruitful facts of this fin de siècle and glad and proud i am to have lived to see it f engels january eleventh eighteen ninety two end of preface Introduction to the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Introduction. The history of the proletariat in England begins with the second half of the last century, with the invention of the steam engine and of machinery for working cotton. These conventions gave rise, as is well known, to an industrial revolution a revolution which altered the whole civil society one the historical importance of which is only now beginning to be recognized england is the classic soil of this transformation which was all the mightier the more silently it proceeded 
and england is therefore the classic land of its chief product also the proletariat only in england can the proletariat be studied in all its relations and from all sides we have not here and now to deal with the history of this revolution nor with its vast importance for the present and the future such a delineation must be reserved for a future more comprehensive work for the moment we must limit ourselves to the little that is necessary for understanding the facts that follow for comprehending the present state of the english proletariat before the introduction of machinery the spinning and weaving of raw materials was carried on in the working man's home wife and daughter spun the yarn that the father wove or that they sold if he did not work it up himself these weaver families lived in the country in the neighbourhood of the towns and could get on fairly well with their wages because the home market was almost the only one and the crushing power of competition that came later with the conquest of foreign markets and the extension of trade did not yet press upon wages there was further a constant increase in the demand for the home market keeping pace with the slow increase in population and employing all the workers and there was also the impossibility of vigorous competition of the workers among themselves consequent upon the rural dispersion of their homes so it was that the weaver was usually in a position to lay by something and rent a little piece of land that he cultivated in his leisure hours of which he had as many as he chose to take since he could weave whenever and as long as he pleased true he was a bad farmer and managed his land inefficiently often obtaining but poor crops nevertheless he was no proletarian he had a stake in the country he was permanently settled and stood one step higher in society than the english workmen of to-day so the workers vegetated throughout a passably comfortable existence leading a righteous and peaceful life in all piety and probity and their material position was far better than that of their successors they did not need to overwork they did no more than they chose to do and yet earned what they needed they had leisure for healthful work in garden or field work which in itself was recreation for them and they could take part besides in the recreations and games of their neighbours and all these games bowling cricket football etc contributed to their physical health and vigour they were for the most part strong well-built people in whose physique little or no difference from that of their peasant neighbours was discoverable their children grew up in the fresh country air and if they could help their parents at work it was only occasionally while of eight or twelve hours work for them there was no question what the moral and intellectual character of this class was may be guessed shut off from the towns which they never entered their yarn and woven stuff being delivered to travelling agents for payment of wages so shut off that old people who lived quite in the neighbourhood of the town never went thither until they were robbed of their trade by the introduction of machinery and obliged to look about them in the towns for work the weavers stood upon the moral and intellectual plane of the yeomen with whom they were usually immediately connected through their little holdings they regarded their squire the greatest landholder of the region as their natural superior they asked advice of him laid their small disputes before him for settlement and gave him all the honour as this patriarchal relation involved they were respectable people good husbands and fathers led moral lives because they had no temptation to be immoral there being no groggeries or low houses in their vicinity and because the host at whose inn they now and then quenched their thirst was also a respectable man usually a large tenant farmer who took pride in his good order good beer and early hours they had their children the whole day at home and brought them up in obedience and the fear of god the patriarchal relationship remained undisturbed so long as the children were unmarried the young people grew up in idyllic simplicity and intimacy with their playmates until they married and even though sexual intercourse before marriage almost unfailingly took place this happened only when the moral obligation of marriage was recognized on both sides and a subsequent wedding made everything good in short the english industrial workers of those days lived and thought after the fashion still to be found here and there in germany in retirement and seclusion without mental activity and without violent fluctuations in their position in life they could rarely read and far more rarely write went regularly to church never talked politics never conspired never thought delighted in physical exercises, listened with inherited reverence when the Bible was read, and were, in their unquestioning humility, exceedingly well disposed towards the superior classes. But intellectually they were dead, lived only for their petty private interest, for their looms and gardens, and knew nothing of the mighty movement which, beyond their horizon, was sweeping through mankind. 
they were comfortable in their silent vegetation, and but for the industrial revolution they would never have emerged from this existence, which, cosily romantic as it was, was nevertheless not worthy of human beings. In truth, they were not human beings, they were merely toiling machines in the service of the few aristocrats who had guided history down to that time. The industrial revolution has simply carried this out to its logical end by making the workers machines pure and simple, taking from them the last trace of independent activity, and so forcing them to think and demand a position worthy of men. As in France politics, so in England manufacture, and the movement of civil society in general drew into the whirl of history the last classes which had remained sunk in apathetic indifference to the universal interests of mankind. The first invention which gave rise to a radical change in the state of the English workers was the jenny, invented in the year 1764 by a weaver, James Hargraves, of Standhill, near Blackburn, in North Lancashire. This machine was the rough beginning of the later invented mule, and was moved by hand. Instead of one spindle like the ordinary spinning-wheel, it carried sixteen or eighteen manipulated by a single workman. This invention made it possible to deliver more yarn than heretofore. Whereas, though one weaver had employed three spinners, there had never been enough yarn, and the weaver had often been obliged to wait for it, there was now more yarn to be had than could be woven by the available workers. The demand for woven goods, already increasing, rose yet more in consequence of the cheapness of these goods, which cheapness in turn was the outcome of the diminished cost of producing the yarn. More weavers were needed, and weavers' wages rose. Now that the weaver could earn more at his loom, he gradually abandoned his farming, and gave his whole time to weaving. At that time a family of four grown persons and two children, who were set to spooling, could earn, with eight hours' daily work, four pounds sterling in a week and often more if trade was good and work pressed. It happened often enough that a single weaver earned two pounds a week at his loom. By degrees the class of farming weavers wholly disappeared, and was merged in the newly arising class of weavers who lived wholly upon wages, had no property whatever, not even the pretended property of a holding, and so became working men, proletarians. Moreover, the old relation between spinner and weaver was destroyed. Hitherto, so far as this had been possible, yarn had been spun and woven under one roof. Now that the jenny as well as the loom required a strong hand, men began to spin, and whole families lived by spinning, while others laid the antiquated, superseded spinning-wheel aside, and if they had not means of purchasing a jenny, were forced to live upon the wages of the father alone. Thus began with spinning and weaving that division of labour which has since been so infinitely perfected. While the industrial proletariat was thus developing with the first still very imperfect machine, the same machine gave rise to the agricultural proletariat. There had hitherto been a vast number of small landowners, yeomen, who had vegetated in the same unthinking quiet as their neighbours, the farming weavers. They cultivated their scraps of land quite after the ancient and inefficient fashion of their ancestors, and opposed every change with the obstinacy peculiar to such creatures of habit after remaining stationary from generation to generation. Among them were many small holders also, not tenants in the present sense of the word, but people who had their land handed down from their fathers, either by hereditary lease or by force of ancient custom, and had hitherto held it as securely as if it had actually been their own property. When the industrial workers withdrew from agriculture, a great number of small holdings fell idle, and upon these the new class of large tenants established themselves, tenants at will, holding fifty, one hundred, two hundred or more acres, liable to be turned out at the end of the year, but able by improved tillage and larger farming to increase the yield of the land. They could sell their produce more cheaply than the yeoman, for whom nothing remained when his farm no longer supported him but to sell it, procure a jenny or a loom, or take service as an agricultural labourer in the employ of a large farmer. His inherited slowness and the inefficient methods of cultivation bequeathed by his ancestors, and above which he could not rise, left him no alternative when forced to compete with men who managed their holdings on sounder principles, and with all the advantages bestowed by farming on a large scale, and the investment of capital for the improvement of the soil. Meanwhile, the industrial movement did not stop here. Single capitalists began to set up spinning jennies in great buildings, and to use water-power for driving them so placing themselves in a position to diminish the number of workers, and sell their yarn more cheaply than single spinners could do who moved their own machines by hand. 
there were constant improvements in the jenny so that machines continually became antiquated and must be altered or even laid aside and though the capitalists could hold out by the application of water-power even with the old machinery for the single spinner this was impossible and the factory system the beginning of which was thus made received a fresh extension in seventeen sixty seven through the spinning throstle invented by richard arkwright a barber in preston in north lancashire after the steam engine this is the most important mechanical invention of the eighteenth century it was calculated from the beginning for mechanical motive power and was based upon wholly new principles by the combination of the peculiarities of the jenny and throstle samuel crompton of firwood lancashire contrived the mule in seventeen eighty five and as arkwright invented the carding engine and preparatory that is slubbing and roving frames about the same time the factory system became the prevailing one for the spinning of cotton by means of trifling modifications these machines were gradually adapted to the spinning of flax and so to the superseding of handwork here too but even then the end was not yet in the closing years of the last century dr cartwright a country parson had invented the power loom and about eighteen o four had so far perfected it that it could successfully compete with the hand weaver and all this machinery was made doubly important by james watt's steam engine invented in seventeen sixty four and used for supplying motive power for spinning since seventeen eighty five with these inventions since improved from year to year the victory of machine-work over handwork in the chief branches of english industry was won and the history of the latter from that time forward simply relates how the handworkers have been driven by machinery from one position after another the consequences of this were on the one hand a rapid fall in price of all manufactured commodities prosperity of commerce and manufacture the conquest of nearly all the unprotected foreign markets the sudden multiplication of capital and national wealth on the other hand a still more rapid multiplication of the proletariat the destruction of all property holding and of all security of employment for the working class demoralization political excitement and all those facts so highly repugnant to englishmen in comfortable circumstances which we shall have to consider in the following pages having already seen what a transformation in the social condition of the lower classes a single such clumsy machine as the jenny had wrought there is no cause for surprise as to that which a complete and interdependent system of finely adjusted machinery has brought about machinery which receives raw material and turns out woven goods meanwhile let us trace the development of english manufacture somewhat more minutely beginning with the cotton industry in the years seventeen seventy one to seventeen seventy five there were annually imported into england rather less than five million pounds of raw cotton in the year eighteen forty one there were imported five hundred and twenty eight million pounds and the import for eighteen forty four will reach at least six hundred million pounds in eighteen forty four england exported five hundred and fifty six million yards of woven cotton goods seventy six million five hundred thousand pounds of cotton yarn and cotton hosiery of the value of one million two hundred thousand pounds in the same year over eight million mule spindles were at work one hundred and ten thousand power and two hundred and fifty thousand hand looms throstle spindles not included in the service of the cotton industry and according to mcculloch's reckoning nearly a million and a half human beings were supported by this branch of whom but two hundred and twenty thousand worked in the mills the power used in these mills was steam equivalent to thirty three thousand horsepower and water equivalent to eleven thousand horsepower at present these figures are far from adequate and it may be safely assumed that in the year eighteen forty five the power and number of the machines and the number of the workers is greater by one-half than it was in eighteen thirty four the chief centre of this industry is lancashire where it originated it has thoroughly revolutionized this county converting it from an obscure ill-cultivated swamp into a busy lively region multiplying its population tenfold in eighty years and causing giant cities such as liverpool and manchester containing together seven hundred thousand inhabitants and their neighbouring towns bolton with sixty thousand rockdale with seventy five thousand oldham with fifty thousand preston with sixty thousand ashton and stalybridge with forty thousand and a whole list of other manufacturing towns to spring up as if by a magic touch the history of south lancashire contains some of the greatest marvels of modern times 
yet no one ever mentions them, and all these miracles are the product of the cotton industry. Glasgow, too, the centre for the cotton district of Scotland, for Lanarkshire and Renfrewshire has increased in population from 30,000 to 300,000 since the introduction of the industry. The hosiery manufacture of Nottingham and Derby also received one fresh impulse from the lower price of yarn, and a second one from an improvement of the stocking loom, by means of which two stockings could be woven at once. The manufacture of lace, too, became an important branch of industry after the invention of the lace machine in 1777. Soon after that date, Lindley invented the point-net machine, and in 1809 Heathcote invented the bobbinet machine, in consequence of which the production of lace was greatly simplified, and the demand increased proportionately in consequence of the diminished cost, so that now at least 200,000 persons are supported by this industry. Its chief centres are Nottingham, Leicester, and the west of England, Wiltshire, Devonshire, etc. A corresponding extension has taken place in the branches dependent upon the cotton industry, in dyeing, bleaching, and printing, bleaching by the application of chlorine in place of the oxygen of the atmosphere, dyeing and printing by the rapid development of chemistry, and printing by a series of most brilliant mechanical inventions, a yet greater advance which, with the extension of these branches caused by the growth of the cotton industry, raised them to a previously unknown degree of prosperity. The same activity manifested itself in the manufacture of wool. This had hitherto been the leading department of English industry, but the quantities formerly produced are as nothing in comparison with that which is now manufactured. In 1782 the whole wool crop of the preceding three years lay unused for want of workers, and would have continued so to lie if the newly invented machinery had not come to its assistance and spun it. The adaptation of this machinery to the spinning of wool was most successfully accomplished. Then began the same sudden development in the wool district, which we have already seen in the cotton districts. In 1738 there were 75,000 pieces of woolen cloth produced in the West Riding of Yorkshire. In 1817 there were 490,000 pieces, and so rapid was the extension of the industry that in 1834 450 million more pieces were produced than in 1825. In 1801, 101 million pounds of wool, 7 million pounds of it imported, were worked up. In 1835, 180 million pounds were worked up, of which 42 million pounds were imported. The principal centre of this industry is the West Riding of Yorkshire, where, especially at Bradford, long English wool is converted into worsted yarns, etc., while in the other cities, Leeds, Halifax, Huddersfield, etc., short wool is converted into hard-spun yarn and cloth. Then come the adjacent part of Lancashire, the region of Rockdale, where, in addition to the cotton industry, much flannel is produced, and the west of England which supplies the finest cloths. Here also the growth of population is worthy of observation. Bradford contained in 1801 29,000, and in 1831 77,000 inhabitants. Halifax contained in 1801 68,000, and in 1831 110,000. Huddersfield in 1801 15,000, in 1831 34,000. Leeds in 1801 contained 53,000, in 1831 123,000 and the whole West Riding in 1801 contained 564,000, and in 1831 980,000 inhabitants, a population which, since 1831, must have increased at least 20 to 25 per cent further. In 1835 the spinning of wool employed in the United Kingdom 1,313 mills, with 71,300 workers, these last being but a small portion of the multitude who are supported directly or indirectly by the manufacture of wool, and excluding nearly all weavers. Progress in the linen trade developed later, because the nature of the raw material made the application of spinning machinery very difficult. Attempts had been made in the last years of the last century in Scotland, but the Frenchman Girard, who introduced flax spinning in 1810, was the first who succeeded practically, and even Girard's machines first attained on British soil the importance they deserved by means of improvements which they underwent in England, and of their universal application in Leeds, Dundee, and Belfast. From this time the British linen trade rapidly extended. 
In 1814, 3,000 tons of flax were imported. In 1833, nearly 19,000 tons of flax and 3,400 tons of hemp. The export of Irish linen to Great Britain rose from 32 million yards in 1800 to 53 million yards in 1825, of which a large part was re-exported. The export of English and Scotch woven linen goods rose from 24 million yards in 1820 to 51 million yards in 1833. The number of flax spinning establishments in 1835 was 347, employing 33,000 workers, of which one half were in the south of Scotland, more than 60 in the west riding of Yorkshire, Leeds and its environs, 25 in Belfast, Ireland, and the rest in Dorset and Lancashire weaving is carried on in the south of Scotland, here and there in England, but principally in Ireland. With like success did the English turn their attention to the manufacture of silk. Raw material was imported from southern Europe and Asia ready spun, and the chief labour lay in the twisting of fine threads. Until 1824 the heavy import duty, four shillings per pound on raw material, greatly retarded the development of the English silk industry, while only the markets of England and the colonies were protected for it. In that year the duty was reduced to one penny, and the number of mills at once largely increased. In a single year the number of throwing spindles rose from 780,000 to 1,180,000, and although the commercial crisis of 1825 crippled this branch of industry for the moment, yet in 1827 more was produced than ever the mechanical skill and experience of the English having secured their twisting machinery the supremacy over the awkward devices of their competitors. In 1835 the British Empire possessed 263 twisting mills, employing 30,000 workers, located chiefly in Cheshire, in Macclesfield, Congleton and the surrounding districts, and in Manchester and Somersetshire. Besides these there are numerous mills for working up waste, from which a peculiar article known as spun silk is manufactured, with which the English supply even the Paris and Lyon weavers. The weaving of the silk so twisted and spun is carried on in Paisley and elsewhere in Scotland, and in Spitalfields, London, but also in Manchester and elsewhere. Nor is the gigantic advance achieved in English manufacture since 1760 restricted to the production of clothing materials. The impulse, once given, was communicated to all branches of industrial activity, and a multitude of inventions wholly unrelated to those here cited received double importance from the fact that they were made in the midst of the universal movement. But as soon as the immeasurable importance of mechanical power was practically demonstrated, every energy was concentrated in the effort to exploit this power in all directions, and to exploit it in the interest of individual inventors and manufacturers and the demand for machinery, fuel, and materials called a mass of workers and a number of trades into redoubled activity. The steam engine first gave importance to the broad coal fields of England. The production of machinery began now for the first time, and with it arose a new interest in the iron mines which supplied raw material for it. The increased consumption of wool stimulated English sheep breeding, and the growing importation of wool, flax, and silk called forth an extension of the British ocean-carrying trade. Greatest of all was the growth of production of iron. The rich iron deposits of the English hills had hitherto been little developed. Iron had always been smelted by means of charcoal, which became gradually more expensive as agriculture improved, and forests were cut away. The beginning of the use of coke in iron smelting had been made in the last century and in 1780 a new method was invented of converting into available wrought iron coke-smelted iron, which up to that time had been convertible into cast iron only. This process, known as puddling, consists in withdrawing the carbon which had mixed with the iron during the process of smelting, and opened a wholly new field for the production of English iron. Smelting furnaces were built fifty times larger than before, the process of smelting was simplified by the introduction of hot blasts, and iron could thus be produced so cheaply that a multitude of objects which had before been made of stone or wood were now made of iron. In 1788 Thomas Paine, the famous Democrat, built in Yorkshire the first iron bridge, which was followed by a great number of others, so that now nearly all bridges, especially for railroad traffic, are built of cast iron while in London itself a bridge across the Thames, the Southwark Bridge, has been built of this material. 
iron pillars supports for machinery etc are universally used and since the introduction of gas lighting and railroads new outlets for english iron products are opened nails and screws gradually came to be made by machinery huntsman a sheffielder discovered in seventeen ninety a method for casting steel by which much labour was saved and the production of wholly new cheap goods rendered practicable and through the greater purity of the material placed at its disposal and the more perfect tools new machinery and minute division of labour the metal trade of england now first attained importance the population of birmingham grew from seventy three thousand in eighteen o one to two hundred thousand in eighteen forty four that of sheffield from forty six thousand in eighteen o one to one hundred and ten thousand in eighteen forty four and the consumption of coal in the latter city alone reached in eighteen thirty six five hundred and fifteen thousand tons in eighteen o five there were exported four thousand three hundred tons of iron products and four thousand six hundred tons of pig iron in eighteen thirty four sixteen thousand two hundred tons of iron products and one hundred and seven thousand tons of pig iron while the whole iron product reaching in seventeen forty but seventeen thousand tons had risen in eighteen thirty four to nearly seven hundred thousand tons the smelting of pig iron alone consumes yearly more than three million tons of coal and the importance which coal mining has attained in the course of the last sixty years can scarcely be conceived all the english and scotch deposits are now worked and the mines of northumberland and durham alone yield annually more than five million tons for shipping and employ from forty to fifty thousand men according to the durham chronicle there were worked in these two counties in seventeen fifty three fourteen mines in eighteen hundred forty mines in eighteen thirty six seventy six mines in eighteen forty three one hundred and thirty mines moreover all mines are now much more energetically worked than formerly a similarly increased activity was applied to the working of tin copper and lead and alongside of the extension of glass manufacture arose a new branch of industry in the production of pottery rendered important by the efforts of josiah wedgwood about seventeen sixty three this inventor placed the whole manufacture of stoneware on a scientific basis introduced better taste and founded the potteries of north staffordshire a district of eight english miles square which formerly a desert waste is now sown with works and dwellings and supports more than sixty thousand people into this universal whirl of activity everything was drawn agriculture made a corresponding advance not only did landed property pass as we have already seen into the hands of new owners and cultivators agriculture was effected in still another way the great holders applied capital to the improvement of the soil tore down needless fences drained manured employed better tools and applied a rotation of crops the progress of science came to their assistance also sir humphrey davy applied chemistry to agriculture with success and the development of mechanical science bestowed a multitude of advantages upon the large farmer further in consequence of the increase of population the demand for agricultural products increased in such measure that from seventeen sixty to eighteen thirty four six million eight hundred forty thousand five hundred forty acres of waste land were reclaimed and in spite of this england was transformed from a grain exporting to a grain importing country the same activity was developed in the establishment of communication from eighteen eighteen to eighteen twenty nine there were built in england and wales one thousand english miles of roadway of the width prescribed by law sixty feet and nearly all the old roads were reconstructed on the new system of madam in scotland the department of public works built since eighteen o three nearly nine hundred miles of roadway and more than one thousand bridges by which the population of the highlands was suddenly placed within reach of civilization the highlanders had hitherto been chiefly poachers and smugglers they now became farmers and hand-workers and though gaelic schools were organized for the purpose of maintaining the gaelic language yet gaelic celtic customs and speech are rapidly vanishing before the approach of english civilization so too in ireland between the counties of cork limerick and kerry lay hitherto a wilderness wholly without passable roads and serving by reason of its inaccessibility as the refuge of all criminals and the chief protection of the celtic irish nationality in the south of ireland it has now been cut through by public roads 
and civilization has thus gained admission even to this savage region. The whole British Empire, and especially England, which sixty years ago had as bad roads as Germany or France then had, is now covered by a network of the finest roadways, and these too, like almost everything else in England, are the work of private enterprise, the state having done very little in this direction. Before 1755 England possessed almost no canals. In that year a canal was built in Lancashire from Sankey Brook to St. Helens, and in 1759 James Brindley built the first important one, the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal from Manchester, and the coal mines of the district to the mouth of the Mersey passing near Barton by aqueduct over the river Irwell. From this achievement dates the canal building of England to which Brindley first gave importance. Canals were now built and rivers made navigable in all directions. In England alone there are 2,200 miles of canals and 1,800 miles of navigable water. In Scotland the Caledonian Canal was cut directly across the country, and in Ireland several canals were built. These improvements, too, like the railroads and the roadways, are nearly all the work of private individuals and companies. The railroads have been only recently built. The first great one was opened from Liverpool to Manchester in 1830, since which all the great cities have been connected by rail. London with Southampton, Brighton, Dover, Colchester, Exeter, and Birmingham. Birmingham with Gloucester, Liverpool, Lancaster, via Newton and Wigan, and via Manchester and Bolton. Also with Leeds, via Manchester and Halifax, and via Leicester, Derby, and Sheffield. Leeds with Hull and Newcastle, via York. There are also many minor lines building or projected, which will soon make it possible to travel from Edinburgh to London in one day. As it had transformed the means of communication by land, so did the introduction of steam revolutionize travel by sea. The first steamboat was launched in 1807 in the Hudson in North America, the first in the British Empire in 1811 on the Clyde. Since then more than 600 have been built in England, and in 1836 more than 500 were plying to and from British ports. Such, in brief, is the history of English industrial development in the past sixty years a history which has no counterpart in the annals of humanity. Sixty, eighty years ago, England was a country like every other, with small towns, few and simple industries, and a thin but proportionally large agricultural population. Today it is a country like no other, with a capital of two and a half million inhabitants, with vast manufacturing cities, with an industry that supplies the world and produces almost everything by means of the most complex machinery with an industrious, intelligent, dense population, of which two-thirds are employed in trade and commerce, and composed of classes wholly different, forming, in fact, with other customs and other needs, a different nation from the England of those days. The Industrial Revolution is of the same importance for England as the political revolution for France, and the philosophical revolution for Germany, and the difference between England in 1760 and in 1844 is at least as great as that between France under the Ancien Régime and during the Revolution of July. But the mightiest result of this industrial transformation is the English proletariat. We have already seen how the proletariat was called into existence by the introduction of machinery. The rapid extension of manufacture demanded hands, wages rose, and troops of workmen migrated from the agricultural districts to the towns population multiplied enormously, and nearly all the increase took place in the proletariat. Further, Ireland had entered upon an orderly development only since the beginning of the eighteenth century. There too the population, more than decimated by English cruelty in earlier disturbances, now rapidly multiplied, especially after the advance in manufacture began to draw masses of Irishmen towards England. Thus arose the great manufacturing and commercial cities of the British Empire, in which at least three-fourths of the population belong to the working class, while the lower middle class consists only of small shopkeepers and very, very few handicraftsmen. For though the rising manufacture first attained importance by transforming tools into machines, workrooms into factories, and consequently the toiling lower middle class into the toiling proletariat, and the former large merchants into manufacturers, Though the lower middle class was thus early crashed out, and the population reduced to the two opposing elements, workers and capitalists, this happened outside of the domain of manufacture proper, 
in the province of handicraft and retail trade as well in the place of the former masters and apprentices came great capitalists and workingmen who had no prospect of rising above their class handwork was carried on after the fashion of factory work the division of labour was strictly applied and small employers who could not compete with great establishments were forced down into the proletariat at the same time the destruction of the former organization of handwork and the disappearance of the lower middle class deprived the working-man of all possibility of rising into the middle class himself hitherto he had always had the prospect of establishing himself somewhere as master artificer perhaps employing journeymen and apprentices but now when master artificers were crowded out by manufacturers when large capital had become necessary for carrying on work independently the working class became for the first time an integral permanent class of the population whereas it had formerly often been merely a transition leading to the bourgeoisie now he who was born to toil had no other prospect than that of remaining a toiler all his life now for the first time therefore the proletariat was in a position to undertake an independent movement in this way were brought together those vast masses of working men who now fill the whole british empire whose social condition forces itself every day more and more upon the attention of the civilized world the condition of the working class is the condition of the vast majority of the english people the question what is to become of those destitute millions who consume to-day what they earned yesterday who have created the greatness of england by their inventions and their toil who become with every passing day more conscious of their might and demand with daily increasing urgency their share of the advantages of society this since the reform bill has become the national question all parliamentary debates of any importance may be reduced to this and though the english middle class will not as yet admit it though they try to evade this great question and to represent their own particular interests as the truly national ones their action is utterly useless with every session of parliament the working class gains ground the interests of the middle class diminish in importance and in spite of the fact that the middle class is the chief in fact the only power in parliament the last session of eighteen forty four was a continuous debate upon subjects affecting the working class the poor relief bill the factory act the masters and servants act and thomas duncombe the representative of the working men in the house of commons was the great man of the session while the liberal middle class with its motion for repealing the corn laws and the radical middle class with its resolution for refusing the taxes played pitiable roles even the debates about ireland were at bottom debates about the irish proletariat and the means of coming to its assistance it is high time too for the english middle class to make some concessions to the working men who no longer plead but threaten for in a short time it may be too late in spite of all this the english middle class especially the manufacturing class which is enriched directly by means of the poverty of the workers persists in ignoring this poverty this class feeling itself the mighty representative class of the nation is ashamed to lay the sore spot of england bare before the eyes of the world will not confess even to itself that the workers are in distress because it the property-holding manufacturing class must bear the moral responsibility for this distress hence the scornful smile which intelligent englishmen and they the middle class alone are known on the continent assume when any one begins to speak of the condition of the working class hence the utter ignorance on the part of the whole middle class of everything which concerns the workers hence the ridiculous blunders which men of this class in and out of parliament make when the position of the proletariat comes under discussion hence the absurd freedom from anxiety with which the middle class dwells upon a soil that is honeycombed and may any day collapse the speedy collapse of which is as certain as a mathematical or mechanical demonstration hence the miracle that the english have as yet no single book upon the condition of their workers although they have been examining and mending the old state of things no one knows how many years hence also the deep wrath of the whole working class from glasgow to london against the rich by whom they are systematically plundered and mercilessly left to their fate a wrath which before too long a time goes by a time almost within the power of man to predict must break out into a revolution in comparison with which the french revolution and the year seventeen ninety four will prove to have been child's play End of introduction.
Chapter One of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter One The Industrial Proletariat. The order of our investigation of the different sections of the proletariat follows naturally from the foregoing history of its rise. The first proletarians were connected with manufacture, were engendered by it, and accordingly those employed in manufacture, in the working up of raw materials, will first claim our attention. The production of raw materials and of fuel for manufacture attained importance only in consequence of the industrial change, and engendered a new proletariat, the coal and metal miners. Then, in the third place, manufacture influenced agriculture, and in the fourth, the condition of Ireland, and the fractions of the proletariat belonging to each will find their place accordingly. We shall find, too, that with the possible exception of the Irish, the degree of intelligence of the various workers is in direct proportion to their relation to manufacture, and that the factory hands are most enlightened as to their own interests, the miners somewhat less so, the agricultural labourers scarcely at all. We shall find the same order again among the industrial workers, and shall see how the factory hands, eldest children of the industrial revolution, have from the beginning to the present day formed the nucleus of the labour movement, and how the others have joined this movement just in proportion as their handicraft has been invaded by the progress of machinery. We shall thus learn from the example which England offers, from the equal pace which the labour movement has kept with the movement of industrial development, the historical significance of manufacture. Since, however, at the present moment, pretty much the whole industrial proletariat is involved in the movement, and the condition of the separate sections has much in common, because they all are industrial, we shall have first to examine the condition of the industrial proletariat as a whole, in order later to notice more particularly each separate division with its own peculiarities. It has been already suggested that manufacture centralizes property in the hands of the few. It requires large capital with which to erect the colossal establishments that ruin the petty trading bourgeoisie, and with which to press into its service the forces of nature, so driving the hand-labor of the independent workmen out of the market. The division of labor, the application of water, and especially steam, and the application of machinery, are the three great levers with which manufacture, since the middle of the last century, has been busy putting the world out of joint. Manufacture, on a small scale, created the middle class. On a large scale, it created the working class, and raised the elect of the middle class to the throne, but only to overthrow them the more surely when the time comes. Meanwhile, it is an undenied and easily explained fact that the numerous, petty middle class of the good old times has been annihilated by manufacture, and resolved into rich capitalists on the one hand, and poor workers on the other. The centralizing tendency of manufacture does not, however, stop here. Population becomes centralized just as capital does, and very naturally, since the human being, the worker, is regarded in manufacture simply as a piece of capital for the use of which the manufacturer pays interest under the name of wages. The manufacturing establishment requires many workers employed together in a single building, living near each other and forming a village of themselves in the case of a good-sized factory. They have needs for satisfying which other people are necessary. Handicraftsmen, shoemakers, tailors, bakers, carpenters, stonemasons settle at hand. The inhabitants of the village, especially the younger generation, accustom themselves to factory work, grow skilful in it, and when the first mill can no longer employ them all, wages fall, and the immigration of fresh manufacturers is the consequence. So the village grows into a small town, and the small town into a large one. The greater the town, the greater its advantages. It offers roads, railroads, canals. The choice of skilled labor increases constantly. New establishments can be built more cheaply because of the competition among builders and machinists who are at hand than in remote country districts, whither timber, machinery, builders, and operatives must be brought. It offers a market to which buyers crowd, and direct communication with the markets supplying raw material or demanding finished goods. 
hence the marvellously rapid growth of the great manufacturing towns. The country, on the other hand, has the advantage that wages are usually lower than in town, and so town and country are in constant competition. And if the advantage is on the side of the town to-day, wages sink so low in the country to-morrow that new investments are most profitably made there. But the centralizing tendency of manufacture continues in full force, and every new factory built in the country bears in it the germ of a manufacturing town. If it were possible for this mad rush of manufacture to go on at this rate for another century, every manufacturing district of England would be one great manufacturing town, and Manchester and Liverpool would meet at Warrington or Newton. For in commerce, too, this centralization of the population works in precisely the same way, and hence it is that one or two great harbours, such as Hull and Liverpool, Bristol and London, monopolize almost the whole maritime commerce of Great Britain. Since commerce and manufacture attain their most complete development in these great towns, their influence upon the proletariat is also most clearly observable here. Here the centralization of property has reached the highest point. Here the morals and customs of the good old times are most completely obliterated. Here it has gone so far that the name Merry Old England conveys no meaning, for Old England itself is unknown to memory and to the tales of our grandfathers. Hence, too, there exist here only a rich and a poor class, for the lower middle class vanishes more completely with every passing day. Thus the class formerly most stable has become the most restless one. It consists to-day of a few remnants of a past time, and a number of people eager to make fortunes, industrial macabres and speculators, of whom one may amass a fortune while ninety-nine become insolvent and more than half of the ninety-nine live by perpetually repeated failure. But in these towns the proletarians are the infinite majority, and how they fare, what influence the great town exercises upon them, we have now to investigate. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2, Part 1 of The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels Chapter 2. The Great Towns A town such as London, where a man may wander for hours together without reaching the beginning of the end, without meeting the slightest hint which could lead to the inference that there is open country within reach, is a strange thing. This colossal centralization, this heaping together of two and a half millions of human beings at one point has multiplied the power of this two and a half millions a hundredfold has raised london to the commercial capital of the world created the giant docks and assembled the thousand vessels that continually cover the thames i know nothing more imposing than the view which the thames offers during the ascent from the sea to london bridge the masses of buildings the wharves on both sides especially from woolwich upwards the countless ships along both shores, crowding ever closer and closer together, until at last only a narrow passage remains in the middle of the river, a passage through which hundreds of steamers shoot by one another. All this is so vast, so impressive, that a man cannot collect himself, but is lost in the marvel of England's greatness before he sets foot upon English soil. But the sacrifices which all this has cost become apparent later. After roaming the streets of the capital a day or two, making headway with difficulty through the human turmoil and the endless lines of vehicles, after visiting the slums of the metropolis, one realizes for the first time that these Londoners have been forced to sacrifice the best qualities of their human nature, to bring to pass all the marvels of civilization which crowd their city, that a hundred powers which slumbered within them have remained inactive, have been suppressed in order that a few might be developed more fully and multiply through union with those of others. The very turmoil of the streets has something repulsive, something against which human nature rebels. The hundreds of thousands of all classes and ranks crowding past each other, are they not all human beings with the same qualities and powers, and with the same interest in being happy? And have they not, in the end, to seek happiness in the same way, by the same means? And still they crowd by one another as though they had nothing in common, nothing to do with one another, and their only agreement is the tacit one, 
that each keep to his own side of the pavement so as not to delay the opposing streams of the crowd, while it occurs to no man to honour another with so much as a glance. The brutal indifference, the unfeeling isolation of each in his private interest, becomes the more repellent and offensive, the more these individuals are crowded together within a limited space. And however much one may be aware that this isolation of the individual, this narrow self-seeking is the fundamental principle of our society everywhere, it is nowhere so shamelessly barefaced, so self-conscious as just here in the crowding of the great city. The dissolution of mankind into monads, of which each one has a separate principle, the world of atoms, is here carried out to its utmost extreme. Hence it comes, too, that the social war, the war of each against all, is here openly declared. Just as in Stirner's recent book people regard each other only as useful objects, each exploits the other, and the end of it all is that the stronger treads the weaker underfoot, and that the powerful few, the capitalists, seize everything for themselves, while to the weak many, the poor, scarcely a bare existence remains. What is true of London is true of Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, is true of all great towns. Everywhere barbarous indifference, hard egotism on one hand and nameless misery on the other. Everywhere social warfare, every man's house in a state of siege, everywhere reciprocal plundering under the protection of the law, and all so shameless, so openly avowed, that one shrinks before the consequences of our social state as they manifest themselves here undisguised and can only wonder that the whole crazy fabric still hangs together. Since capital, the direct or indirect control of the means of subsistence and production, is the weapon with which this social warfare is carried on, it is clear that all the disadvantages of such a state must fall upon the poor. For him no man has the slightest concern. Cast into the whirlpool, he must struggle through as well as he can. If he is so happy as to find work, that is, if the bourgeoisie does him the favour to enrich itself by means of him, wages await him which scarcely suffice to keep body and soul together. If he can get no work, he may steal, if he is not afraid of the police, or starve, in which case the police will take care that he does so in a quiet and inoffensive manner. During my residence in England, at least twenty or thirty persons have died of simple starvation under the most revolting circumstances and a jury has rarely been found possessed of the courage to speak the plain truth in the matter. Let the testimony of the witnesses be never so clear and unequivocal. The bourgeoisie, from which the jury is selected, always finds some back door through which to escape the frightful verdict, death from starvation. The bourgeoisie dare not speak the truth in these cases, for it would speak its own condemnation. But indirectly, far more than directly, Many have died of starvation, where long-continued want of proper nourishment has called forth fatal illness, when it has produced such debility that causes which might otherwise have remained inoperative brought on severe illness and death. The English workingmen call this social murder, and accuse our whole society of perpetrating this crime perpetually. Are they wrong? True, it is only individuals who starve, but what security has the workingman that it may not be his turn to-morrow? who assures him employment, who vouches for it that, if for any reason or no reason his lord and master discharges him to-morrow, he can struggle along with those dependent upon him until he may find some one else to give him bread. Who guarantees that willingness to work shall suffice to obtain work, that uprightness, industry, thrift, and the rest of the virtues recommended by the bourgeoisie are really his road to happiness? No one. He knows that he has something to-day, and that it does not depend upon himself whether he shall have something to-morrow. He knows that every breeze that blows, every whim of his employer, every bad turn of trade may hurl him back into the fierce whirlpool from which he has temporarily saved himself, and in which it is hard and often impossible to keep his head above water. He knows that, though he may have the means of living to-day, it is very uncertain whether he shall to-morrow. Meanwhile, let us proceed to a more detailed investigation of the position in which the social war has placed the non-possessing class. Let us see what pay for his work society does give the working man in the form of dwelling, clothing, food, what sort of subsistence it grants those who contribute most to the maintenance of society. And first, let us consider the dwellings. Every great city has one or more slums, where the working class is crowded together. 
True, poverty often dwells in hidden alleys close to the palaces of the rich, but in general a separate territory has been assigned to it, where, removed from the sight of the happier classes, it may struggle along as it can. These slums are pretty equally arranged in all the great towns of England, the worst houses in the worst quarters of the towns, usually one or two-storied cottages in long rows, perhaps with cellars used as dwellings, almost always irregularly built. These houses of three or four rooms and a kitchen form throughout England, some parts of London excepted, the general dwellings of the working class. The streets are generally unpaved, rough, dirty, filled with vegetable and animal refuse, without sewers or gutters, but supplied with foul stagnant pools instead. Moreover, ventilation is impeded by the bad, confused method of building of the whole quarter, and since many human beings here live crowded into a small space, the atmosphere that prevails in these working men's quarters may readily be imagined. Further, the streets serve as drying grounds in fine weather. Lines are stretched across from house to house and hung with wet clothing. Let us investigate some of the slums in their order. London comes first, and in London the famous rookery of St. Giles, which is now, at last, about to be penetrated by a couple of broad streets. St. Giles is in the midst of the most populous part of the town surrounded by broad, splendid avenues in which the gay world of London idles about, in the immediate neighbourhood of Oxford Street, Regent Street, of Trafalgar Square and the Strand. It is a disorderly collection of tall, three- or four-storied houses, with narrow, crooked, filthy streets, in which there is quite as much life as in the great thoroughfares of the town, except that here people of the working class only are to be seen. A vegetable market is held in the street, Baskets with vegetables and fruits, naturally all bad and hardly fit to use, obstruct the sidewalk still further, and from these, as well as from the fish-dealers' stalls, arises a horrible smell. The houses are occupied from cellar to garret, filthy within and without, and their appearance is such that no human being could possibly wish to live in them. But all this is nothing in comparison with the dwellings in the narrow courts and alleys between the streets entered by covered passages between the houses, in which the filth and tottering ruins surpass all description. Scarcely a whole window-pane can be found, the walls are crumbling, door-posts and window-frames loose and broken, doors of old boards nailed together, or altogether wanting in this thieves' quarter, where no doors are needed, there being nothing to steal. Heaps of garbage and ashes lie in all directions, and the foul liquids emptied before the doors gather in stinking pools. Here live the poorest of the poor, the worst paid workers with thieves and the victims of prostitution indiscriminately huddled together, the majority Irish or of Irish extraction, and those who have not yet sunk in the whirlpool of moral ruin which surrounds them, sinking daily deeper, losing daily more and more of their power to resist the demoralizing influence of want, filth, and evil surroundings. Nor is St. Giles the only London slum. In the immense tangle of streets there are hundreds and thousands of alleys and courts lined with houses too bad for any one to live in, who can still spend anything whatsoever upon a dwelling fit for human beings. Close to the splendid houses of the rich such a lurking place of the bitterest poverty may often be found. So a short time ago, on the occasion of a coroner's inquest, a region close to Portman Square, one of the very respectable squares, was characterized as an abode, quote, of a multitude of Irish demoralized by poverty and filth, end quote. So too may be found in streets such as Longacre and others, which, though not fashionable, are yet, quote, unquote, respectable, a great number of cellar dwellings out of which puny children and half-starred ragged women emerge into the light of day. In the immediate neighborhood of Drury Lane Theatre, the second in London, are some of the worst streets of the whole metropolis, Charles, King, and Park Streets, in which the houses are inhabited from cellar to garret exclusively by poor families. In the parishes of St. John and St. Margaret there lived in 1840, according to the Journal of the Statistical Society, 5,366 working men's families in 5,294 dwellings, if they deserve the name, men, women, and children thrown together without distinction of age or sex, 26,830 persons all told, and of these families three quarters possessed but one room. In the aristocratic parish of St. George, Hanover Square, there lived, according to the same authority, 1,465 working men's families, nearly 6,000 persons, under similar conditions, 
and here too more than two-thirds of the whole number crowded together at the rate of one family in one room and how the poverty of these unfortunates among whom even thieves find nothing to steal is exploited by the property-holding class in lawful ways the abominable dwellings in drury lane just mentioned bring in the following rents two cellar dwellings three shillings one room ground floor four shillings second story four shillings sixpence third floor four shillings garret room three shillings weekly so that the starving occupants of charles street alone pay the house owners a yearly tribute of two thousand pounds and the five thousand three hundred and thirty six families above mentioned in westminster a yearly rent of forty thousand pounds the most extensive working people's district lies east of the tower in whitechapel and bethnal green where the greatest masses of london working people live let us hear mr g alston preacher of st philip's bethnal green on the condition of his parish he says quote, it contains one thousand four hundred houses inhabited by two thousand seven hundred and ninety five families or about twelve thousand persons the space upon which this large population dwells is less than four hundred yards or twelve hundred feet square and in this overcrowding it is nothing unusual to find a man his wife four or five children and sometimes both grandparents all in one single room where they eat sleep and work i believe that before the bishop of london called attention to this most poverty-stricken parish people at the west end knew as little of it as of the savages of australia or of the south sea isles and if we make ourselves acquainted with these unfortunates through personal observation if we watch them at their scanty meal and see them bowed by illness and want of work we shall find such a mass of helplessness and misery that a nation like ours must blush that these things can be possible i was rector near huddersfield during the three years in which the mills were at their worst but i have never seen such complete helplessness of the poor as since then in bethnal green not one father of a family in ten in the whole neighbourhood has other clothing than his working suit and that is as bad and tattered as possible many indeed have no other covering for the night than these rags and no bed save a sack of straw and shavings end quote. the foregoing description furnishes an idea of the aspect of the interior of the dwellings but let us follow the english officials who occasionally stray thither into one or two of these working men's homes on the occasion of an inquest held november fourteenth eighteen forty three by mr carter coroner for surrey upon the body of anne galway aged forty-five years the newspapers related the following particulars concerning the deceased she had lived at number three white lion court bermondsey street london with her husband and a nineteen-year-old son in a little room in which neither a bedstead nor any other furniture was to be seen she lay dead beside her son upon a heap of feathers which were scattered over her almost naked body there being neither sheet nor coverlet the feathers stuck so fast over the whole body that the physician could not examine the corpse until it was cleansed and then found it starved and scarred from the bites of vermin part of the floor of the room was torn up and the whole used by the family as a privy on monday january fifteenth eighteen forty four two boys were brought before the police magistrate because being in a starving condition they had stolen and immediately devoured a half-cooked calf's foot from a shop the magistrate felt called upon to investigate the case further and received the following details from the policeman the mother of the two boys was the widow of an ex-soldier afterwards policeman and had had a very hard time since the death of her husband to provide for her nine children she lived at number two pool's place quaker court spitalsfields in the utmost poverty when the policeman came to her he found her with six of her children literally huddled together in a little back room with no furniture but two old rush-bottomed chairs with the seats gone a small table with two legs broken a broken cup and a small dish on the hearth was scarcely a spark of fire and in one corner lay as many old rags as would fill a woman's apron which served the whole family as a bed for bed-clothing they had only their scanty day-clothing the poor woman told him that she had been forced to sell her bedstead the year before to buy food. Her bedding she had pawned with the victualler for food. In short, everything had gone for food. The magistrate ordered the woman a considerable provision from the poor box. In February 1844, Teresa Bishop, a widow sixty years old, was recommended, with her sick daughter, aged twenty-six, 
to the compassion of the police magistrate in Marlborough Street. She lived at number 5 Brown Street, Grosvenor Square, in a small back room no larger than a closet, in which there was not one single piece of furniture. In one corner lay some rags upon which both slept. A chest served as table and chair. The mother earned a little by charring. The owner of the house said that they had lived in this way since May 1843, had gradually sold or pawned everything that they had, and had still never paid any rent. The magistrate assigned them one pound from the poor box. I am far from asserting that all London working people live in such want as the foregoing three families. I know very well that ten are somewhat better off, where one is so totally trodden underfoot by society. But I assert that thousands of industrious and worthy people, far worthier and more to be respected than all the rich of London, do find themselves in a condition unworthy of human beings, and that every proletarian, every one, without exception, is exposed to a similar fate without any fault of his own and in spite of every possible effort. But in spite of all this, they who have some kind of a shelter are fortunate, fortunate in comparison with the utterly homeless. In London fifty thousand human beings get up every morning not knowing where they are to lay their heads at night. The luckiest of this multitude, those who succeed in keeping a penny or two until evening, enter a lodging-house such as abound in every great city, where they find a bed. But what a bed! These houses are filled with beds from cellar to garret, four, five, six beds in a room, as many as can be crowded in. Into every bed four, five, or six human beings are piled, as many as can be packed in, sick and well, young and old, drunk and sober, men and women, just as they come, indiscriminately. Then come strife, blows, wounds, or if these bedfellows agree, so much the worse. Thefts are arranged, and things done which our language, grown more humane than our deeds, refuses to record. And those who cannot pay for such a refuge? They sleep where they find a place, in passages, arcades, in corners where the police and the owners leave them undisturbed. A few individuals find their way to the refuges which are managed here and there by private charity, others sleep on the benches in the parks close under the windows of Queen Victoria. Let us hear the London Times. Quote, it appears from the report of the proceedings at Marlborough Street Police Court in our columns of yesterday that there is an average number of fifty human beings of all ages who huddle together in the parks every night, having no other shelter than what is supplied by the trees and a few hollows of the embankment. Of these, the majority are young girls who have been seduced from the country by the soldiers and turned loose on the world in all the destitution of friendless penury and all the recklessness of early vice. This is truly horrible. Poor there must be everywhere. Indigence will find its way and set up its hideous state in the heart of a great and luxurious city. Amid the thousand narrow lanes and by-streets of a populous metropolis there must always, we fear, be much suffering, much that offends the eye, much that lurks unseen, but that within the precincts of wealth, gaiety, and fashion, nigh the regal grandeur of St. James, close on the palatial splendour of Bayswater, on the confines of the old and new aristocratic quarters, in a district where the cautious refinement of modern design has refrained from creating one single tenement for poverty, which seems, as it were, dedicated to the exclusive enjoyment of the wealth, that there want and famine and disease and vice should stalk in all their kindred horrors, consuming body by body, soul by soul. It is indeed a monstrous state of things, enjoyment the most absolute, that bodily ease, intellectual excitement, or the more innocent pleasures of sense can supply to man's craving, brought in close contact with the most unmitigated misery. Wealth, from its bright saloons, laughing, an insolently heedless laugh, at the unknown wounds of want. Pleasure, cruelly but unconsciously mocking the pain that moans below. All contrary things mocking one another, all contrary save the vice which tempts and the vice which is tempted. But let all men remember this, that within the most courtly precincts of the richest city of God's earth there may be found, night after night, winter after winter, women, young in years, old in sin and suffering, outcasts from society, rotting from famine, filth, and disease. Let them remember this, and learn not to theorize, but to act. God knows there is much room for action nowadays." End quote. 
I have referred to the refuges for the homeless. How greatly overcrowded these are, two examples may show. A newly erected refuge for the houseless in Upper Ogle Street, that can shelter three hundred persons every night, has received since its opening, January 27th to March 17th, 1844, 2,740 persons for one or more nights, and although the season was growing more favourable, the number of applicants in this, as well as in the asylums of Whitecross Street and Wapping, was strongly on the increase, and a crowd of the homeless had to be sent away every night for want of room. In another refuge, the Central Asylum in Playhouse Yard, there were supplied on an average 460 beds nightly. During the first three months of the year 1844, 6,681 persons being sheltered, and 96,141 portions of bread were distributed. Yet the Committee of Directors declared this institution began to meet the pressure of the needy to a limited extent only when the Eastern Asylum was also opened. Let us leave London and examine the other great cities of the three kingdoms in their order. Let us take Dublin first, a city the approach to which from the sea is as charming as that of London is imposing. The Bay of Dublin is the most beautiful of the whole British island kingdom, and is even compared by the Irish with the Bay of Naples. The city, too, possesses great attractions, and its aristocratic districts are better and more tastefully laid out than those of any other British city. By way of compensation, however, the poorer districts of Dublin are among the most hideous and repulsive to be seen in the world. True, the Irish character, which under some circumstances is comfortable only in the dirt, has some share in this, but as we find thousands of Irish in every great city in England and Scotland, and as every poor population must gradually sink into the same uncleanliness, the wretchedness of Dublin is nothing specific, nothing peculiar to Dublin, but something common to all great towns. The poor quarters of Dublin are extremely extensive, and the filth, the uninhabitableness of the houses, and the neglect of the streets surpass all description some idea of the manner in which the poor are here crowded together may be formed from the fact that in eighteen seventeen according to the report of the inspector of workhouses one thousand three hundred eighteen persons lived in fifty-two houses with three hundred and ninety rooms in barrel street and one thousand nine hundred and ninety seven persons in seventy-one houses with three hundred and ninety three rooms in and near church street that quote, in this and the adjoining district there exists a multitude of foul courts and alleys many cellars receive all their light through the door while in not a few the inhabitants sleep upon the bare floor though most of them possess bedsteads at least nicholson's court for example contains twenty-eight wretched little rooms with one hundred and fifty-one human beings in the greatest want there being but two bedsteads and two blankets to be found in the whole court End quote. The poverty is so great in Dublin that a single benevolent institution, the Mendicity Association, gives relief to 2,500 persons, or 1% of the population, daily, receiving and feeding them for the day and dismissing them at night. Dr. Allison describes a similar state of things in Edinburgh, whose superb situation, which has won it the title of the modern Athens, and whose brilliant aristocratic quarter in the new town, contrasts strongly with the foul wretchedness of the poor in the old town. Allison asserts that this extensive quarter is as filthy and horrible as the worst district of Dublin, while the Mendicity Association would have as great a proportion of needy persons to assist in Edinburgh as in the Irish capital. He asserts, indeed, that the poor in Scotland, especially in Edinburgh and Glasgow, are worse off than in any other region of the three kingdoms, and that the poorest are not Irish but Scotch. The preacher of the old church of Edinburgh, Dr. Lee, testified in 1836 before the Commission of Religious Instruction that, quote, he had never before seen such misery as in his parish, where the people were without furniture, without everything, two married couples often sharing one room. In a single day he had visited seven houses in which there was not a bed, in some of them not even a heap of straw. Old people of eighty years sleep on the board floor, nearly all slept in their day clothes. In one cellar room he found two families from a Scotch country district. Soon after their removal to the city, two of the children had died, and a third was dying at the time of his visit. Each family had a filthy pile of straw lying in a corner. The cellar sheltered, besides the two families, a donkey, and was, moreover, so dark 
that it was impossible to distinguish one person from another by day. Dr. Lee declared that it was enough to make a heart of adamant bleed to see such misery in a country like Scotland. End quote. In the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal, Dr. Hennan reports a similar state of things. From a parliamentary report, it is evident that in the dwellings of the poor of Edinburgh a want of cleanliness reigns, such as must be expected under these conditions. On the bedposts chickens roost at night, dogs and horses share the dwellings of human beings, and the natural consequence is a shocking stench, with filth and swarms of vermin. The prevailing construction of Edinburgh favours these atrocious conditions as far as possible. The old town is built upon both slopes of a hill, along the crest of which runs the high street. Out of the high street there open downwards multitudes of narrow, crooked alleys, called wines from their many turnings, and these wines form the proletarian district of the city. The houses of the Scotch cities, in general, are five- or six-storied buildings, like those of Paris, and in contrast with England, where, so far as possible, each family has a separate house. The crowding of human beings upon a limited area is thus intensified. Quote, these streets, says an English journal in an article upon the sanitary condition of the working people in cities, are often so narrow that a person can step from the window of one house into that of its opposite neighbour, while the houses are piled so high, story upon story, that the light can scarcely penetrate into the court or alley that lies between. In this part of the city there are neither sewers nor other drains, nor even privies belonging to the houses. In consequence, all refuse, garbage, and excrements of at least fifty thousand persons are thrown into the gutters every night, so that in spite of all street-sweeping, a mass of dried filth and foul vapours are created, which not only offend the sight and smell, but endanger the health of the inhabitants in the highest degree. Is it to be wondered at that in such localities all considerations of health, morals, and even the most ordinary decency are utterly neglected? On the contrary, all who are more intimately acquainted with the condition of the inhabitants will testify to the high degree which disease, wretchedness, and demoralization have here reached. Society in such districts has sunk to a level indescribably low and hopeless. The houses of the poor are generally filthy, and are evidently never cleansed. They consist in most cases of a single room which, while subject to the worst ventilation, is yet usually kept cold by the broken and badly fitting windows, and is sometimes damp and partly below ground level, always badly furnished and thoroughly uncomfortable, a straw heap often serving the whole family for a bed, upon which men and women, young and old, sleep in revolting confusion. Water can be had only from the public pumps, and the difficulty of obtaining it naturally fosters all possible filth." In the other great seaport towns the prospect is no better. Liverpool, with all its commerce, wealth, and grandeur, yet treats its workers with the same barbarity. A full fifth of the population, more than forty-five thousand human beings, live in narrow, dark, damp, badly ventilated cellar dwellings, of which there are seven thousand eight hundred and sixty-two in the city. Besides these cellar dwellings there are two thousand two hundred and seventy courts, small spaces built up on all four sides, and having but one entrance, a narrow, covered passageway, the whole ordinarily very dirty and inhabited exclusively by proletarians. Of such courts we shall have more to say when we come to Manchester. In Bristol, on one occasion, 2,800 families were visited, of whom 46% occupied but one room each. Precisely the same state of things prevails in the factory towns. In Nottingham there are in all 11,000 houses, of which between seven thousand and eight thousand are built back to back with a rear party wall so that no through ventilation is possible while a single privy usually serves for several houses during an investigation made a short time since many rows of houses were found to have been built over shallow drains covered only by the boards of the ground floor in leicester derby and sheffield it is no better of birmingham the article above cited from the artisan states quote, in the older quarters of the city there are many bad districts, filthy and neglected, full of stagnant pools and heaps of refuse. Courts are very numerous in Birmingham, reaching two thousand, and containing the greater number of the working people of the city. These courts are usually narrow, muddy, badly ventilated, ill-drained, and lined with eight to twenty houses, 
which, by reason of having their rear walls in common, can usually be ventilated from one side only. In the background, within the court, there is usually an ash-heap or something of the kind, the filth of which cannot be described. It must, however, be observed that the newer courts are more sensibly built and more decently kept, and that even in the old ones the cottages are much less crowded than in Manchester and Liverpool, wherefore Birmingham shows even during the reign of an epidemic a far smaller mortality than, for instance, Wolverhampton, Dudley, and Bilston, only a few miles distant. Cellar dwellings are unknown, too, in Birmingham, though a few cellars are misused as workrooms. The lodging-houses for proletarians are rather numerous, over four hundred, chiefly in courts in the heart of the town. They are nearly all disgustingly filthy and ill-smelling, the refuge of beggars, thieves, tramps, and prostitutes who eat, drink, smoke, and sleep here without the slightest regard to comfort or decency, in an atmosphere endurable to these degraded beings only." End, quote. End of chapter 1, part 1《Chapter Two, Part Two of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter Two. Glasgow is in many respects similar to Edinburgh, possessing the same wines, the same tall houses. Of this city, the artisan observes. Quote, the working class forms here some seventy-eight per cent of the whole population, about three hundred thousand, and lives in parts of the city which exceed in wretchedness and squalor the lowest nooks of St. Giles and Whitechapel, the liberties of Dublin, the wines of Edinburgh. There are numbers of such localities in the heart of the city, south of the Trongate, westward from the Salt Market, in Calton and off the High Street, endless labyrinths of lanes or wines into which open at almost every step courts or blind alleys formed by ill-ventilated, high-piled, waterless, and dilapidated houses. These are literally swarming with inhabitants. They contain three or four families upon each floor, perhaps twenty persons. In some cases each story is let out in sleeping places, so that fifteen to twenty persons are packed one on top of the other, I cannot say accommodated, in a single room. These districts shelter the poorest, most depraved, and worthless members of the community, and may be regarded as the sources of those frightful epidemics which, beginning here, spread desolation over Glasgow." Let us hear how J. C. Simmons, Government Commissioner for the Investigation of the Condition of the Handweavers, describes these portions of the city. Quote, I have seen wretchedness in some of its worst phases both here and upon the continent, but until I visited the wines of Glasgow, I did not believe that so much crime, misery, and disease could exist in any civilized country. In the lower lodging-houses, ten, twelve, sometimes twenty persons of both sexes, all ages and various degrees of nakedness, sleep indiscriminately huddled together upon the floor. These dwellings are usually so damp, filthy, and ruinous that no one could wish to keep his horse in one of them." End quote. And in another place, quote, the wines of Glasgow contain a fluctuating population of fifteen to thirty thousand human beings. This quarter consists wholly of narrow alleys and square courts, in the middle of every one of which there lies a dung-heap. Revolting as was the outward appearance of these courts, I was yet not prepared for the filth and wretchedness within. In some of the sleeping-places which we visited at night, the superintendent of police, Captain Miller and Simmons, we found a complete layer of human beings stretched upon the floor, often fifteen to twenty, some clad, others naked, men and women indiscriminately. Their bed was a litter of mouldy straw, mixed with rags. There was little or no furniture, and the only thing which gave these dens any shimmer of habitableness was a fire upon the hearth. Theft and prostitution form the chief means of subsistence of this population. No one seemed to take the trouble to cleanse this Augean stable, this pandemonium, this tangle of crime, filth, and pestilence, in the centre of the second city of the kingdom. An extended examination of the lowest districts of other cities never revealed anything half so bad, either in intensity of moral and physical infection, 
nor in comparative density of population. In this quarter most of the houses have been declared by the court of guild ruinous and unfit for habitation, but precisely these are the most densely populated, because according to the law no rent can be demanded for them." The great manufacturing district in the centre of the British islands, the thickly peopled stretch of West Yorkshire and South Lancashire, with its numerous factory towns, yields nothing to the other great manufacturing centres. The woollen district of the West Riding of Yorkshire is a charming region, a beautiful green hill country, whose elevations grow more rugged towards the west until they reach their highest point in the bold ridge of Blackstone Edge, the watershed between the Irish Sea and the German Ocean. The valleys of the Ayr, along which stretches Leeds, and of the Calder, through which the Manchester Leeds Railway runs, are among the most attractive in England, and are strewn in all directions with the factories, villages, and towns. The houses of rough grey stone look so neat and clean in comparison with the blackened brick buildings of Lancashire that it is a pleasure to look at them. But on coming into the towns themselves, one finds little to rejoice over. Leeds lies, as the artisan describes it, and as I found confirmed upon examination, quote, on a gentle slope that descends into the valley of the air. This stream flows through the city for about a mile and a half, and is exposed to violent floods during thaws or heavy rain. The higher western portions of the city are clean for such a large town. But the low-lying districts along the river and its tributary becks are narrow, dirty, and enough in themselves to shorten the lives of the inhabitants, especially of little children. Added to this, the disgusting state of the working men's districts about Kirkgate, Marsh Lane, Cross Street, and Richmond Road, which is chiefly attributable to their unpaved, drainless streets, irregular architecture, numerous courts and alleys, and total lack of the most ordinary means of cleanliness, all this taken together is explanation enough of the excessive mortality in these unhappy abodes of filthy misery. In consequence of the overflows of the air, which, it must be added, like all other rivers in the service of manufacture, flows into the city at one end clear and transparent, and flows out at the other end thick, black, and foul, smelling of all possible refuse. Quote, the houses and cellars are often so full of water that they have to be pumped out. And at such time the water rises, even where there are sewers, out of them into cellars, engenders miasmatic vapours strongly impregnated with sulphurated hydrogen, and leaves a disgusting residuum highly injurious to health. During the spring floods of 1839 the action of such a choking of the sewers was so injurious that according to the report of the registrar of births and deaths for this part of the town there were three deaths to two births whereas in the same three months in every other part of the town there were three births to two deaths other thickly populated districts are without any sewers whatsoever or so badly provided as to derive no benefit from them in some rows of houses the cellars are seldom dry in certain districts there are several streets covered with soft mud a foot deep the inhabitants have made vain attempts from time to time to repair these streets with shovelfuls of cinders, but in spite of all such attempts, dung heaps and pools of dirty water emptied from the houses fill all the holes until wind and sun dry them up. An ordinary cottage in Leeds occupies not more than five yards square of land, and usually consists of a cellar, a living room, and one sleeping room. These contracted dwellings, filled day and night with human beings, are another point dangerous alike to the morals and the health of the inhabitants." And how greatly these cottages are crowded, the report on the health of the working classes quoted above bears testimony, quote, In Leeds we found brothers and sisters, and lodgers of both sexes, sharing the parents' sleeping-room, whence arise consequences at the contemplation of which human feeling shudders." End quote so too bradford which but seven miles from leeds at the junction of several valleys lies upon the banks of a small coal-black foul-smelling stream on weekdays the town is enveloped in a grey cloud of coal-smoke but on a fine sunday it offers a superb picture when viewed from the surrounding heights yet within reigns the same filth and discomfort as in leeds the older portions of the town are built upon steep hillsides and are narrow and irregular in the lanes, alleys, and courts lie filth and debris in heaps, the houses are ruinous, dirty, and miserable, and in the immediate vicinity of the river and the valley-bottom I found many a one whose ground floor, half buried in the hillside, 
was totally abandoned in general the portions of the valley bottom in which working men's cottages have crowded between the tall factories are among the worst built and dirtiest districts of the whole town in the newer portions of this as of every other factory town the cottages are more regular being built in rows but they share here too all the evils incident to the customary method of providing working men's dwellings evils of which we shall have occasions to speak more particularly in discussing manchester the same is true of the remaining towns of the west riding especially of barnsley halifax and huddersfield the last named the handsomest by far of all the factory towns of yorkshire and lancashire by reason of its charming situation and modern architecture has yet its bad quarter for a committee appointed by a meeting of citizens to survey the town reported august fifth eighteen forty four quote, it is notorious that in huddersfield whole streets and many lanes and courts are neither paved nor supplied with sewers nor other drains that in them refuse debris and filth of every sort lies accumulating festers and rots and that nearly everywhere stagnant water accumulates in pools in consequence of which the adjoining dwellings must inevitably be bad and filthy so that in such places diseases arise and threaten the health of the whole town if we cross blackstone edge or penetrate it with the railroad we enter upon that classic soil on which english manufacture has achieved its masterwork and from which all labour movements emanate namely south lancashire with its central city manchester again we have beautiful hill country sloping gently from the watershed westwards towards the irish sea with the charming green valleys of the ribble the irwell the mersey and their tributaries a country which a hundred years ago chiefly swampland thinly populated is now sown with towns and villages and is the most densely populated strip of country in england in lancashire and especially in manchester english manufacture finds at once its starting point and its centre the manchester exchange is the thermometer for all the fluctuations of trade the modern art of manufacture has reached its perfection in manchester in the cotton industry of south lancashire the application of the forces of nature the superseding of hand labour by machinery especially by the power loom and the self-acting mule and the division of labour are seen at the highest point and if we recognize in these three elements that which is characteristic of modern manufacture we must confess that the cotton industry has remained in advance of all other branches of industry from the beginning down to the present day the effects of modern manufacture upon the working class must necessarily develop here most freely and perfectly and the manufacturing proletariat present itself in its fullest classic perfection the degradation to which the application of steam power machinery and the division of labour reduce the working man and the attempts of the proletariat to rise above this abasement must likewise be carried to the highest point and with the fullest consciousness hence because manchester is the classic type of a modern manufacturing town and because i know it as intimately as my own native town more intimately than most of its residents know it we shall make a longer stay here the towns surrounding manchester vary little from the central city so far as the working people's quarters are concerned except that the working class forms if possible a larger proportion of their population these towns are purely industrial and conduct all their business through manchester upon which they are in every respect dependent whence they are inhabited only by working men and petty tradesmen while manchester has a very considerable commercial population especially of commission and quote unquote, respectable retail dealers hence bolton preston wigan bury rockdale middleton haywood oldham ashton stalybridge stockport etc though nearly all towns of thirty fifty seventy to ninety thousand inhabitants are almost wholly working people's districts interspersed only with factories a few thoroughfares lined with shops and a few lanes along which the gardens and houses of the manufacturers are scattered like villas the towns themselves are badly and irregularly built with foul courts lanes and back alleys reeking of coal smoke and especially dingy from the originally bright red brick turned black with time which is here the universal building material cellar dwellings are general here wherever it is in any way possible these subterranean dens are constructed and a very considerable portion of the population dwells in them among the worst of these towns after preston and oldham is bolton eleven miles northwest of manchester 
it has so far as i have been able to observe in my repeated visits but one main street a very dirty one deansgate which serves as a market and is even in the finest weather a dark unattractive hole in spite of the fact that except for the factories its sides are formed by low one and two-storied houses here as everywhere the older part of the town is especially ruinous and miserable the dark-coloured body of water which leaves the beholder in doubt whether it is a brook or a long string of stagnant puddles flows through the town and contributes its share to the total pollution of the air by no means pure without it there is stockport too which lies on the cheshire side of the mersey but belongs nevertheless to the manufacturing district of manchester it lies in a narrow valley along the mersey so that the streets slope down a steep hill on one side and up an equally steep one on the other while the railway from manchester to birmingham passes over a high viaduct above the city and the whole valley stockport is renowned throughout the entire district as one of the duskiest smokiest holes and looks indeed especially when viewed from the viaduct excessively repellent but far more repulsive are the cottages and cellar dwellings of the working class which stretch in long rows through all parts of the town from the valley bottom to the crest of the hill i do not remember to have seen so many cellars used as dwellings in any other town of this district a few miles northeast of stockport is ashton under lyne one of the newest factory towns of this region it stands on the slope of a hill at the foot of which are the canal and the river tame and is in general built on the newer more regular plan five or six parallel streets stretch along the hill intersected at right angles by others leading down into the valley by this method the factories would be excluded from the town proper even if the proximity of the river and the canalway did not draw them all into the valley where they stand thickly crowded belching forth black smoke from their chimneys to this arrangement ashton owes a much more attractive appearance than that of most factory towns the streets are broad and cleaner the cottages look new bright red and comfortable but the modern system of building cottages for working men has its own disadvantages every street has its concealed back lane to which a narrow paved path leads and which is all the dirtier and although i saw no buildings except a few on entering which could have been more than fifty years old there are even in ashton streets in which cottages are getting bad where the bricks in the house corners are no longer firm but shift about in which the walls have cracks and will not hold the chalk whitewash inside streets whose dirty smoke-begrimed aspect is nowise different from that of the other towns of the district except that in ashton this is the exception not the rule a mile eastward lies stallybridge also on the tame in coming over the hill from ashton the traveller has at the top both right and left fine large gardens with superb villa-like houses in their midst built usually in the elizabethan style which is to the Gothic precisely what the Anglican Church is to the Apostolic Roman Catholic. A hundred paces farther, and Stallybridge shows itself in the valley, in sharp contrast with the beautiful country seats, in sharp contrast even with the modest cottages of Ashton. Stallybridge lies in a narrow, crooked ravine, much narrower even than the valley at Stockport, and both sides of this ravine are occupied by an irregular group of cottages, houses, and mills. On entering, the very first cottages are narrow, smoke-begrimed, old and ruinous, and as the first houses, so the whole town. A few streets lie in the narrow valley bottom. Most of them run criss-cross, pell-mell, uphill and down, and in nearly all the houses, by reason of this sloping situation, the ground floor is half buried in the earth, and what multitudes of courts, back lanes, and remote nooks arise out of this confused way of building, may be seen from the hills whence one has the town here and there in a bird's-eye view almost at one's feet add to this the shocking filth and the repulsive effect of stallybridge in spite of its pretty surroundings may be readily imagined but enough of these little towns each has its own peculiarities but in general the working people live in them just as in manchester hence i have especially sketched only their peculiar construction and would observe that all more general observations as to the condition of the labouring population in manchester are fully applicable to these surrounding towns as well manchester lies at the foot of the southern slope of a range of hills which stretch hither from oldham their last peak kerselmoor being at once the race-course and the monsacre of manchester manchester proper lies on the left bank of the irwell between that stream and the two smaller ones the irk and the medlock 
which here empty into the Irwell. On the left bank of the Irwell, bounded by a sharp curve of the river, lies Salford, and further westward Pendleton. Northward from the Irwell lie Upper and Lower Broughton. Northward of the Irk, Cheatham Hill. South of the Medlock lies Holm. Farther east, Charlton on Medlock. Still farther, pretty well to the east of Manchester, Ardwick. The whole assemblage of buildings is commonly called Manchester, and contains about four hundred thousand inhabitants, rather more than less. The town itself is peculiarly built, so that a person may live in it for years, and go in and out daily, without coming into contact with a working people's quarter, or even with workers, that is, so long as he confines himself to his business or to pleasure walks. This arises chiefly from the fact that, by unconscious tacit agreement, as well as with outspoken conscious determination, the working people's quarters are sharply separated from the sections of the city reserved for the middle class, or, if this does not succeed, they are concealed with the cloak of charity. Manchester contains, at its heart, a rather extended commercial district, perhaps half a mile long and about as broad, and consists almost wholly of offices and warehouses. Nearly the whole district is abandoned by dwellers, and is lonely and deserted at night. Only watchmen and policemen traverse its narrow lanes with their dark lanterns. This district is cut through by certain main thoroughfares, upon which the vast traffic concentrates, and in which the ground level is lined with brilliant shops. In these streets the upper floors are occupied, here and there, and there is a good deal of life upon them until late at night. With the exception of this commercial district, all Manchester proper, all Salford and Hulme, a great part of Pendleton and Charlton, two-thirds of Ardwick, and single stretches of Cheatham Hill and Broughton, are all unmixed working people's quarters, stretching like a girdle, averaging a mile and a half in breadth around the commercial district. Outside, beyond this girdle, lives the upper and middle bourgeoisie, the middle bourgeoisie in regularly laid out streets in the vicinity of the working quarters, especially in Charlton and the lower-lying portions of Cheatham Hill. The upper bourgeoisie in remoter villas with gardens, in Charlton and Ardwick, or on the breezy heights of Cheatham Hill, Broughton and Pendleton, in free, wholesome country air, in fine, comfortable homes, passed once every half or quarter hour by omnibuses going into the city. And the finest part of the arrangement is this, that the members of this money aristocracy can take the shortest road through the middle of all the labouring districts to their places of business, without ever seeing that they are in the midst of the grimy misery that lurks to the right and the left. For the thoroughfares leading from the exchange in all directions out of the city are lined on both sides with an almost unbroken series of shops, and are so kept in the hands of the middle and lower bourgeoisie, which, out of self-interest, cares for a decent and cleanly external appearance, and can care for it. True, these shops bear some relation to the districts which lie behind them, and are more elegant in the commercial and residential quarters than when they hide grimy workingmen's dwellings, but they suffice to conceal from the eyes of the wealthy men and women of strong stomachs and weak nerves the misery and grime which form the complement of their wealth. So, for instance, Deansgate, which leads from the old church directly southward, is lined first with mills and warehouses, then with second-rate shops and alehouses, farther south, when it leaves the commercial district, with less inviting shops, which grow dirtier and more interrupted by beer-houses and gin-palaces the farther one goes, until at the southern end the appearance of the shops leaves no doubt that workers, and workers only, are their customers. So Market Street, running southeast from the exchange, at first brilliant shops of the best sort, with counting-houses or warehouses above. In the continuation, Piccadilly, immense hotels and warehouses, in the farther continuation London Road, in the neighbourhood of the Medlock, factories, beer-houses, shops for the humbler bourgeoisie and the working population, and from this point onward large gardens and villas of the wealthier merchants and manufacturers. In this way any one who knows Manchester can infer the adjoining districts from the appearance of the thoroughfare, but one is seldom in a position to catch from the street a glimpse of the real labouring districts. I know very well that this hypocritical plan is more or less common to all great cities. I know, too, that the retail dealers are forced by the nature of their business to take possession of the great highways. I know that there are more good buildings than bad ones upon such streets everywhere, and that the value of land is greater near them than in remoter districts. But at the same time I have never seen so systematic a shutting out of the working class from the thoroughfares, 
so tender a concealment of everything which might affront the eye and the nerves of the bourgeoisie as in manchester and yet in other respects manchester is less built according to a plan after official regulations is more an outgrowth of accident than any other city and when i consider in this connection the eager assurances of the middle class that the working class is doing famously i cannot help feeling that the liberal manufacturers the quote-unquote bigwigs of manchester are not so innocent after all in the matter of this sensitive method of construction i may mention just here that the mills almost all adjoin the rivers or the different canals that ramify throughout the city before i proceed at once to describe the labouring quarters first of all there is the old town of manchester which lies between the northern boundary of the commercial district and the irk here the streets even the better ones are narrow and winding as todd street long millgate withy grove and shud hill the houses dirty old and tumble down and the construction of the side streets utterly horrible going from the old church to long millgate the stroller has at once a row of old-fashioned houses at the right of which not one has kept its original level these are remnants of the old pre-manufacturing manchester whose former inhabitants have removed with their descendants into better-built districts and have left the houses which were not good enough for them to a population strongly mixed with irish blood here one is in an almost undisguised workingmen's quarter for even the shops and beer-houses hardly take the trouble to exhibit a trifling degree of cleanliness but all this is nothing in comparison with the courts and lanes which lie behind to which access can be gained only through covered passages in which no two human beings can pass at the same time of the irregular cramming together of dwellings in ways which defy all rational plan of the tangle in which they are crowded literally one upon the other it is impossible to convey an idea and it is not the buildings surviving from the old times of manchester which are to blame for this the confusion has only recently reached its height when every scrap of space left by the old way of building has been filled up and patched over until not a foot of land is left to be further occupied the south bank of the irk is here very steep and between fifteen and thirty feet high on this declivitous hillside there are planted three rows of houses of which the lowest rise directly out of the river while the front walls of the highest stand on the crest of the hill in long millgate among them are mills on the river in short the method of construction is as crowded and disorderly here as in the lower part of long millgate right and left a multitude of covered passages lead from the main street into numerous courts and he who turns in thither gets into a filth and disgusting grime the equal of which is not to be found especially in the courts which lead down to the irk and which contain unqualifiedly the most horrible dwellings which i have yet beheld in one of these courts there stands directly at the entrance at the end of the covered passage a privy without a door so dirty that the inhabitants can pass into and out of the court only by passing through foul pools of stagnant urine and excrement this is the first court on the irk above ducie bridge in case any one should care to look into it below it on the river there are several tanneries which fill the whole neighbourhood with the stench of animal putrefaction below ducie bridge the only entrance to most of the houses is by means of narrow dirty stairs and over heaps of refuse and filth the first court below ducie bridge known as allen's court was in such a state at the time of the cholera that the sanitary police ordered it evacuated swept and disinfected with chloride of lime dr k gives a terrible description of the state of this court at that time since then it seems to have been partially torn away and rebuilt at least looking down from juicy bridge the passer-by sees several ruined walls and heaps of debris with some newer houses the view from this bridge mercifully concealed from mortals of small stature by a parapet as high as a man is characteristic for the whole district at the bottom flows or rather stagnates the irk a narrow coal-black foul-smelling stream full of debris and refuse which it deposits on the shallower right bank in dry weather a long string of the most disgusting blackish-green slime pools are left standing on this bank from the depths of which bubbles of miasmatic gas constantly arise and give forth a stench unendurable even on the bridge forty or fifty feet above the surface of the stream but besides this the stream itself is checked every few paces by high weirs behind which slime and refuse accumulate and rot in thick masses 
above the bridge are tanneries bone mills and gas works from which all drains and refuse find their way into the irk which receives further the contents of all the neighbouring sewers and privies it may be easily imagined therefore what sort of residue the stream deposits below the bridge you can look upon the piles of debris the refuse filth and offal from the courts on the steep left bank here each house is packed close behind its neighbour and a piece of each is visible all black smoky crumbling ancient with broken panes and window frames the background is furnished by old barrack-like factory buildings on the lower right bank stands a long row of houses and mills the second house being a ruin without a roof piled with debris the third stands so low that the lowest floor is uninhabitable and therefore without windows or doors here the background embraces the pauper burial ground the station of the liverpool and leeds railway and in the rear of this the workhouse the quote-unquote poor law bastille of manchester which like a citadel looks threateningly down from behind its high walls and parapets on the hilltop upon the working people's quarter below above ducie bridge the left bank grows more flat and the right bank steeper but the condition of the dwellings on both banks grows worse rather than better he who turns to the left here from the main street long millgate is lost he wanders from one court to another turns countless corners passes nothing but narrow filthy nooks and alleys until after a few minutes he has lost all clue and knows not whither to turn everywhere half are wholly ruined buildings some of them actually uninhabited which means a great deal here rarely a wooden or stone floor to be seen in the houses almost uniformly broken ill-fitting windows and doors and a state of filth everywhere heaps of debris refuse and offal standing pools for gutters and a stench which alone would make it impossible for a human being in any degree civilized to live in such a district the newly built extension of the leeds railway which crosses the irk here has swept away some of these courts and lanes laying others completely open to view immediately under the railway bridge there stands a court the filth and horrors of which surpass all the others by far just because it was hitherto so shut off so secluded that the way to it could not be found without a good deal of trouble i should never have discovered it myself without the breaks made by the railway though i thought i knew this whole region thoroughly passing along a rough bank among stakes and washing lines one penetrates into this chaos of small one-storied one-roomed huts in most of which there is no artificial floor kitchen living and sleeping room all in one in such a hole scarcely five feet long by six broad i found two beds and such bedsteads and beds which with a staircase and chimney-place exactly filled the room in several others i found absolutely nothing while the door stood open and the inhabitants leaned against it everywhere before the door is refuse and offal that any sort of pavement lay underneath could not be seen but only felt here and there with the feet this whole collection of cattle sheds for human beings was surrounded on two sides by houses and a factory and on the third by the river and besides the narrow stair up the bank a narrow doorway alone led out into another almost equally ill-built ill-kept labyrinth of dwellings enough the whole side of the irk is built in this way a planless knotted chaos of houses more or less on the verge of uninhabitableness whose unclean interiors fully correspond with their filthy external surroundings and how could the people be clean with no proper opportunity for satisfying the most natural and ordinary wants privies are so rare here that they are either filled up every day or are too remote for most of the inhabitants to use how can people wash when they have only the dirty irk water at hand while pumps and water pipes can be found in decent parts of the city alone in truth it cannot be charged to the account of these helots of modern society if their dwellings are not more cleanly than the pigsties which are here and there to be seen among them the landlords are not ashamed to let dwellings like the six or seven cellars on the quay directly below scotland bridge the floors of which stand at least two feet below the low water level of the irk that flows not six feet away from them or like the upper floor of the corner house on the opposite shore directly above the bridge where the ground floor utterly uninhabitable stands deprived of all fittings for doors and windows a case by no means rare in this region when this open ground floor is used as a privy by the whole neighbourhood for want of other facilities 
if we leave the irk and penetrate once more on the opposite side from long millgate into the midst of the working men's dwellings we shall come into a somewhat newer quarter which stretches from st michael's church to withy grove and shude hill here there is somewhat better order in place of the chaos of buildings we find at least long straight lanes and alleys or courts built according to a plan and usually square but if in the former case every house was built according to caprice here each lane and court is so built without reference to the situation of the adjoining ones the lanes run now in this direction now in that while every two minutes the wanderer gets into a blind alley or on turning a corner finds himself back where he started from certainly no one who has not lived a considerable time in this labyrinth can find his way through it if i may use the word at all in speaking of this district the ventilation of these streets and courts is in consequence of this confusion quite as imperfect as in the irk region and if this quarter may nevertheless be said to have some advantage over that of the irk the houses being newer and the streets occasionally having gutters nearly every house has on the other hand a cellar dwelling which is rarely found in the irk district by reason of the greater age and more careless construction of the houses as for the rest the filth debris and offal heaps and the pools in the streets are common to both quarters and in the district now under discussion another feature most injurious to the cleanliness of the inhabitants is the multitude of pigs walking about in all the alleys rooting into the offal heaps or kept imprisoned in small pens here as in most of the working men's quarters of manchester the pork raisers rent the courts and build pig pens in them in almost every court one or even several such pens may be found into which the inhabitants of the court throw all refuse and offal whence the swine grow fat and the atmosphere confined on all four sides is utterly corrupted by putrefying animal and vegetable substances through this quarter a broad and measurably decent street has been cut miller street and the background has been pretty successfully concealed but if any one should be led by curiosity to pass through one of the numerous passages which lead into the courts you will find this piggery repeated at every twenty paces such is the old town of manchester and on re-reading my description i am forced to admit that instead of being exaggerated it is far from black enough to convey a true impression of the filth ruin and uninhabitableness the defiance of all considerations of cleanliness ventilation and health which characterize the construction of this single district containing at least twenty to thirty thousand inhabitants and such a district exists in the heart of the second city of england the first manufacturing city of the world if any one wishes to see in how little space a human being can move how little air and such air he can breathe how little of civilization he may share and yet live it is only necessary to travel hither true this is the old town and the people of manchester emphasize the fact whenever any one mentions to them the frightful condition of this hell upon earth but what does that prove everything which here arouses horror and indignation is of recent origin belongs to the industrial epoch the couple of hundred houses which belong to old manchester have been long since abandoned by their original inhabitants the industrial epoch alone has crammed into them the swarms of workers whom they now shelter the industrial epoch alone has built up every spot between these old houses to win a covering for the masses whom it has conjured hither from the agricultural districts and from ireland the industrial epoch alone enables the owners of these cattle sheds to rent them for high prices to human beings to plunder the poverty of the workers to undermine the health of thousands in order that they alone the owners may grow rich in the industrial epoch alone has it become possible that the worker scarcely freed from feudal servitude could be used as mere material a mere chattel that he must let himself be crowded into a dwelling too bad for every other which he for his hard-earned wages buys the right to let go utterly to ruin this manufacture has achieved which without these workers this poverty this slavery could not have lived true the original construction of this quarter was bad little good could have been made out of it but have the landowners has the municipality done anything to improve it when rebuilding on the contrary wherever a nook or corner was free a house has been run up where a superfluous passage remained it has been built up the value of land rose with the blossoming out of manufacture 
and the more it rose the more madly was the work of building up carried on without reference to the health or comfort of the inhabitants with sole reference to the highest possible profit on the principle that no hole is so bad but that some poor creature must take it who can pay for nothing better however it is the old town and with this reflection the bourgeoisie is comforted let us see therefore how much better it is in the new town End of chapter 2 part 2Chapter 2, Part 3 of The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter 2 The Great Towns. The new town, known also as Irish Town, stretches up a hill of clay beyond the old town between the Irk and St. George's Road here all the features of a city are lost single rows of houses or groups of streets stand here and there like little villages on the naked not even grass-grown clay soil the houses or rather cottages are in bad order never repaired filthy with damp unclean cellar dwellings the lanes are neither paved nor supplied with sewers but harbour numerous colonies of swine penned in small styes or yards or wandering unrestrained through the neighbourhood the mud in the streets is so deep that there is never a chance except in the driest weather of walking without sinking into it ankle-deep at every step in the vicinity of st george's road the separate groups of buildings approach each other more closely ending in a continuation of lanes blind alleys back lanes and courts which grow more and more crowded and irregular the nearer they approach the heart of the town true they are here oftener paved or supplied with paved sidewalks and gutters but the filth the bad order of the houses and especially of the cellars remains the same it may not be out of place to make some general observations just here as to the customary construction of working men's quarters in manchester we have seen how in the old town pure accident determined the grouping of the houses in general every house is built without reference to any other and the scraps of space between them are called courts for want of another name in the somewhat newer portions of the same quarter and in other working men's quarters dating from the early days of industrial activity a somewhat more orderly arrangement may be found the space between two streets is divided into more regular usually square courts these courts were built in this way from the beginning and communicate with the streets by means of covered passages if the totally planless construction is injurious to the health of the workers by preventing ventilation this method of shutting them up in courts surrounded on all sides by buildings is far more so the air simply cannot escape the chimneys of the houses are the sole drains for the imprisoned atmosphere of the courts and they serve the purpose only so long as fire is kept burning moreover the houses surrounding such courts are usually built back to back having the rear wall in common and this alone suffices to prevent any sufficient through ventilation and as the police charged with the care of the streets does not trouble itself about the condition of these courts as everything else quietly lies where it is thrown there is no cause for wonder at the filth and heaps of ashes and offal to be found here i have been in courts in miller's street at least half a foot below the level of the thoroughfares and without the slightest drainage for the water that accumulates in them in rainy weather more recently another different method of building was adopted and has now become general working men's cottages are almost never built singly but always by the dozen or score a single contractor building up one or two streets at a time these are then arranged as follows one front is formed of cottages of the best class so fortunate as to possess a back door and small court and these command the highest rent in the rear of these cottages runs a narrow alley the back street built up at both ends into which either a narrow roadway or a covered passage leads from one side the cottages which face this back street command least rent, and are most neglected. These have their rear walls in common with the third row of cottages which face a second street, and command less rent than the first row and more than the second. By this method of construction comparatively good ventilation can be obtained for the first row of cottages, and the third row is no worse off than in the former method. The middle row, on the other hand, 
is at least as badly ventilated as the houses in the courts, and the back street is always in the same filthy, disgusting condition as they. The contractors prefer this method because it saves them space, and furnishes the means of fleecing better-paid workers through the higher rents of the cottages in the first and third rows. These three different forms of cottage building are found all over Manchester and throughout Lancashire and Yorkshire, often mixed up together, but usually separate enough to indicate the relative age of parts of towns. The third system, that of the back alleys, prevails largely in the great working men's district east of St. George's Road and Ancote Street, and is the one most often found in the other working men's quarters of Manchester and its suburbs. In the last mentioned broad district included under the name Ancoats, stand the largest mills of Manchester lining the canals, colossal six- and seven-storied buildings towering with their slender chimneys far above the low cottages of the workers. The population of the district consists, therefore, chiefly of mill-hands, and in the worst streets of hand-weavers. The streets nearest the heart of the town are the oldest, and consequently the worst. They are, however, paved and supplied with drains. Among them I include those nearest to and parallel with Oldham Road and Great Ancote Street. Farther to the northeast lie many newly built-up streets. Here the cottages look neat and cleanly, doors and windows are new and freshly painted, the rooms within newly whitewashed. The streets themselves are better aired, the vacant building lots between them larger and more numerous. But this can be said of a minority of the houses only, while cellar dwellings are to be found under almost every cottage. Many streets are unpaved and without sewers, and worse than all, this neat appearance is all pretense, a pretense which vanishes within the first ten years. For the construction of the cottages individually is no less to be condemned than the plan of the streets. All such cottages look neat and substantial at first. Their massive brick walls deceive the eye, and on passing through a newly built working men's street, without remembering the back alleys and the construction of the houses themselves, one is inclined to agree with the assertion of the liberal manufacturers that the working population is nowhere so well housed as in England. But on closer examination, it becomes evident that the walls of these cottages are as thin as it is possible to make them. The outer walls, those of the cellar, which bear the weight of the ground floor and roof, are one whole brick thick at most, the bricks lying with their long sides touching, but I have seen many a cottage of the same height, some in process of building, whose outer walls were but one half brick thick, the bricks not lying sideways but lengthwise, their narrow ends touching. The object of this is to spare material, but there is also another reason for it, namely, the fact that the contractors never own the land but lease it, according to the English custom, for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, or ninety-nine years, at the expiration of which time it falls, with everything upon it, back into the possession of the original holder, who pays nothing in return for improvements upon it. The improvements are therefore so calculated by the lessee as to be worth as little as possible at the expiration of the stipulated term. And as such cottages are often built but twenty or thirty years before the expiration of the term, it may easily be imagined that the contractors make no unnecessary expenditures upon them. Moreover, these contractors, usually carpenters and builders, or manufacturers, spend little or nothing in repairs, partly to avoid diminishing their rent receipts, and partly in view of the approaching surrender of the improvement to the landowner, while in consequence of commercial crises and the loss of work that follows them, whole streets often stand empty, the cottages falling rapidly into ruin and uninhabitableness. It is calculated in general that working men's cottages last only forty years on the average. This sounds strangely enough when one sees the beautiful mass of walls of newly built ones, which seem to give promise of lasting a couple of centuries, but the fact remains that the niggardliness of the original expenditure, the neglect of all repairs, the frequent periods of emptiness, the constant change of inhabitants, and the destruction carried on by the dwellers during the final ten years, usually Irish families, who do not hesitate to use the wooden portions for firewood, all this, taken together, accomplishes the complete ruin of the cottages by the end of forty years. Hence it comes that Ancoats, built chiefly since the sudden growth of manufacture, chiefly indeed within the present century, contains a vast number of ruinous houses, most of them being, in fact, in the last stages of inhabitableness. I will not dwell upon the amount of capital thus wasted, the small additional expenditure upon the original improvement, and upon repairs which would suffice to keep this whole district clean, 
decent and inhabitable for years together. I have to deal here with the state of the houses and their inhabitants, and it must be admitted that no more injurious and demoralizing method of housing the workers has yet been discovered than precisely this. The working man is constrained to occupy such ruinous dwellings because he cannot pay for others, and because there are no others in the vicinity of his mill. Perhaps, too, because they belong to the employer, who engages him only on condition of his taking such a cottage. The calculation with reference to the forty years' duration of the cottage is, of course, not always perfectly strict, for if the dwellings are in a thickly built-up portion of the town, and there is a good prospect of finding steady occupants for them, while the ground rent is high, the contractors do a little something to keep the cottages inhabitable after the expiration of the forty years. They never do anything more, however, than is absolutely unavoidable, and the dwellings so repaired are the worst of all. Occasionally, when an epidemic threatens, the otherwise sleepy conscience of the sanitary police is a little stirred. Raids are made into the working men's districts, whole rows of cellars and cottages are closed, as happened in the case of several lanes near Oldham Road. But this does not last long. The condemned cottages soon find occupants again, the owners are much better off by letting them, and the sanitary police won't come again so soon. These east and northeast sides of Manchester are the only ones on which the bourgeoisie has not built, because ten or eleven months of the year the west and southwest wind drives the smoke of all the factories hither, and that the working people alone may breathe. Southward from Great Ancoat Street lies a great, straggling working men's quarter, a hilly, barren stretch of land occupied by detached, irregularly built rows of houses or squares, between these, empty building lots, uneven, clayey, without grass, and scarcely passable in wet weather. The cottages are all filthy and old, and recall the new town to mind. The stretch cut through by the Birmingham Railway is the most thickly built up, and the worst. Here flows the Medlock, with countless windings through a valley, which is in places on a level with the valley of the Irk. Along both sides of the stream, which is coal-black, stagnant, and foul, stretches a broad belt of factories and working men's dwellings, the latter all in the worst condition. The bank is chiefly declivitous, and is built over to the water's edge, just as we saw along the Irk, while the houses are equally bad, whether built on the Manchester side or in Ardwick, Trollton, or Hulme. But the most horrible spot, if I should describe all the separate spots in detail I should never come to the end, lies on the Manchester side, immediately southwest of Oxford Road, and is known as Little Ireland. In a rather deep hole, in a curve of the Medlock, and surrounded on all four sides by tall factories and high embankments, covered with buildings, stand two groups of about two hundred cottages, built chiefly back to back, in which live about four thousand human beings, most of them Irish. The cottages are old, dirty, and of the smallest sort, the streets uneven, fallen into ruts and in part without drains or pavement. Masses of refuse, awful and sickening filth, lie among standing pools in all directions. The atmosphere is poisoned by the effluvia from these, and laden and darkened by the smoke of a dozen tall factory chimneys. A horde of ragged women and children swarm about here, as filthy as the swine that thrive upon the garbage heaps and in the puddles. In short, the whole rookery furnishes such a hateful and repulsive spectacle as can hardly be equalled in the worst court on the Irk. The race that lives in these ruinous cottages, behind broken windows, mended with oilskin, sprung doors and rotten doorposts, or in dark, wet cellars, in measureless filth and stench, in this atmosphere penned in as if with a purpose, this race must really have reached the lowest stage of humanity. This is the impression and the line of thought which the exterior of this district forces upon the beholder. But what must one think when he hears that in each of these pens, containing at most two rooms, a garret and perhaps a cellar, on the average twenty human beings live? That in the whole region, for each one hundred and twenty persons, one usually inaccessible privy is provided? And that in spite of all the preachings of the physicians, in spite of the excitement into which the cholera epidemic plunged the sanitary police by reason of the condition of little Ireland, in spite of everything, in this year of grace, 1844, it is in almost the same state as in 1831. Dr. Kay asserts that not only the cellars, but the first floors of all the houses in this district are damp, that a number of cellars once filled up with earth have now been emptied and are occupied once more by Irish people, 
that in one cellar the water constantly wells up through a hole stopped with clay, the cellar lying below the river level, so that its occupant, a handloom weaver, had to bail out the water from his dwelling every morning and pour it into the street. Farther down on the left side of the Medlock lies Hulm, which, properly speaking, is one great working people's district, the condition of which coincides almost exactly with that of Ancoats, the more thickly built-up regions chiefly bad and approaching ruin, the less populous of more modern structure, but generally sunk in filth. On the other side of the Medlock, in Manchester proper, lies a second great workingman's district, which stretches on both sides of Deansgate as far as the business quarter, and in certain parts rivals the old town. Especially in the immediate vicinity of the business quarter, between Bridge and Key Streets, Princess and Peter Streets, the crowded construction exceeds in places the narrowest courts of the old town. Here are long, narrow lanes between which run contracted, crooked courts and passages, the entrances to which are so irregular that the explorer is caught in a blind alley at every few steps, or comes out where he least expects to, unless he knows every court and every alley exactly and separately. According to Dr. K., the most demoralized class of all Manchester lived in these ruinous and filthy districts, people whose occupations are thieving and prostitution, and to all appearance his assertion is still true at the present moment. When the sanitary police made its expedition hither in 1831, it found the uncleanness as great as in Little Ireland or along the Irk. That it is not much better today, I can testify. And among other items, they found in Parliament Street for 380 persons, and in Parliament Passage for 30 thickly populated houses, but a single privy. If we cross the Irwell to Salford, we find on a peninsula formed by the river a town of 80,000 inhabitants which, properly speaking, is one large workingmen's quarter, penetrated by a single wide avenue. Salford, once more important than Manchester, was then the leading town of the surrounding district, to which it still gives its name, Salford Hundred. Hence it is that an old and therefore very unwholesome, dirty and ruinous locality is to be found here, lying opposite the old church of Manchester, and in as bad a condition as the old town on the other side of the Irwell. Farther away from the river lies the newer portion, which is, however, already beyond the limit of its forty years of cottage life, and therefore ruinous enough. All Salford is built in courts or narrow lanes, so narrow that they remind me of the narrowest I have ever seen, the little lanes of Genoa. The average construction of Salford is, in this respect, much worse than that of Manchester, and so too in respect to cleanliness. If in Manchester the police, from time to time, every six or ten years, makes a raid upon the working people's districts, closes the worst dwellings, and causes the filthiest spots in these Augean stables to be cleansed, in Salford it seems to have done absolutely nothing. The narrow side lanes and courts of Chapel Street, Greengate, and Gravel Lane have certainly never been cleansed since they were built. Of late the Liverpool Railway has been carried through the middle of them, over a high viaduct, and has abolished many of the filthiest nooks. But what does that avail? Whoever passes over this viaduct and looks down sees filth and wretchedness enough, and if any one takes the trouble to pass through these lanes and glance through the open doors and windows into the houses and cellars, he can convince himself afresh with every step that the workers of Salford live in dwellings in which cleanliness and comfort are impossible. Exactly the same state of affairs is found in the more distant regions of Salford, in Islington, along Regent Road, and back of the Bolton Railway. The workingmen's dwellings between Oldfield Road and Cross Lane, where a mass of courts and alleys are to be found in the worst possible state, vie with the dwellings of the old town in filth and overcrowding. In this district I found a man, apparently about sixty years old, living in a cow stable. He had constructed a sort of chimney for his square pen, which had neither windows, floor, nor ceiling, had obtained a bedstead, and lived there, though the rain dripped through his rotten roof. This man was too old and weak for regular work, and supported himself by removing manure with a handcart. The dung-heaps lay next door to his palace. Such are the various working people's quarters of Manchester, as I had occasion to observe them personally during twenty months. If we briefly formulate the result of our wanderings, we must admit that 350,000 working people of Manchester and its environs live, almost all of them, in wretched, damp, filthy cottages that the streets which surround them are usually in the most miserable and filthy condition, 
laid out without the slightest reference to ventilation, with reference solely to the profit secured by the contractor. In a word, we must confess that in the workingmen's dwellings of Manchester no cleanliness, no convenience, and consequently no comfortable family life is possible. That in such dwellings only a physically degenerate race, robbed of all humanity, degraded, reduced morally and physically to bestiality, could feel comfortable and at home. And I am not alone in making this assertion. We have seen that Dr. K. gives precisely the same description, and though it is superfluous, I quote further the words of a liberal, recognized and highly valued as an authority by the manufacturers, and a fanatical opponent of all independent movements of the workers. Quote, as I passed through the dwellings of the mill-hands in Irish Town, Ancoats, and Little Ireland, I was only amazed that it is possible to maintain a reasonable state of health in such homes. These towns, for in extent and number of inhabitants they are towns, have been erected with the utmost disregard of everything except the immediate advantage of the speculating builder. A carpenter and builder unite to buy a series of building sites, that is, they lease them for a number of years, and cover them with so-called houses. In one place we found a whole street following the course of a ditch, because in this way deeper cellars could be secured without the cost of digging, cellars not for storing wares or rubbish, but for dwellings for human beings. Not one house of this street escaped the cholera. In general, the streets of these suburbs are unpaved, with a dung-heap or ditch in the middle. The houses are built back to back, without ventilation or drainage, and whole families are limited to a corner of a cellar or a garret." I have already referred to the unusual activity which the sanitary police manifested during the cholera visitation. When the epidemic was approaching, a universal terror seized the bourgeoisie of the city. People remembered the unwholesome dwellings of the poor, and trembled before the certainty that each of these slums would become a centre for the plague, whence it would spread desolation in all directions through the houses of the propertied class. A health commission was appointed at once to investigate these districts, and report upon their condition to the town council. Dr. K., himself a member of this commission, who visited in person every separate police district except one, the eleventh, quotes extracts from their reports. There were inspected in all 6,951 houses, naturally in Manchester proper alone, Salford and the other suburbs being excluded. Of these, 6,565 urgently needed whitewashing within. 960 were out of repair, 939 had insufficient drains, 1,435 were damp, 452 were badly ventilated, 2,221 were without privies. Of the 687 streets inspected, 248 were unpaved, 53 but partially paved, 112 ill-ventilated, 352 containing standing pools, heaps of debris, refuse, etc. To cleanse such an Augean stable before the arrival of the cholera was, of course, out of the question. A few of the worst nooks were therefore cleansed, and everything else left as before. In the cleansed spots, as Little Ireland proves, the old filthy condition was naturally restored in a couple of months. As to the internal condition of these houses, the same commission reports a state of things similar to that which we have already met with in London, Edinburgh, and other cities. It often happens that a whole Irish family is crowded into one bed. Often a heap of filthy straw or quilts of old sacking cover all in an indiscriminate heap, where all alike are degraded by want, stolidity, and wretchedness. Often the inspectors found in a single house two families in two rooms. All slept in one, and used the other as a kitchen and dining-room in common. Often more than one family lived in a single damp cellar, in whose pestilent atmosphere twelve to sixteen persons were crowded together. To these and other sources of disease must be added that pigs were kept, and other disgusting things of the most revolting kind were found. We must add that many families, who had but one room for themselves, received boarders and lodgers in it, that such lodgers of both sexes by no means rarely sleep in the same bed with the married couple, and that the single case of a man and his wife and his adult sister-in-law sleeping in one bed was found, according to the, quote, report concerning the sanitary condition of the working class, end quote, six times repeated in Manchester. Common lodging-houses, too, are very numerous. Dr. K. gives their number in 1831 at 267 in Manchester proper, 
and they must have increased greatly since then. Each of these receives from twenty to thirty guests, so that they shelter all told, nightly, from five to seven thousand human beings. The character of the houses and their guests is the same as in other cities. Five to seven beds in each room lie on the floor, without bedsteads, and on these sleep, mixed indiscriminately, as many persons as apply. What physical and moral atmosphere reigns in these holes I need not state. Each of these houses is a focus of crime, the scene of deeds against which human nature revolts, which would perhaps never have been executed but for this forced centralization of vice. Gaskell gives the number of persons living in cellars in Manchester proper as twenty thousand. The weekly dispatch gives the number, quote, according to official reports, end quote, as twelve per cent of the working class, which agrees with Gaskell's number. The workers being estimated at one hundred and seventy-five thousand, twenty-one thousand would form twelve per cent of it. The cellar dwellings in the suburbs are at least as numerous, so that the number of persons living in cellars in Manchester, using its name in the broader sense, is not less than forty to fifty thousand. So much for the dwellings of the workers in the largest cities and towns. The manner in which the need of a shelter is satisfied furnishes a standard for the manner in which all other necessities are supplied. That in these filthy holes a ragged, ill-fed population alone can dwell is a safe conclusion, and such is the fact. The clothing of the working people in the majority of cases is in a very bad condition. The material used for it is not of the best adapted. Wool and linen have almost vanished from the wardrobe of both sexes, and cotton has taken their place. Shirts are made of bleached or coloured cotton goods. The dresses of the women are chiefly of cotton print goods, and woollen petticoats are rarely to be seen on the wash-line. The men wear chiefly trousers of fustian or other heavy cotton goods, and jackets or coats of the same. Fustian has become the proverbial costume of the working men, who are called quote-unquote fustian jackets, and call themselves so in contrast to the gentlemen who wear broadcloth, which latter words are used as characteristic for the middle class. When Fergus O'Connor, the Chartist leader, came to Manchester during the insurrection of 1842, he appeared, amidst the deafening applause of the working men, in a fustian suit of clothing. Hats are the universal head covering in England, even for working men, hats of the most diverse forms, round, high, broad-brimmed, narrow-brimmed, or without brims, only the younger men in factory towns wearing caps. Anyone who does not own a hat folds himself a low, square paper cap. The whole clothing of the working class, even assuming it to be in good condition, is little adapted to the climate. The damp air of England, with its sudden changes of temperature, more calculated than any other to give rise to colds, obliges almost the whole middle class to wear flannel next the skin, about the body, and flannel scarves and shirts are in almost universal use. Not only is the working class deprived of this precaution, it is scarcely ever in a position to use a thread of woolen clothing and the heavy cotton goods, though thicker, stiffer, and heavier than woolen clothes, affords much less protection against cold and wet, remain damp much longer because of their thickness and the nature of the stuff, and have nothing of the compact density of fulled woolen cloths. And if a working man once buys himself a woolen coat for Sunday, he must get it from one of the cheap shops where he finds bad, so-called, devil's dust cloth, manufactured for sale and not for use, and liable to tear or grow threadbare in a fortnight. Or he must buy of an old clothes-dealer a half-worn coat, which has seen its best days, and lasts but a few weeks. Moreover, the working man's clothing is, in most cases, in bad condition, and there is the oft-recurring necessity for placing the best pieces in the pawnbroker's shop. But among very large numbers, especially among the Irish, the prevailing clothing consists of perfect rags often beyond all mending or so patched that the original colour can no longer be detected. Yet the English and Anglo-Irish go on patching, and have carried this art to a remarkable pitch, putting wool or bagging on fustian, or the reverse, it's all the same to them. But the true, transplanted Irish hardly ever patch, except in the extremest necessity, when the garment would otherwise fall apart. Ordinarily the rags of the shirt protrude through the rents in the coat or trousers. They wear, as Thomas Carlyle says, quote, a suit of tatters, the getting on or off which is said to be a difficult operation, transacted only in festivals and the high tides of the calendar. The Irish have introduced, too, the custom previously unknown in England of going barefoot. 
In every manufacturing town there is now to be seen a multitude of people, especially women and children, going about barefoot, and their example is gradually being adopted by the poorer English. As with clothing, so with food. The workers get what is too bad for the property-holding class. In the great towns of England everything may be had of the best, but it costs money, and the workmen, who must keep house on a couple of pence, cannot afford much expense. Moreover, he usually receives his wages on Saturday evening, for although a beginning has been made in the payment of wages on Friday, this excellent arrangement is by no means universal, and so he comes to market at five or even seven o'clock, while the buyers of the middle class have had the first choice during the morning, when the market teems with the best of everything. But when the workers reach it, the best has vanished, and if it was still there, they would probably not be able to buy it. The potatoes which the workers buy are usually poor, the vegetables wilted, the cheese old and of poor quality, the bacon rancid, the meat lean, tough, taken from old, often diseased cattle, or such as have died a natural death, and not fresh even then, often half decayed. The sellers are usually small hucksters who buy up inferior goods, and can sell them cheaply by reason of their badness. The poorest workers are forced to use still another device to get together the things they need with their few pence. As nothing can be sold on Sunday, and all shops must be closed at twelve o'clock on Saturday night, such things as would not keep until Monday are sold at any price between ten o'clock and midnight. But nine-tenths of what is sold at ten o'clock is past using by Sunday morning, yet these are precisely the provisions which make up the Sunday dinner of the poorest class. The meat which the workers buy is very often past using, but having bought it, they must eat it. And on the 6th of January, 1844, if I am not greatly mistaken, a court leet was held in Manchester, when eleven meat-sellers were fined for having sold tainted meat. Each of them had a whole ox or pig, or several sheep, or from fifty to sixty pounds of meat, which were all confiscated in a tainted condition. In one case, sixty-four stuffed Christmas geese were seized, which had proved unsaleable in Liverpool, and had been forwarded to Manchester, where they were brought to market, foul and rotten. All the particulars, with names and fines, were published at the time in the Manchester Guardian. In the six weeks, from July 1st to August 14th, the same sheet reported three similar cases. According to the Guardian, for August 3rd, a pig, weighing two hundred pounds, which had been found dead and decayed, was cut up and exposed for sale by a butcher at Haywood, and was then seized. According to the number for July 31st, two butchers at Wigan, of whom one had previously been convicted of the same offence, were fined two pounds and four pounds respectively, for exposing tainted meat for sale. And according to the number for August 10th, twenty-six tainted hams seized at a dealer's in Bolton were publicly burnt, and the dealer fined twenty shillings. But these are by no means all the cases. They do not even form a fair average for a period of six weeks, according to which to form an average for the year. There are often seasons in which every number of the semi-weekly guardian mentions a similar case found in Manchester or its vicinity. There are often seasons in which every number of the semi-weekly guardian mentions a similar case found in Manchester or its vicinity. And when one reflects upon the many cases which must escape detection in the extensive markets that stretch along the front of every main street, under the slender supervision of the market inspectors, and how else can one explain the boldness with which whole animals are exposed for sale, when one considers how great the temptation must be, in view of the incomprehensibly small fines mentioned in the foregoing cases, when one reflects what condition a piece of meat must have reached to be seized by the inspectors, it is impossible to believe that the workers obtain good and nourishing meat as a usual thing but they are victimized in yet another way by the money-greed of the middle class. Dealers and manufacturers adulterate all kinds of provisions in an atrocious manner, and without the slightest regard to the health of the consumers. We have heard the Manchester Guardian upon this subject. Let us hear another organ of the middle class. I delight in the testimony of my opponents. Let us hear the Liverpool Mercury. Quote, Salted butter is sold for fresh, the lumps being covered with a coating of fresh butter, or a pound of fresh being laid on top to taste, while the salted article is sold after this test, or the whole mass is washed and then sold as fresh. With sugar, pounded rice and other cheap adulterating materials are mixed, and the whole sold at full price. 
the refuse of soap-boiling establishments also is mixed with other things and sold as sugar chicory and other cheap stuff is mixed with ground coffee and artificial coffee beans with the unground article cocoa is often adulterated with fine brown earth treated with fat to render it more easily mistakable for real cocoa tea is mixed with the leaves of the sloe and with other refuse or dry tea leaves are roasted on hot copper plates so returning to the proper colour and being sold as fresh pepper is mixed with pounded nutshells port wine is manufactured outright out of alcohol dye stuffs etc while it is notorious that more of it is consumed in england alone than is grown in portugal and tobacco is mixed with disgusting substances of all sorts and in all possible forms in which the article is produced end quote. I can add that several of the most respected tobacco dealers in Manchester announced publicly last summer that, by reason of the universal adulteration of tobacco, no firm could carry on business without adulteration, and that no cigar costing less than threepence is made wholly from tobacco. These frauds are naturally not restricted to articles of food, though I could mention a dozen more, the villainy of mixing gypsum or chalk with flour among them. Fraud is practiced in the sale of articles of every sort, flannel stockings etc are stretched and shrink after the first washing narrow cloth is sold as being from one and a half to three inches broader than it actually is stoneware is so thinly glazed that the glazing is good for nothing and cracks at once and a hundred other rascalities tout comme chez nous but the lion's share of the evil results of these frauds falls to the workers the rich are less deceived because they can pay the high prices of the large shops which have a reputation to lose and would injure themselves more than their customers if they kept poor or adulterated wares. The rich are spoiled too by habitual good eating, and detect adulteration more easily with their sensitive palates. But the poor, the working people, to whom a couple of farthings are important, who must buy many things with little money, who cannot afford to inquire too closely into the quality of their purchases, and cannot do so in any case because they have had no opportunity of cultivating their taste, to their share fall all the adulterated, poisoned provisions. They must deal with the small retailers, must buy perhaps on credit, and these small retail dealers, who cannot sell even the same quality of goods so cheaply as the largest retailers, because of their small capital and the large proportional expenses of their business, must knowingly or unknowingly buy adulterated goods in order to sell at the lower prices required, and to meet the competition of the others. Further, a large retail dealer who has extensive capital invested in his business is ruined with his ruined credit if detected in a fraudulent practice but what harm does it do a small grocer who has customers in a single street only if frauds are proved against him if no one trusts him in ancoats he moves to trolton or hulm where no one knows him and where he continues to defraud as before while legal penalties attach to very few adulterations unless they involve revenue frauds not in the quality alone, but in the quantity of his goods as well, is the English workingman defrauded. The small dealers usually have false weights and measures, and an incredible number of convictions for such offences may be read in the police reports. How universal this form of fraud is in the manufacturing districts, a couple of extracts from the Manchester Guardian may serve to show. They cover only a short period, and even here I have not all the numbers at hand. Guardian, June 16, 1844 Rockdale Sessions. Four dealers fined five to ten shillings for using light weights. Stockport Sessions. Two dealers fined one shilling, one of them having seven light weights and a false scale, and both having been warned. Guardian, June 19, Rockdale Sessions. One dealer fined five, and two farmers ten shillings. Guardian, June 22, Manchester Justices of the Peace. Nineteen dealers fined two shillings and sixpence to two pounds. Guardian, June 26, Ashton Sessions. Fourteen dealers and farmers find two shillings and sixpence to one pound. Hyde Petty Sessions. Nine farmers and dealers condemned to pay costs and five shillings fines. Guardian, July 9, Manchester. Sixteen dealers condemned to pay costs and fines not exceeding ten shillings. Guardian, July 13, Manchester. Nine dealers fined from two shillings and sixpence to twenty shillings. Guardian, July 24, Rockdale. Four dealers find ten to twenty shillings. Guardian, July 27, Bolton. Twelve dealers and innkeepers condemned to pay costs. Guardian, August 3, Bolton. 
three dealers find two shillings and sixpence and five shillings guardian august ten bolton one dealer find five shillings and the same causes which make the working class the chief sufferers from frauds in the quality of goods make them the usual victims of frauds in the question of quantity too the habitual food of the individual working man naturally varies according to his wages the better paid workers especially those in whose families every member is able to earn something have good food as long as this state of things lasts meat daily and bacon and cheese for supper where wages are less meat is used only two or three times a week and the proportion of bread and potatoes increases descending gradually we find the animal food reduced to a small piece of bacon cut up with the potatoes lower still even this disappears and there remain only bread cheese porridge and potatoes until on the lowest round of the ladder among the irish potatoes form the sole food and as an accompaniment weak tea with perhaps a little sugar milk or spirits is universally drunk tea is regarded in england and even in ireland as quite as indispensable as coffee in germany and where no tea is used the bitterest poverty reigns but all this presupposes that the workman has work when he has none he is wholly at the mercy of accident and eats what is given him what he can beg or steal and if he gets nothing he simply starves as we have seen the quantity of food varies of course like its quality according to the rate of wages so that among ill-paid workers even if they have no large families hunger prevails in spite of full and regular work and the number of the ill-paid is very large especially in london where the competition of the workers rises with the increase of population this class is very numerous but it is to be found in other towns as well in these cases all sorts of devices are used potato parings vegetable refuse and rotten vegetables are eaten for want of other food and everything greedily gathered up which may possibly contain an atom of nourishment and if the week's wages are used up before the end of the week it often enough happens that in the closing days the family gets only as much food if any as is barely sufficient to keep off starvation of course such a way of living unavoidably engenders a multitude of diseases and when these appear when the father from whose work the family is chiefly supported whose physical exertion most demands nourishment and who therefore first succumbs when the father is utterly disabled then misery reaches its height and then the brutality with which society abandons its members just when their need is greatest comes out fully into the light of day to sum up briefly the facts thus far cited the great towns are chiefly inhabited by working people since in the best case there is one bourgeois for two workers often for three here and there for four these workers have no property whatsoever of their own and live wholly upon wages which usually go from hand to mouth society composed wholly of atoms does not trouble itself about them leaves them to care for themselves and their families yet supplies them no means of doing this in an efficient and permanent manner every working man even the best is therefore constantly exposed to loss of work and food that is to death by starvation and many perish in this way the dwellings of the workers are everywhere badly planned badly built and kept in the worst condition badly ventilated damp and unwholesome the inhabitants are confined to the smallest possible space and at least one family usually sleeps in each room the interior arrangement of the dwellings is poverty-stricken in various degrees down to the utter absence of even the most necessary furniture the clothing of the workers too is generally scanty and that of great multitudes is in rags the food is in general bad almost unfit for use and in many cases at least at times insufficient in quantity so that in extreme cases death by starvation results thus the working class of the great cities offers a graduated scale of conditions in life in the best cases a temporarily endurable existence for hard work and good wages good and endurable that is from the worker's standpoint in the worst cases bitter want reaching even homelessness and death by starvation the average is much nearer the worst case than the best and this series does not fall into fixed classes so that one can say this fraction of the working class is well off has always been so and remains so if that is the case here and there if single branches of work have in general an advantage over others yet the condition of the workers in each branch is subject to such great fluctuations 
that a single working man may be so placed as to pass through the whole range from comparative comfort to the extremest need, even to death by starvation, while almost every English working man can tell a tale of marked changes of fortune. Let us examine the causes of this somewhat more closely. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels Chapter 3 Competition We have seen in the introduction how competition created the proletariat at the very beginning of the industrial movement by increasing the wages of weavers in consequence of the increased demand for woven goods, so inducing the weaving peasants to abandon their farms and earn more money by devoting themselves to their looms. We have seen how it crowded out the small farmers by means of the large farm system, reduced them to the rank of proletarians, and attracted them in part into the towns. How it further ruined the small bourgeoisie in great measure, and reduced its members also to the ranks of the proletariat how it centralized capital in the hands of the few, and population in the great towns. Such are the various ways and means by which competition, as it reached its full manifestation and free development in modern industry, created and extended the proletariat. We shall now have to observe its influence on the working class already created, and here we must begin by tracing the results of competition of single workers with one another. Competition is the completest expression of the battle of all against all which rules in modern civil society. This battle, a battle for life, for existence, for everything, in case of need of a battle of life and death, is fought not between the different classes of society only, but also between the individual members of these classes. Each is in the way of the other, and each seeks to crowd out all who are in his way, and to put himself in their place. The workers are in constant competition among themselves, as the members of the bourgeoisie among themselves. The power-loom weaver is in competition with the hand-loom weaver, the unemployed or ill-paid hand-loom weaver with him who has work, or is better paid, each trying to supplant the other. But this competition of the workers among themselves is the worst side of the present state of things in its effect upon the worker, the sharpest weapon against the proletariat in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Hence the effort of the workers to nullify this competition by associations. Hence the hatred of the bourgeoisie towards these associations, and its triumph in every defeat which befalls them. The proletarian is helpless. Left to himself, he cannot live a single day. The bourgeoisie has gained a monopoly of all means of existence in the broadest sense of the word. What the proletarian needs, he can obtain only from this bourgeoisie, which is protected in its monopoly by the power of the state. The proletarian is therefore, in law and in fact, the slave of the bourgeoisie, which can decree his life or death. It offers him the means of living, but only for an equivalent for his work. It even lets him have the appearance of acting from a free choice, of making a contract with free, unconstrained consent, as a responsible agent who has attained his majority fine freedom, where the proletarian has no other choice than that of either accepting the conditions which the bourgeoisie offers him, or of starving, of freezing to death, of sleeping naked among the beasts of the forests. A fine equivalent valued at pleasure by the bourgeoisie. And if one proletarian is such a fool as to starve, rather than agree to the equitable propositions of the bourgeoisie, his natural superiors, another is easily found in his place. There are proletarians enough in the world, and not all so insane as to prefer dying to living. Here we have the competition of the workers among themselves. If all the proletarians announce their determination to starve rather than work for the bourgeoisie, the latter would have to surrender its monopoly. But this is not the case, is indeed a rather impossible case, so that the bourgeoisie still thrives. To this competition of the worker there is but one limit. No worker will work for less than he needs to subsist. If he must starve, he will prefer to starve in idleness rather than in toil. 
True, this limit is relative. One needs more than another. One is accustomed to more comfort than another. The Englishman who is still somewhat civilized needs more than the Irishman who goes in rags, eats potatoes, and sleeps in a pigsty. But that does not hinder the Irishman's competing with the Englishman, and gradually forcing the rate of wages, and with it the Englishman's level of civilization, down to the Irishman's level. Certain kinds of work require a certain grade of civilization, and to these belong almost all forms of industrial occupation. Hence the interest of the bourgeoisie requires in this case that wages should be high enough to enable the workman to keep himself upon the required plane. The newly immigrated Irishman, encamped in the first stable that offers, or turned out in the street after a week because he spends everything upon drink and cannot pay rent, would be a poor mill-hand. The mill-hand must, therefore, have wages enough to enable him to bring up his children to regular work. But no more, lest he should be able to get on without the wages of his children, and so make something else of them than mere working men. Here, too, the limit, the minimum wage, is relative. When every member of the family works, the individual worker can get on with proportionately less, and the bourgeoisie has made the most of the opportunity of employing and making profitable the labor of women and children afforded by machine work. Of course it is not in every family that every member can be set to work, and those in which the case is otherwise would be in a bad way if obliged to exist upon the minimum wage possible to a wholly employed family. Hence the usual wages form an average according to which a fully employed family gets on pretty well, and one which embraces few members able to work pretty badly. But in the worst case, every working man prefers surrendering the trifling luxury to which he was accustomed to not living at all, prefers a pig-pen to no roof, wears rags in preference to going naked, confines himself to a potato diet in preference to starvation. He contents himself with half-pay in the hope of better times, rather than be driven into the street to perish before the eyes of the world, as so many have done who had no work whatever. This trifle, therefore, this something more than nothing, is the minimum of wages, and if there are more workers at hand than the bourgeoisie thinks well to employ, if at the end of the battle of competition there yet remain workers who find nothing to do, they must simply starve for the bourgeois will hardly give them work if he cannot sell the produce of their labor at a profit. From this it is evident what the minimum wages is. The maximum is determined by the competition of the bourgeoisie among themselves, for we have seen how they too must compete with each other. The bourgeois can increase his capital only in commerce and manufacture, and in both cases he needs workers. Even if he invests his capital at interest, he needs them indirectly for without commerce and manufacture no one would pay him interest upon his capital, no one could use it. So the bourgeois certainly needs workers, not indeed for his immediate living, for at need he could consume his capital, but as we need an article of trade or a beast of burden as a means of profit. The proletarian produces the goods which the bourgeois sells with advantage. When, therefore, the demand for these goods increases so that all the competing workmen are employed, and a few more might perhaps be useful, the competition among the workers falls away, and the bourgeoisie begin to compete among themselves. The capitalist in search of workmen knows very well that his profits increase as prices rise in consequence of the increased demand for his goods, and pays a trifle higher wages rather than let the whole profit escape him. He sends the butter to fetch the cheese, and getting the latter leaves the butter ungrudgingly to the workers. So one capitalist after another goes in chase of workers, and wages rise, but only as high as the increasing demand permits. If the capitalist, who willingly sacrificed a part of his extraordinary profit, runs into danger of sacrificing any part of his ordinary average profit, he takes very good care not to pay more than average wages. From this we can determine the average rate of wages. Under average circumstances, when neither workers nor capitalists have reason to compete, especially among themselves, when there are just as many workers at hand as can be employed in producing precisely the goods that are demanded, wages stand a little above the minimum. How far they rise above the minimum will depend upon the average needs and the grade of civilization of the workers. If the workers are accustomed to eat meat several times in the week, the capitalists must reconcile themselves 
to paying wages enough to make this food attainable, not less, because the workers are not competing among themselves and have no occasion to content themselves with less, not more, because the capitalists, in the absence of competition among themselves, have no occasion to attract working men by extraordinary favors. This standard of the average needs and the average civilization of the workers has become very complicated by reason of the complications of English industry, and is different for different sorts of workers, as has been pointed out. Most industrial occupations demand a certain skill and regularity, and for these qualities which involve a certain grade of civilization, the rate of wages must be such as to induce the worker to acquire such skill and subject himself to such regularity. Hence it is that the average wages of industrial workers are higher than those of mere porters, day laborers, etc., higher especially than those of agricultural laborers, a fact to which the additional cost of the necessities of life in cities contributes somewhat. In other words, the worker is, in law and in fact, the slave of the property-holding class, so effectually a slave that he is sold like a piece of goods, rises and falls in value like a commodity. If the demand for workers increases, the price of workers rises. If it falls, their price falls. If it falls so greatly that a number of them become unsaleable, if they are left in stock, they are simply left idle, and as they cannot live upon that, they die of starvation. For to speak in the words of the economists, the expense incurred in maintaining them would not be reproduced, would be money thrown away, and to this end no man advances capital. And so far, Malthus was perfectly right in his theory of population. The only difference as compared with the old, outspoken slavery is this, that the worker of to-day seems to be free because he is not sold once for all, but piecemeal by the day, the week, the year, and because no one owner sells him to another. But he is forced to sell himself in this way instead, being the slave of no particular person, but of the whole property-holding class. For him the matter is unchanged at bottom, and if this semblance of liberty necessarily gives him some real freedom on the one hand, it entails on the other the disadvantage that no one guarantees him a subsistence. He is in danger of being repudiated at any moment by his master, the bourgeoisie, and left to die of starvation, if the bourgeoisie ceases to have an interest in his employment, his existence. The bourgeoisie, on the other hand, is far better off under the present arrangement than under the old slave system. It can dismiss its employees at discretion without sacrificing invested capital, and gets its work done much more cheaply than is possible with slave labor, as Adam Smith comfortingly pointed out. Hence it follows, too, that Adam Smith was perfectly right in making the assertion, quote, that the demand for men, like that for any other commodity, necessarily regulates the production of men, quickens it when it goes on too slowly, and stops it when it advances too fast. End quote. Just as in the case of any other commodity. If there are too few laborers at hand, prices, that is, wages, rise, the workers are more prosperous, marriages multiply, more children are born, and more live to grow up, until a sufficient number of laborers has been secured. If there are too many on hand, prices fall, want of work, poverty and starvation, and consequent diseases arise, and the, quote, surplus population, end quote, is put out of the way. And Malthus, who carried the foregoing proposition of Smith farther, was also right in his way, in asserting that there are always more people on hand than can be maintained from the available means of subsistence. Surplus population is engendered rather by the competition of the workers among themselves, which forces each separate worker to labor as much each day as his strength can possibly admit. If a manufacturer can employ ten hands nine hours daily, he can employ nine of each works ten hours, and the tenth goes hungry. And if a manufacturer can force the nine hands to work an extra hour daily for the same wages, by threatening to discharge them at a time when the demand for hands is not very great, he discharges the tenth and saves so much wages. This is the process on a small scale, which goes on in a nation on a large one. The productiveness of each hand raised to the highest pitch by the competition of the workers among themselves, the division of labor, the introduction of machinery, the subjugation of the forces of nature, deprive a multitude of workers of bread. These starving workers are then removed from the market. They can buy nothing, 
and the quantity of articles of consumption previously required by them is no longer in demand, need no longer be produced. The workers previously employed in producing them are therefore driven out of work, and are also removed from the market, and so it goes on, always the same old round, or rather so it would go if other circumstances did not intervene. The introduction of the industrial forces already referred to for increasing production leads, in the course of time, to a reduction of prices of the articles produced and to consequent increased consumption, so that a large part of the displaced workers finally, after long suffering, find work again. If, in addition to this, the conquest of foreign markets constantly and rapidly increases the demand for manufactured goods, as has been the case in England during the past sixty years, the demand for hands increases, and in proportion to it the population. Thus, instead of diminishing, the population of the British Empire has increased with extraordinary rapidity, and is still increasing. Yet, in spite of the extension of industry, in spite of the demand for working men which, in general, has increased, there is, according to the confession of all the official political parties, Tory, Whig, and Radical, permanent surplus, superfluous population. The competition among the workers is constantly greater than the competition to secure workers. Whence comes this incongruity? It lies in the nature of industrial competition and the commercial crises which arise from them. In the present unregulated production and distribution of the means of subsistence, which is carried on not directly for the sake of supplying needs, but for profit, in the system under which every one works for himself to enrich himself, disturbances inevitably arise at every moment. For example, England supplies a number of countries with most diverse goods. Now, although the manufacturer may know how much of each article is consumed in each country annually, he cannot know how much is on hand at every given moment much less can he know how much his competitors export thither. He can only draw most uncertain inferences from the perpetual fluctuations in prices as to the quantities on hand and the needs of the moment. He must trust to luck in exporting his goods. Everything is done blindly, as guesswork, more or less at the mercy of accident. Upon the slightest favourable report, each one exports what he can, and before long such a market is glutted, sales stop, capital remains inactive, prices fall, and the English manufacturer has no further employment for its hands. In the beginning of the development of manufacture, these checks were limited to single branches and single markets, but the centralizing tendency of competition, which drives the hands thrown out of one branch into such other branches as are most easily accessible, and transfers the goods which cannot be disposed of in one market to other markets, has gradually brought the single minor crises nearer together, and united them into one periodically recurring crisis. Such a crisis usually recurs once in five years, after a brief period of activity and general prosperity. The home market, like all foreign ones, is glutted with English goods, which it can only slowly absorb. The industrial movement comes to a standstill in almost every branch, the small manufacturers and merchants who cannot survive a prolonged inactivity of their invested capital fail, the larger ones suspend business during the worst season, close their mills or work short time, perhaps half the day. Wages fall by reason of the competition of the unemployed, the diminution of working time and the lack of profitable sales. Want becomes universal among the workers, the small savings which individuals may have made are rapidly consumed, the philanthropic institutions are overburdened, the poor rates are doubled, trebled, and still insufficient, the number of the starving increases, and the whole multitude of surplus population presses in terrific numbers into the foreground. This continues for a time. The surplus exist as best they may, or perish. Philanthropy and the poor law help many of them to a painful prolongation of their existence. Others find scant means of subsistence here and there, in such kinds of work as have been least open to competition, are most remote from manufacture. And with how little can a human being keep body and soul together for a time? Gradually the state of things improve, the accumulations of goods are consumed, the general depression among the men of commerce and manufacture prevents a too hasty replenishing of the markets, and at last rising prices and favourable reports from all directions restore activity. Most of the markets are distant ones, Demand increases and prices rise constantly while the first exports are arriving. 
people struggle for the first goods, the first sales in live and trade still more, the prospective ones promise still higher prices. Expecting a further rise, merchants begin to buy upon speculation, and so to withdraw from consumption the articles intended for it, just when they are most needed. Speculation forces prices still higher, by inspiring others to purchase, and appropriating new importations at once. All this is reported to England, manufacturers begin to produce with a will, new mills are built, every means is employed to make the most of the favourable moment. Speculation arises here, too, exerting the same influence as upon foreign markets, raising prices, withdrawing goods from consumption, spurring manufacture in both ways to the highest pitch of effort. Then come the daring speculators, working with fictitious capital, living upon credit, ruined if they cannot speedily sell. They hurl themselves into this universal, disorderly race for profits, multiply the disorder and haste by their unbridled passion, which drives prices and production to madness. It is a frantic struggle, which carries away even the most experienced and phlegmatic. Goods are spun, woven, hammered, as if all mankind were to be newly equipped, as though two thousand million new consumers had been discovered in the moon. All at once the shaky speculators abroad, who must have money, begin to sell, below market price, of course, for their need is urgent. One sale is followed by others, prices fluctuate, speculators throw their goods upon the market in terror, the market is disordered, credit shaken, one house after another stops payments, bankruptcy follows bankruptcy, and the discovery is made that three times more goods are on hand or under way than can be consumed. The news reaches England, where production has been going on at full speed, meanwhile. Panic ceases all hands. Failures abroad cause others in England. The panic crushes a number of firms. All reserves are thrown upon the market here, too, in the moment of anxiety, and the alarm is still further exaggerated. This is the beginning of the crisis, which then takes precisely the same course as its predecessor, and gives place in turn to a season of prosperity. So it goes on perpetually prosperity, crisis, prosperity, crisis. And this perennial round in which English industry moves is, as has been before observed, usually completed once in five or six years. From this it is clear that English manufacture must have at all times, save the brief periods of highest prosperity, an unemployed reserve army of workers, in order to be able to produce the masses of goods required by the market in the liveliest months. This reserve army is larger or smaller, according as the state of the market occasions the employment of a larger or smaller proportion of its members. And if at the moment of highest activity of the market the agricultural districts and the branches least affected by the general prosperity temporarily supply to manufacture a number of workers, these are a mere minority, and these too belong to the reserve army, with the single difference that the prosperity of the moment was required to reveal their connection with it. When they enter upon the more active branches of work, their former employers draw in somewhat in order to feel the loss less, work longer hours, employ women and younger workers, and when the wanderers discharged at the beginning of the crisis return, they find their places filled and themselves superfluous, at least in the majority of cases. This reserve army, which embraces an immense multitude during the crisis, and a large number during the period which may be regarded as the average between the highest prosperity and the crisis, is the surplus population of England, which keeps body and soul together by begging, stealing, street-sweeping, collecting manure, pushing hand-carts, driving donkeys, peddling, or performing occasional small jobs. In every great town a multitude of such people may be found. It is astonishing in what devices this surplus population takes refuge. The London crossing sweepers are known all over the world. But hitherto the principal streets in all the great cities, as well as the crossings, have been swept by people out of other work, and employed by the poor law guardians or the municipal authorities for the purpose. Now, however, a machine has been invented which rattles through the streets daily, and has spoiled this source of income for the unemployed. Along the great highways leading into the cities, on which there is a great deal of wagon traffic, a large number of people may be seen with small carts gathering fresh horse dung at the risk of their lives among the passing coaches and omnibuses, often paying a couple of shillings a week to the authorities for the privilege. 
but this occupation is forbidden in many places because the ordinary street sweepings thus impoverished cannot be sold as manure happy are such of the surplus as can obtain a push-cart and go about with it happier still those to whom it is vouchsafed to possess an ass in addition to the cart the ass must get his own food or is given a little gathered refuse and can yet bring in a trifle of money most of the surplus betake themselves to huckstering on saturday afternoons especially when the whole working population is on the streets the crowd who live from huckstering and peddling may be seen shoe and corset laces braces twine cakes oranges every kind of small articles are offered by men women and children and at other times also such peddlers are always to be seen standing at the street corners or going about with cakes and ginger beer or nettle beer matches and such things sealing wax and patent mixtures for lighting fires are further resources of such vendors others so-called jobbers go about the streets seeking small jobs many of these succeed in getting a day's work many are not so fortunate Quote, at the gates of all the london docks says the rev w champney preacher of the east end hundreds of the poor appear every morning in winter before daybreak in the hope of getting a day's work they await the opening of the gates and when the youngest and strongest and best known have been engaged hundreds cast down by disappointed hope go back to their wretched homes when these people find no work and will not rebel against society what remains for them but to beg and surely no one can wonder at the great army of beggars most of them able-bodied men with whom the police carries on perpetual war but the beggary of these men has a peculiar character such a man usually goes about with his family singing a pleading song in the streets or appealing in a speech to the benevolence of the passers-by and it is a striking fact that these beggars are seen almost exclusively in the working people's districts that it is almost exclusively the gifts of the poor from which they live or the family takes up its position in a busy street and without uttering a word lets the mere sight of its helplessness plead for it in this case too they reckon upon the sympathy of the workers alone who know from experience how it feels to be hungry and are liable to find themselves in the same situation at any moment for this dumb yet most moving appeal is met with almost solely in such streets as are frequented by working men and at such hours as working men pass by but especially on summer evenings when the secrets of the working people's quarters are generally revealed and the middle class withdraws as far as possible from the district thus polluted and he among the surplus who has courage and passion enough openly to resist society to reply with declared war upon the bourgeoisie to the disguised war which the bourgeoisie wages upon him goes forth to rob plunder murder and burn of this surplus population there are according to the reports of the poor law commissioners on an average a million and a half in england and wales in scotland the number cannot be ascertained for want of poor law regulations and with ireland we shall deal separately moreover this million and a half includes only those who actually apply to the parish for relief the great multitude who struggle on without recourse to this most hated expedient it does not embrace on the other hand a good part of the number belongs to the agricultural districts and does not enter into the present discussion during a crisis this number naturally increases markedly and want reaches its highest pitch take for instance the crisis of eighteen forty two which being the latest was the most violent for the intensity of the crisis increases with each repetition and the next which may be expected not later than eighteen forty seven will probably be still more violent and lasting during this crisis the poor rates rose in every town to a hitherto unknown height in stockport among other towns for every pound paid in house rent eight shillings of poor rate had to be paid so that the rate alone formed forty per cent of the house rent moreover whole streets stood vacant so that there were at least twenty thousand fewer inhabitants than usual and on the doors of the empty houses might be read quote, stockport to let end quote in bolton where in ordinary years the rents from which rates are paid averaged eighty six thousand pounds they sank to thirty six thousand pounds the number of the poor to be supported rose on the other hand to fourteen thousand or more than twenty per cent of the whole number of inhabitants in leeds the poor law guardians had a reserve fund of ten thousand pounds 
this with a contribution of seven thousand pounds was wholly exhausted before the crisis reached its height so it was everywhere a report drawn up in january eighteen forty three by a committee of the anti corn law league on the condition of the industrial districts in eighteen forty two which was based upon detailed statements of the manufacturers asserts that the poor rate was taking the average twice as high as in eighteen thirty nine and that the number of persons requiring relief has trebled even quintupled since that time that a multitude of applicants belonged to a class which had never before solicited relief that the working class commands more than two-thirds less of the means of subsistence than from eighteen thirty four to eighteen thirty six that the consumption of meat had been decidedly less in some places twenty per cent in others reaching sixty per cent less that even handicraftsmen smiths bricklayers and others who usually have full employment in the most depressed periods now suffered greatly from want of work and reduction of wages and that even now in january eighteen forty three wages are still steadily falling and these are the reports of manufacturers the starving workmen whose mills were idle whose employers could give them no work stood in the streets in all directions begged singly or in crowds besieged the sidewalks in armies and appealed to the passers-by for help they begged not cringing like ordinary beggars but threatening by their numbers their gestures and their words such was the state of things in all the industrial districts from leicester to leeds and from manchester to birmingham here and there disturbances arose as in the staffordshire potteries in july the most frightful excitement prevailed among the workers until the general insurrection broke out throughout the manufacturing districts in august when i came to manchester in november eighteen forty two there were crowds of unemployed workingmen at every street corner and many mills were still standing idle in the following months these unwilling corner loafers gradually vanished and the factories came into activity once more to what extent want and suffering prevail among these unemployed during such a crisis i need not describe the poor rates are insufficient vastly insufficient the philanthropy of the rich is a raindrop in the ocean lost in the moment of falling beggary can support but few among the crowds if the small dealers did not sell to the working people on credit at such times as long as possible paying themselves liberally afterwards it must be confessed and if the working people did not help each other every crisis would remove a multitude of the surplus through death by starvation since however the most depressed period is brief lasting at worst but one two or two and a half years most of them emerge from it with their lives after dire privations but indirectly by disease etc every crisis finds a multitude of victims as we shall see first however let us turn to another cause of abasement to which the english worker is exposed a cause permanently active in forcing the whole class downwards End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Condition of the Working Class in England in eighteen forty four. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in eighteen forty four by Friedrich Engels. Chapter Four Irish Immigration. We have already referred several times in passing to the Irish who have immigrated into England and we shall now have to investigate more closely the causes and results of this immigration. The rapid extension of English industry could not have taken place if England had not possessed in the numerous and impoverished population of Ireland a reserve at command. The Irish had nothing to lose at home, and much to gain in England, and from the time when it became known in Ireland that the east side of St. George's Channel offered steady work and good pay for strong arms, every year has brought armies of the Irish hither. It has been calculated that more than a million have already immigrated, and not far from fifty thousand still come every year, nearly all of whom enter the industrial districts, especially the great cities, and there form the lowest class of the population. Thus there are in London one hundred and twenty thousand, in Manchester forty thousand, in Liverpool thirty-four thousand, Bristol twenty-four thousand, Glasgow 40,000, Edinburgh 29,000 poor Irish people. 
These people, having grown up almost without civilization, accustomed from youth to every sort of privation, rough, intemperate, and improvident, bring all their brutal habits with them among a class of the English population which has, in truth, little inducement to cultivate education and morality. Let us hear Thomas Carlyle upon this subject. Quote, the wild Milesian features, looking false ingenuity, restlessness, unreason, misery, and mockery, salute you on all highways and byways. The English coachman, as he whirls past, lashes the Milesian with his whip, curses him with his tongue. The Milesian is holding out his hat to beg. He is the sorest evil this country has to strive with. In his rags and laughing savagery, he is there to undertake all work that can be done by mere strength of hand and back for wages that will purchase him potatoes. He needs only salt for condiment, he lodges to his mind in any pig-hutch or dog-hutch, roosts in outhouses, and wears a suit of tatters, the getting on and off of which is said to be a difficult operation, transacted only in festivals and the high tides of the calendar. The Saxon man, if he cannot work on these terms, finds no work. The uncivilized Irishman, not by his strength, but by the opposite of strength, drives the Saxon native out, takes possession in his room. There abides he, in his squalor and unreason, in his falsity and drunken violence, as the ready-made nucleus of degradation and disorder. Whoever struggles, swimming with difficulty, may now find an example how the human being can exist not swimming, but sunk that the condition of the lower multitude of English labourers approximates more and more to that of the Irish, competing with them in all the markets, that whatsoever labour, to which mere strength with little skill will suffice, is to be done, will be done not at the English price, but at an approximation to the Irish price, at a price superior as yet to the Irish, that is, superior to scarcity of potatoes for thirty weeks yearly, superior yet hourly, with the arrival of every new steamboat, sinking nearer to an equality with that." End quote. If we accept his exaggerated and one-sided condemnation of the Irish national character, Carlyle is perfectly right. These Irishmen who migrate for fourpence to England, on the deck of a steamship on which they are often packed like cattle, insinuate themselves everywhere. The worst dwellings are good enough for them. Their clothing causes them little trouble, so long as it holds together by a single thread. Shoes they know not. Their food consists of potatoes and potatoes only. Whatever they earn beyond these needs, they spend upon drink. What does such a race want with high wages? The worst quarters of all the large towns are inhabited by Irishmen. Whenever a district is distinguished for especial filth and especial ruinousness, the explorer may safely count upon meeting chiefly those Celtic faces which one recognizes at the first glance as different from the Saxon physiognomy of the native, and the singing, aspirate brogue which the true Irishman never loses. I have occasionally heard the Irish Celtic language spoken in the most thickly populated parts of Manchester. The majority of the families who live in cellars are almost everywhere of Irish origin. In short, the Irish have, as Dr. Kay says, discovered the minimum of the necessities of life, and are now making the English workers acquainted with it. Filth and drunkenness, too, they have brought with them. The lack of cleanliness, which is not so injurious in the country where the population is scattered, and which is the Irishman's second nature, becomes terrifying and gravely dangerous through its concentration here in the great cities. The Milesian deposits all garbage and filth before his house door here, as he was accustomed to do at home and so accumulates the pools and dirt heaps which disfigure the working people's quarters and poison the air. He builds a pigsty against the house wall as he did at home, and if he is prevented from doing this, he lets the pig sleep in the room with himself. This new and unnatural method of cattle-raising in cities is wholly of Irish origin. The Irishman loves his pig as the Arab his horse, with the difference that he sells it when it is fat enough to kill. Otherwise he eats and sleeps with it, his children play with it, ride upon it, roll in the dirt with it, as any one may see a thousand times repeated in all the great towns of England. The filth and comfortlessness that prevail in the houses themselves it is impossible to describe. The Irishman is unaccustomed to the presence of furniture. A heap of straw, a few rags, 
utterly beyond use as clothing, suffice for his nightly couch. A piece of wood, a broken chair, an old chest for a table, more he needs not. A tea-kettle, a few pots and dishes equip his kitchen, which is also his sleeping and living-room. When he is in want of fuel, everything combustible within his reach, chairs, door-posts, mouldings, flooring, finds its way up the chimney. Moreover, why should he need much room? At home in his mud-cabin there was only one room for all domestic purposes. More than one room his family does not need in England. So the custom of crowding many persons into a single room, now so universal, has been chiefly implanted by the Irish immigration. And since the poor devil must have one enjoyment, and society has shut him out of all others, he betakes himself to the drinking of spirits. Drink is the only thing which makes the Irishman's life worth having, drink and his cheery care-free temperament. So he revels in drink to the point of the most bestial drunkenness. The southern facile nature of the Irishman, his crudity, which places him but little above the savage, his contempt for all humane enjoyments in which his very crudeness makes him incapable of sharing, his filth and poverty, all favour drunkenness. The temptation is great, he cannot resist it, and so when he has money he gets rid of it down his throat. What else should he do? How can society blame him when it places him in a position in which he almost of necessity becomes a drunkard? When it leaves him to himself, to his savagery? With such a competitor, the English workingman has to struggle with a competitor upon the lowest plane possible in a civilized country, who for this very reason requires less wages than any other. Nothing else is therefore possible than that, as Carlyle says, the wages of English workingmen should be forced down further and further in every branch in which the Irish compete with him. And these branches are many. All such as demand little or no skill are open to the Irish. For work which requires long training or regular pertinacious application, the dissolute, unsteady, drunken Irishman is on too low a plane. To become a mechanic, a mill-hand, he would have to adopt the English civilization, the English customs, become in the main an Englishman. But for all simple, less exact work, wherever it is a question more of strength than skill, the Irishman is as good as the Englishman. Such occupations are therefore especially overcrowded with Irishmen, hand-weavers, bricklayers, porters, jobbers, and such workers count hordes of Irishmen among their numbers, and the pressure of this race has done much to depress wages and lower the working class. And even if the Irish, who have forced their way into other occupations, should become more civilized, enough of the old habits would cling to them to have a strong degrading influence upon their English companions in toil especially in view of the general effect of being surrounded by the Irish. For when, in almost every great city, a fifth or one quarter of the workers are Irish, or children of Irish parents who have grown up among Irish filth, no one can wonder if the life, habits, intelligence, moral status, in short, the whole character of the working class assimilates a great part of the Irish characteristics. On the contrary, it is easy to understand how the degrading position of the English workers engendered by our modern history and its immediate consequences, has been still more degraded by the presence of Irish competition. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5, Part 1 of The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter 5. Results. Having now investigated, somewhat in detail, the conditions under which the English working class lives, it is time to draw some further inferences from the facts presented, and then to compare our inferences with the actual state of things. Let us see what the workers themselves have become under the given circumstances, what sort of people they are, what their physical, mental, and moral status. When one individual inflicts bodily injury upon another, such injury that death results, we call the deed manslaughter. When the assailant knew in advance that the injury would be fatal, we call his deed murder. But when society places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and an unnatural death, 
one which is quite as much a death by violence as that by the sword or bullet, when it deprives thousands of the necessaries of life, places them under conditions in which they cannot live, forces them through the strong arm of the law to remain in such conditions until that death ensues which is the inevitable consequence, knows that these thousands of victims must perish, and yet permits these conditions to remain, its deed is murder just as surely as the deed of the single individual. Disguised, malicious murder, murder against which none can defend himself, which does not seem what it is, because no man sees the murderer, because the death of the victim seems a natural one since the offence is more one of omission than of commission. But murder it remains. I have now to prove that society in England daily and hourly commits what the working men's organs, with perfect correctness, characterise as social murder, that it has placed the workers under conditions in which they can neither retain health nor live long, that it undermines the vital force of these workers gradually, little by little, and so hurries them to the grave before their time. I have further to prove that society knows how injurious such conditions are to the health and the life of the workers, and yet does nothing to improve these conditions. That it knows the consequences of its deeds, that its act is, therefore, not mere manslaughter but murder, I shall have proved, when I cite official documents, reports of Parliament and of the government in substantiation of my charge. That a class which lives under the conditions already sketched and is so ill provided with the most necessary means of subsistence, cannot be healthy and can reach no advanced age, is self-evident. Let us review the circumstances once more with a special reference to the health of the workers. The centralization of population in great cities exercises of itself an unfavorable influence. The atmosphere of London can never be so pure, so rich in oxygen, as the air of the country. Two and a half million pairs of lungs 250,000 fires crowded upon an area three to four miles square consume an enormous amount of oxygen, which is replaced with difficulty because the method of building cities in itself impedes ventilation. The carbonic acid gas, engendered by respiration and fire, remains in the streets by reason of its specific gravity, and the chief air current passes over the roofs of the city. The lungs of the inhabitants fail to receive the due supply of oxygen, and the consequence is mental and physical lassitude and low vitality. For this reason, the dwellers in cities are far less exposed to acute and especially to inflammatory affections than rural populations, who live in a free, normal atmosphere, but they suffer the more from chronic affections. And if life in large cities is, in itself, injurious to health, how great must be the harmful influence of an abnormal atmosphere in the working people's quarters, where, as we have seen, everything combines to poison the air. In the country it may, perhaps, be comparatively innoxious to keep a dung-heap adjoining one's dwelling, because the air has free ingress from all sides. But in the midst of a large town, among closely built lanes and courts that shut out all movement of the atmosphere, the case is different. All putrefying vegetable and animal substances give off gases decidedly injurious to health, and if these gases have no free way of escape, they inevitably poison the atmosphere. The filth and stagnant pools of the working people's quarters in the great cities have, therefore, the worst effect upon the public health, because they produce precisely those gases which engender disease. So, too, the exhalations from contaminated streams. But this is by no means all. The manner in which the great multitude of the poor is treated by society to-day is revolting, they are drawn into the large cities where they breathe a poorer atmosphere than in the country. They are relegated to districts which, by reason of the method of construction, are worse ventilated than any others. They are deprived of all means of cleanliness, of water itself, since pipes are laid only when paid for, and the river so polluted that they are useless for such purposes. They are obliged to throw all offal and garbage, all dirty water, often all disgusting drainage and excrement into the streets, being without other means of disposing of them. They are thus compelled to infect the region of their own dwellings. Nor is this enough. All conceivable evils are heaped upon the heads of the poor. If the population of great cities is too dense in general, it is they in particular who are packed into the least space. As though the vitiated atmosphere of the streets were not enough, they are penned in dozens into single rooms, 
so that the air which they breathe at night is enough in itself to stifle them they are given damp dwellings cellar dens that are not waterproof from below or garrets that leak from above their houses are so built that the clammy air cannot escape they are supplied bad tattered or rotten clothing adulterated and indigestible food they are exposed to the most exciting changes of mental condition the most violent vibrations between hope and fear they are hunted like game and not permitted to attain peace of mind and quiet enjoyment of life they are deprived of all enjoyments except that of sexual indulgence and drunkenness are worked every day to the point of complete exhaustion of their mental and physical energies and are thus constantly spurred on to the maddest excess in the only two enjoyments at their command and if they surmount all this they fall victims to want of work in a crisis when all the little is taken from them that had hitherto been vouchsafed them how is it possible under such conditions for the lower class to be healthy and long-lived what else can be expected than an excessive mortality an unbroken series of epidemics a progressive deterioration in the physique of the working population let us see how the facts stand that the dwellings of the workers in the worst portions of the cities together with the other conditions of life of this class engender numerous diseases is attested on all sides the article already quoted from the artisan asserts with perfect truth that lung diseases must be the inevitable consequence of such conditions and that indeed cases of this kind are disproportionately frequent in this class that the bad air of london and especially of the working people's districts is in the highest degree favourable to the development of consumption the hectic appearance of great numbers of persons sufficiently indicates if one roams the streets a little in the early morning when the multitudes are on their way to their work one is amazed at the number of persons who look wholly or half consumptive even in manchester the people have not the same appearance these pale lank narrow-chested hollow-eyed ghosts whom one passes at every step these languid flabby faces incapable of the slightest energetic expression i have seen in such startling numbers only in london though consumption carries off a horde of victims annually in the factory towns of the north in competition with consumption stands typhus to say nothing of scarlet fever a disease which brings most frightful devastation into the ranks of the working class typhus that universally diffused affliction is attributed by the official report on the sanitary condition of the working class directly to the bad state of the dwellings in the matters of ventilation drainage and cleanliness this report compiled it must not be forgotten by the leading physicians of england from the testimony of other physicians asserts that a single ill-ventilated court a single blind alley without drainage is enough to engender fever and usually does engender it especially if the inhabitants are greatly crowded this fever has the same character almost everywhere and develops in nearly every case into specific typhus it is to be found in the working people's quarters of all great towns and cities and in single ill-built ill-kept streets of smaller places though it naturally seeks out single victims in better districts also in london it has now prevailed for a considerable time its extraordinary violence in the year eighteen thirty seven gave rise to the report already referred to according to the annual report of dr southwood smith on the london fever hospital the number of patients in eighteen forty three was one thousand four hundred and sixty two or four hundred and eighteen more than in any previous year in the damp dirty regions of the north south and east districts of london this disease raged with extraordinary violence many of the patients were working people from the country who had endured the severest privation while migrating and after their arrival had slept hungry and half naked in the streets and so fallen victims to the fever these people were brought into the hospital in such a state of weakness that unusual quantities of wine cognac and preparations of ammonia and other stimulants were required for their treatment sixteen and a half per cent of all patients died this malignant fever is to be found in manchester in the worst quarters of the old town ancoats little ireland etc it is rarely extinct though here as in the english towns generally it prevails to a less extent than might be expected in scotland and ireland on the other hand it rages with a violence that surpasses all conception in edinburgh and glasgow it broke out in eighteen seventeen after the famine 
and in 1826 and 1837 with especial violence after the commercial crisis, subsiding somewhat each time after having raged about three years. In Edinburgh, about 6,000 persons were attacked by the fever during the epidemic of 1817, and about 10,000 in that of 1837. And not only the number of persons attacked, but the violence of the disease increased with each repetition. But the fury of the epidemic in all former periods seems to have been child's play in comparison with its ravages after the crisis of 1842. One-sixth of the whole indigent population of Scotland was seized by the fever, and the infection was carried by wandering beggars with fearful rapidity from one locality to another. It did not reach the middle and upper classes of the population, yet in two months there were more fever cases than in twelve years before. In Glasgow, twelve per cent of the population were seized in the year 1843. Thirty-two thousand persons, of whom thirty-two per cent perished while this mortality in Manchester and Liverpool does not ordinarily exceed eight per cent. The illness reached a crisis on the seventh and fifteenth days. On the latter, the patient usually became yellow, which our authority regards as an indication that the cause of the malady was to be sought in mental excitement and anxiety. In Ireland, too, these fever epidemics have become domesticated. During twenty-one months of the years 1817 to 1818, 39,000 fever patients passed through the Dublin hospital, and in a more recent year, according to Sheriff Allison, 60,000. In Cork, the fever hospital received one-seventh of the population in 1817-1818, in Limerick in the same time one-fourth, and in the bad quarter of Waterford, 19 twentieths of the whole population were ill of the fever at one time. When one remembers under what conditions the working people live, when one thinks how crowded their dwellings are, how every nook and corner swarms with human beings, how sick and well sleep in the same room, in the same bed, the only wonder is that a contagious disease like this fever does not spread yet farther. And when one reflects how little medical assistance the sick have at command, how many are without any medical advice whatsoever, and ignorant of the most ordinary precautionary measures, the mortality seems actually small. Dr. Allison, who has made a careful study of this disease, attributes it directly to the want and the wretched condition of the poor, as in the report already quoted. He asserts that privations and the insufficient satisfaction of vital needs are what prepare the frame for contagion and make the epidemic widespread and terrible. He proves that a period of privation, a commercial crisis or a bad harvest, has each time produced the typhus epidemic in Ireland as in Scotland and that the fury of the plague has fallen almost exclusively on the working class. It is a noteworthy fact that, according to his testimony, the majority of persons who perish by typhus are fathers of families, precisely the persons who can least be spared by those dependent upon them, and several Irish physicians whom he quotes bear the same testimony. Another category of disease arises directly from the food rather than the dwellings of the workers. The food of the labourer, indigestible enough in itself, is utterly unfit for young children, and he has neither means nor time to get his children more suitable food. Moreover, the custom of giving children spirits, and even opium, is very general, and these two influences, with the rest of the conditions of life prejudicial to bodily development, give rise to the most diverse affections of the digestive organs, leaving lifelong traces behind them. Nearly all workers have stomachs more or less weak, and are yet forced to adhere to the diet which is the root of the evil. How should they know what is to blame for it? And if they knew, how could they obtain a more suitable regimen so long as they cannot adopt a different way of living and are not better educated? But new disease arises during childhood from impaired digestion. Scrofula is almost universal among the working class and scrofulous parents have scrofulous children, especially when the original influences continue in full force to operate upon the inherited tendency of the children. A second consequence of this insufficient bodily nourishment during the years of growth and development is rachitis, which is extremely common among the children of the working class. The hardening of the bones is delayed, the development of the skeleton in general is restricted, and deformities of the legs and spinal column are frequent, in addition to the usual rachitic affections. 
how greatly all these evils are increased by the changes to which the workers are subject in consequence of fluctuations in trade want of work and the scanty wages in time of crisis it is not necessary to dwell upon temporary want of sufficient food to which almost every working man is exposed at least once in the course of his life only contributes to intensify the effects of his usual sufficient but bad diet children who are half starved just when they most need ample and nutritious food and how many such there are during every crisis and even when trade is at its best must inevitably become weak scrofulous and rachitic in a high degree and that they do become so their appearance amply shows the neglect to which the great mass of working men's children are condemned leaves ineradicable traces and brings the enfeeblement of the whole race of workers with it add to this the unsuitable clothing of this class the impossibility of precautions against colds the necessity of toiling so long as health permits want made more dire when sickness appears and the only too common lack of all medical assistance and we have a rough idea of the sanitary condition of the english working class the injurious effects peculiar to single employments as now conducted i shall not deal with here besides these there are other influences which enfeeble the health of a great number of workers intemperance most of all all possible temptations all allurements combine to bring the workers to drunkenness liquor is almost their only source of pleasure and all things conspire to make it accessible to them the working-man comes from his work tired exhausted finds his home comfortless damp dirty repulsive he has urgent need of recreation he must have something to make work worth his trouble to make the prospect of the next day endurable his unnerved uncomfortable hypochondriac state of mind and body arising from his unhealthy condition and especially from indigestion is aggravated beyond endurance by the general conditions of his life the uncertainty of his existence his dependence upon all possible accidents and chances and his inability to do anything towards gaining an assured position his enfeebled frame weakened by bad air and bad food violently demands some external stimulus his social need can be gratified only in the public-house he has absolutely no other place where he can meet his friends how can he be expected to resist the temptation it is morally and physically inevitable that under such circumstances a very large number of working-men should fall into intemperance and apart from the chiefly physical influences which drive the working-man into drunkenness there is the example of the great mass the neglected education the impossibility of protecting the young from temptation in many cases the direct influence of intemperate parents who give their own children liquor the certainty of forgetting for an hour or two the wretchedness and burden of life and a hundred other circumstances so mighty that the workers can in truth hardly be blamed for yielding to such overwhelming pressure drunkenness has here ceased to be a vice for which the vicious can be held responsible it becomes a phenomenon the necessary inevitable effect of certain conditions upon an object possessed of no volition in relation to those conditions they who have degraded the working man to a mere object have the responsibility to bear but as inevitably as a great number of working men fall a prey to drink just so inevitably does it manifest its ruinous influence upon the body and mind of its victims all the tendencies to disease arising from the conditions of life of the workers are promoted by it it stimulates in the highest degree the development of lung and digestive troubles the rise and spread of typhus epidemics another source of physical mischief to the working class lies in the impossibility of employing skilled physicians in cases of illness it is true that a number of charitable institutions strive to supply this want that the infirmary in manchester for instance receives or gives advice and medicine to two thousand two hundred patients annually but what is that in a city in which according to gaskell's calculation three-fourths of the population need medical aid every year english doctors charge high fees and working men are not in a position to pay them they can therefore do nothing or are compelled to call in cheap charlatans and use quack remedies which do more harm than good an immense number of such quacks thrive in every english town securing their clientele among the poor by means of advertisements posters and other such devices besides these vast quantities of patent medicines are sold for all conceivable ailments 
Morrison's pills, Parr's life pills, Dr. Mainwaring's pills, and a thousand other pills, essences, and balsams, all of which have the property of curing all the ills that flesh is heir to. These medicines rarely contain actually injurious substances, but when taken freely and often, they affect the system prejudicially, and as the unwary purchasers are always recommended to take as much as possible, it is not to be wondered at that they swallow them wholesale, whether wanted or not. It is by no means unusual for the manufacturer of Parr's life pills to sell twenty to twenty-five thousand boxes of these salutary pills in a week, and they are taken for constipation by this one, for diarrhoea by that one, for fever, weakness, and all possible ailments. As our German peasants are cupped or bled at certain seasons, so do the English working people now consume patent medicines, to their own injury and the great profit of the manufacturer. One of the most injurious of these patent medicines is a drink prepared with opiates, chiefly laudanum, under the name Godfrey's Cordial. Women who work at home and have their own and other people's children to take care of give them this drink to keep them quiet, and as many believe, to strengthen them. They often begin to give this medicine to newly born children, and continue, without knowing the effects of this heart's ease, until the children die. The less susceptible the child's system to the action of the opium, the greater the quantities administered. When the cordial ceases to act, laudanum alone is given, often to the extent of fifteen to twenty drops at a dose. The coroner of Nottingham testified before a parliamentary commission that one apothecary had, according to his own statement, used thirteen hundred weight of laudanum in one year in the preparation of Godfrey's cordial. The effects upon the children so treated may be readily imagined. They are pale, feeble, wilted, and usually die before completing the second year. The use of this cordial is very extensive in all great towns and industrial districts in the kingdom. The result of all these influences is a general enfeeblement of the frame in the working class. There are few vigorous, well-built, healthy persons among the workers, that is, among the factory operatives, who are employed in confined rooms, and we are here discussing these only. They are almost all weakly, of angular but not powerful build, lean, pale, and of relaxed fibre, with the exception of the muscles especially exercised in their work. Nearly all suffer from indigestion, and consequently from a more or less hypochondriac, melancholy, irritable, nervous condition. Their enfeebled constitutions are unable to resist disease, and are therefore seized by it on every occasion. Hence they age prematurely, and die early. On this point the mortality statistics supply unquestionable testimony. According to the report of Registrar-General Graham, the annual death rate of all England and Wales is something less than two and a quarter percent. That is to say, out of forty-five persons, one dies every year. This was the average for the year 1839-1840. In 1840-1841, the mortality diminished somewhat, and the death rate was but one in forty-six. But in the great cities the proportion is wholly different. I have before me official tables of mortality, Manchester Guardian, July 31, 1844, according to which the death rate of several large towns is as follows. In Manchester, including Charlton and Salford, one in 32.72, and excluding Charlton and Salford, one in 30.75. In Liverpool, including West Derby, which is a suburb, 31.9 and excluding West Derby, 29.9, while the average of all the districts of Cheshire, Lancashire, and Yorkshire cited, including a number of wholly or partially rural districts and many small towns, with a total population of 2,172,506 for the whole, is one death in 39.8 persons. How unfavorably the workers are placed in the great cities, the mortality for Prescott and Lancashire shows a district inhabited by miners, and showing a lower sanitary condition than that of the agricultural districts, mining being by no means a healthful occupation. But these miners live in the country, and the death rate among them is but one in 47.54, or nearly two and a half percent better than that for all England. All these statements are based upon the mortality tables for 1843. Still higher is the death rate in the Scotch cities, in Edinburgh, in 1838-1839, one in twenty-nine. In 1831, in the old town alone, one in twenty-two. 
in glasgow according to dr cohen the average has been since eighteen thirty one in thirty and in single years one in twenty two to twenty four that this enormous shortening of life falls chiefly upon the working class that the general average is improved by the smaller mortality of the upper and middle classes is attested upon all sides one of the most recent depositions is that of a physician dr p h holland in manchester who investigated charlton on medlock a suburb of manchester under official commission he divided the houses and streets into three classes each and ascertained the following variations in the death rate in the first class of streets houses first class mortality one in fifty one first class of streets houses second class mortality one in forty five houses third class mortality one in thirty six in the second class of streets houses of the first class mortality one in fifty five houses second class mortality one in thirty eight houses third class mortality one in thirty five third class of streets houses first class wanting houses second class mortality one in thirty five houses third class mortality one in twenty five it is clear from other tables given by holland that the mortality in the streets of the second class is eighteen per cent greater and in the streets of the third class sixty eight per cent greater than in those of the first class that the mortality in the houses of the second class is thirty one per cent greater and in the third class seventy eight per cent greater than in those of the first class that the mortality in those bad streets which were improved decreased twenty five per cent he closes with the remark very frank for an english bourgeois quote, when we find the rate of mortality four times as high in some streets as in others and twice as high in whole classes of streets as in other classes and further find that it is all but invariably high in those streets which are in bad condition and almost invariably low in those whose condition is good we cannot resist the conclusion that multitudes of our fellow-creatures hundreds of our immediate neighbours are annually destroyed for want of the most evident precautions the report of the sanitary condition of the working class contains information which attests the same fact in liverpool in eighteen forty the average longevity of the upper classes gentry professional men etc was thirty-five years that of the business men and better placed handicraftsmen twenty-two years and that of the operatives day labourers and serviceable class in general but fifteen years the parliamentary reports contain a mass of similar facts the death rate is kept so high chiefly by the heavy mortality among young children in the working class the tender frame of a child is least able to withstand the unfavourable influences of an inferior lot in life the neglect to which they are often subjected when both parents work or one is dead avenges itself promptly and no one need wonder that in manchester according to the report last quoted more than fifty seven per cent of the children of the working class perish before the fifth year while but twenty per cent of the children of the higher classes and not quite thirty two per cent of the children of all classes in the country die under five years of age the article of the artisan already several times referred to furnishes exacter information on this point by comparing the city death rate in single diseases of children with the country death rate thus demonstrating that in general epidemics in manchester and liverpool are three times more fatal than in country districts that affections of the nervous system are quintupled and stomach troubles trebled while deaths from affections of the lungs in cities are to those in the country as two and a half to one fatal cases of smallpox measles scarlet fever and whooping cough among small children are four times more frequent those of water on the brain are trebled and convulsions ten times more frequent to quote another acknowledged authority i append the following table out of ten thousand persons there die in rutlandshire a healthy agricultural district under five years two thousand eight hundred and sixty five between five and nineteen years eight hundred and ninety one between twenty and thirty nine years one thousand two hundred and seventy five between forty and fifty nine one thousand two hundred and ninety nine between sixty and sixty nine one thousand one hundred and eighty nine between seventy and seventy nine one thousand four hundred and twenty eight between eighty and eighty nine nine hundred and thirty eight 
between ninety and ninety-nine, one hundred and twelve. One hundred years and over, three persons. Out of ten thousand persons there die in Essex, marshy agricultural district, under five years, three thousand one hundred and fifty-nine, between five and nineteen years, one thousand one hundred and ten, between twenty and thirty-nine, one thousand five hundred and twenty-six, between forty and fifty-nine, one thousand four hundred and thirteen, between sixty and sixty-nine, nine hundred sixty-three, between seventy and seventy-nine, one thousand nineteen, between eighty and eighty-nine, six hundred thirty, between ninety and ninety-nine, one hundred seventy-seven, one hundred years and older, three. Out of ten thousand persons there die in the town of Carlisle, between 1779 and 1787, before the introduction of mills, under five years, 4,408, between five and nineteen, 921, between twenty and thirty-nine, 1,006, between forty and fifty-nine, 1,201, between sixty and sixty-nine, 940, between seventy and seventy-nine, 826, between eighty and eighty-nine, six hundred and thirty-three, between ninety and ninety-nine, one hundred and fifty-three, one hundred years and older, twenty-two. Out of ten thousand persons there die in the town of Carlisle after the introduction of mills, under five years of age, four thousand seven hundred and thirty-eight, between five and nineteen, nine hundred thirty, between twenty and thirty-nine, one thousand two hundred and one, between forty and fifty-nine, one thousand one hundred and thirty-four, between sixty and sixty-nine, six hundred seventy-seven, between seventy and seventy-nine, seven hundred twenty-seven, between eighty and eighty-nine, four hundred and fifty-two, between ninety and ninety-nine, eighty, one hundred years and older, one. Out of ten thousand persons there die in Preston, a factory town, under five years, four thousand nine hundred forty-seven, between five and nineteen years, one thousand one hundred thirty-six, between twenty and thirty-nine, one thousand three hundred seventy-nine, between forty and fifty-nine, one thousand one hundred and fourteen, between sixty and sixty-nine, five hundred fifty-three, between seventy and seventy-nine, five hundred thirty-two, between eighty and eighty-nine, two hundred ninety-eight, between ninety and ninety-nine, thirty-eight, one hundred years and older, three. And lastly, out of ten thousand persons there die in Leeds, a factory town, under five years, five thousand two hundred eighty-six, between five and nineteen, nine hundred twenty-seven, between twenty and thirty-nine, one thousand two hundred twenty-eight, between forty and fifty-nine, one thousand one hundred ninety-eight, between sixty and sixty-nine, five hundred ninety-three, between seventy and seventy-nine, five hundred twelve, between eighty and eighty-nine, two hundred and twenty-five, between ninety and ninety-nine, twenty-nine, one hundred years of age and older, two. Apart from the diverse diseases which are the necessary consequence of the present neglect and oppression of the poorer classes, there are other influences which contribute to increase the mortality among small children. In many families the wife, like the husband, has to work away from home, and the consequence is the total neglect of the children, who are either locked up or given out to be taken care of. It is therefore not to be wondered at if hundreds of them perish through all manner of accidents. Nowhere are so many children run over, nowhere are so many killed by falling, drowning, or burning, as in the great cities and towns of England. Deaths from burns and scalds are especially frequent, such a case occurring nearly every week during the winter months in Manchester, and very frequently in London, though little mention is made of them in the papers. I have at hand a copy of the weekly dispatch of December 15, 1844, according to which, in the week from December 1st to December 7th inclusive, six such cases occurred. These unhappy children, perishing in this terrible way, are victims of our social disorder, and of the property-holding classes interested in maintaining and prolonging this disorder. Yet one is left in doubt whether even this terrible torturing death is not a blessing for the children in rescuing them from a long life of toil and wretchedness, rich in suffering and poor in enjoyment. So far has it gone in England, 
and the bourgeoisie reads these things every day in the newspapers and takes no further trouble in the matter but it cannot complain if after the official and non-official testimony here cited which must be known to it i broadly accuse it of social murder let the ruling class see to it that these frightful conditions are ameliorated or let it surrender the administration of the common interests to the labouring class to the latter course it is by no means inclined for the former task so long as it remains the bourgeoisie crippled by bourgeois prejudice it has not the needed power for if at last after hundreds of thousands of victims have perished it manifests some little anxiety for the future passing a metropolitan buildings act under which the most unscrupulous overcrowding of dwellings is to be at least in some slight degree restricted if it points with pride to measures which far from attacking the root of the evil do not by any means meet the demands of the commonest sanitary policy it cannot thus vindicate itself from the accusation the english bourgeoisie has but one choice either to continue its rule under the unanswerable charge of murder and in spite of this charge or to abdicate in favour of the labouring class hitherto it has chosen the former course let us turn from the physical to the mental state of the workers since the bourgeoisie vouchsafes them only so much of life as is absolutely necessary we need not wonder that it bestows upon them only so much education as lies in the interest of the bourgeoisie and that in truth is not much the means of education in england are restricted out of all proportion to the population the few day schools at the command of the working class are available only for the smallest minority and are bad besides the teachers worn-out workers and other unsuitable persons who only turn to teaching in order to live are usually without the indispensable elementary knowledge without the moral discipline so needful for the teacher and relieved of all public supervision here too free competition rules and as usual the rich profit by it and the poor for whom competition is not free who have not the knowledge needed to enable them to form a correct judgment have the evil consequences to bear compulsory school attendance does not exist in the mills it is as we shall see purely nominal and when in the session of eighteen forty three the ministry was disposed to make this nominal compulsion effective the manufacturing bourgeoisie opposed the measure with all its might though the working class was outspokenly in favour of compulsory school attendance moreover a mass of children work the whole week through in the mills or at home and therefore cannot attend school the evening schools supposed to be attended by children who are employed during the day are almost abandoned or attended without benefit it is asking too much that young workers who have been using themselves up twelve hours in the day should go to school from eight to ten at night and those who try it usually fall asleep as is testified by hundreds of witnesses in the children's employment commission's report sunday schools have been founded it is true but they too are most scantily supplied with teachers and can be of use to those only who have already learnt something in the day schools the interval from one sunday to the next is too long for an ignorant child to remember in the second sitting what it learned in the first a week before the children's employment commission's report furnishes a hundred proofs and the commission itself most emphatically expresses the opinion that neither the week-day nor the sunday schools in the least degree meet the needs of the nation this report gives evidence of ignorance in the working class of england such as could hardly be expected in spain or italy it cannot be otherwise the bourgeoisie has little to hope and much to fear from the education of the working class the ministry in its whole enormous budget of fifty five million pounds has only the single trifling item of forty thousand pounds for public education and but for the fanaticism of the religious sects which does at least as much harm as good the means of education would be yet more scanty as it is the state church manages its national schools and the various sects their sectarian schools for the sole purpose of keeping the children of the brethren of the faith within the congregation and of winning away a poor childish soul here and there from some other sect the consequence is that religion and precisely the most unprofitable side of religion polemical discussion is made the principal subject of instruction and the memory of the children overburdened with incomprehensible dogmas and theological distinctions that sectarian hatred and bigotry are awakened as early as possible and all rational mental and moral training shamefully neglected 
the working class has repeatedly demanded of parliament a system of strictly secular public education leaving religion to the ministers of the sects but thus far no ministry has been induced to grant it the minister is the obedient servant of the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie is divided into countless sects but each would gladly grant the workers the otherwise dangerous education on the sole condition of their accepting as an antidote the dogmas peculiar to the especial sect in question and as these sects are still quarrelling among themselves for supremacy the workers remain for the present without education it is true that the manufacturers boast of having enabled the majority to read but the quality of the reading is appropriate to the source of the instruction as the children's employment commission proves according to this report he who knows his letters can read enough to satisfy the conscience of the manufacturers and when one reflects upon the confused orthography of the english language which makes reading one of the arts learned only under long instruction this ignorance is readily understood very few working people write readily and writing orthographically is beyond the powers even of many educated persons the sunday schools of the state church of the quakers and i think of several other sects do not teach writing quote, because it is too worldly an employment for sunday end quote. the quality of the instruction offered the workers in other directions may be judged from a specimen or two taken from the children's employment commission's report which unfortunately does not embrace millwork proper quote, in birmingham says commissioner granger the children examined by me are as a whole utterly wanting in all that could be in the remotest degree called a useful education although in almost all the schools religious instruction alone is furnished the profoundest ignorance even upon that subject prevailed quote, in wolverhampton says commissioner horn i found among others the following example a girl of eleven years had attended both day and sunday school had never heard of another world of heaven or another life a boy seventeen years old did not know that twice two are four nor how many farthings in two pence even when the money was placed in his hand several boys had never heard of london nor of willenhall though the latter was but an hour's walk from their homes and in the closest relations with wolverhampton several had never heard the name of the queen nor other names such as nelson wellington bonaparte but it was noteworthy that those who had never heard even of st paul moses or solomon were very well instructed as to the life deeds and character of dick turpin and especially of jack shepherd a youth of sixteen did not know how many twice two are nor how much four farthings make a youth of seventeen asserted that four farthings are four halfpence a third seventeen years old answered several very simple questions with the brief statement that he quote, was nay a judge of nothing end quote. these children who are crammed with religious doctrines four or five years at a stretch know as little at the end as at the beginning one child quote, went to sunday school regularly for five years does not know who jesus christ is but had heard the name had never heard of the twelve apostles samson moses aaron etc another quote, attended sunday school regularly six years knows who jesus christ was he died on the cross to save our saviour had never heard of st peter or st paul end quote. a third quote, attended different sunday schools seven years can read only the thin easy books with simple words of one syllable has heard of the apostles but does not know whether st peter was one or st john the latter must have been st john wesley end quote to the question who christ was horne received the following answers among others quote, he was adam he was an apostle he was the saviour's lord's son end quote. and from a youth of sixteen quote, he was a king of london long ago end quote. in sheffield commissioner simmons let the children from the sunday school read aloud they could not tell what they had read nor what sort of people the apostles were of whom they had just been reading after he had asked them all one after the other about the apostles without securing a single correct answer one sly-looking little fellow with great glee called out quote, i know mister they were the lepers end quote. from the pottery districts and from lancashire the reports are similar this is what the bourgeoisie and the state are doing for the education and improvement of the working class fortunately the conditions under which this class lives 
are such as give it a sort of practical training, which not only replaces school cramming, but renders harmless the confused religious notions connected with it, and even places the workers in the vanguard of the national movement of England. Necessity is the mother of invention, and what is still more important, of thought and action. The English workingman who can scarcely read, and still less write, nevertheless knows very well where his own interest and that of the nation lies. He knows, too, what the especial interest of the bourgeoisie is, and what he has to expect of that bourgeoisie. If he cannot write, he can speak, and speak in public. If he has no arithmetic, he can, nevertheless, reckon with the political economists enough to see through a corn-law repealing bourgeois, and to get the better of him in argument. If celestial matters remain very mixed for him, in spite of all the effort of the preachers, he sees all the more clearly into terrestrial, political, and social questions. We shall have occasion to refer again to this point, and pass now to the moral characteristics of our workers. End of chapter 5, part 1《Chapter V of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter V. Results. Part Two. It is sufficiently clear that the instruction in morals can have no better effect than the religious teaching with which in all English schools it is mixed up. The simple principles which, for plain human beings, regulate the relations of man to man, brought into the direst confusion by our social state, our war of each against all, necessarily remain confused and foreign to the working man when mixed with incomprehensible dogmas and preached in the religious form of an arbitrary and dogmatic commandment. The schools contribute, according to the confession of all authorities, and especially of the Children's Employment Commission, almost nothing to the morality of the working class. So short-sighted, so stupidly narrow-minded is the English bourgeoisie in its egotism, that it does not even take the trouble to impress upon the workers the morality of the day, which the bourgeoisie has patched together in its own interest for its own protection. Even this precautionary measure is too great an effort for the enfeebled and sluggish bourgeoisie a time must come when it will repent its neglect, too late. But it has no right to complain that the workers know nothing of its system of morals and do not act in accordance with it. Thus are the workers cast out and ignored by the class in power, morally as well as physically and mentally. The only provision made for them is the law, which fastens upon them when they become obnoxious to the bourgeoisie. Like the dullest of the brutes, they are treated to but one form of education, the whip, in the shape of force, not convincing, but intimidating. There is, therefore, no cause for surprise if the workers, treated as brutes, actually become such, or if they can maintain their consciousness of manhood only by cherishing the most glowing hatred, the most unbroken inward rebellion against the bourgeoisie in power. They are men so long only as they burn with wrath against the reigning class. They become brutes the moment they bend in patience under the yoke, and merely strive to make life endurable while abandoning the effort to break the yoke. This, then, is all that the bourgeoisie has done for the education of the proletariat, and when we take into consideration all the circumstances in which this class lives, we shall not think the worse of it for the resentment which it cherishes against the ruling class. The moral training which is not given to the worker in school is not supplied by the other conditions of his life, that moral training at least which alone has worth in the eyes of the bourgeoisie. His whole position and environment involves the strongest temptation to immorality. He is poor, life offers him no charm, almost every enjoyment is denied him, the penalties of the law have no further terrors for him. Why should he restrain his desires? Why leave to the rich the enjoyment of his birthright? Why not seize a part of it for himself? What inducement has the proletarian not to steal? 
it is all very pretty and very agreeable to the ear of the bourgeois to hear the sacredness of property asserted but for him who has none the sacredness of property dies out of itself money is the god of this world the bourgeois takes the proletarian's money from him and so makes a practical atheist of him no wonder then if the proletarian retains his atheism and no longer respects the sacredness and power of the earthly god if the proletarian retains his atheism and no longer respects the sacredness and power of the earthly god and when the poverty of the proletarian is intensified to the point of actual lack of the barest necessaries of life to want and hunger the temptation to disregard all social order does but gain power this the bourgeoisie for the most part recognizes simmons observes that poverty exercises the same ruinous influence upon the mind which drunkenness exercises upon the body and dr allison explains to property-holding readers with the greatest exactness what the consequences of social oppression must be for the working class want leaves the working man the choice between starving slowly killing himself speedily or taking what he needs where he finds it in plain english stealing and there is no cause for surprise that most of them prefer stealing to starvation and suicide true there are within the working class numbers too moral to steal even when reduced to the utmost extremity and these starve or commit suicide for suicide formerly the enviable privilege of the upper classes has become fashionable among the english workers and numbers of the poor kill themselves to avoid the misery from which they see no other means of escape but far more demoralizing than his poverty in its influence upon the english workingman is the insecurity of his position the necessity of living upon wages from hand to mouth that in short which makes a proletarian of him the smaller peasants in germany are usually poor and often suffer want but they are less at the mercy of accident they have at least something secure the proletarian who has nothing but his two hands who consumes to-day what he earned yesterday who is subject to every possible chance and has not the slightest guarantee for being able to earn the barest necessities of life whom every crisis every whim of his employer may deprive of bread this proletarian is placed in the most revolting inhuman position conceivable for a human being the slave is assured of a bare livelihood by the self-interest of his master the serf has at least a scrap of land on which to live each has at worst a guarantee for life itself but the proletarian must depend upon himself alone and is yet prevented from so applying his abilities as to be able to rely upon them everything that the proletarian can do to improve his situation is but a drop in the ocean compared with the floods of varying chances to which he is exposed over which he has not the slightest control he is the passive subject of all possible combinations of circumstances and must count himself fortunate when he has saved his life even for a short time and his character and way of living are naturally shaped by these conditions either he seeks to keep his head above water in this whirlpool to rescue his manhood and this he can do solely in rebellion against the class which plunders him so mercilessly and then abandons him to his fate which strives to hold him in this position so demoralizing to a human being or he gives up the struggle against his fate as hopeless and strives to profit so far as he can by the most favorable moment to save is unavailing for at the utmost he cannot save more than suffices to sustain life for a short time while if he falls out of work it is for no brief period to accumulate lasting property for himself is impossible and if it were not he would only cease to be a working man and another would take his place what better thing can he do then when he gets high wages than live well upon them the english bourgeoisie is violently scandalized at the extravagant living of the workers when wages are high yet it is not only very natural but very sensible of them to enjoy life when they can instead of laying up treasures which are of no lasting use to them and which in the end moth and rust that is the bourgeoisie get possession of yet such a life is demoralizing beyond all others what carlyle says of the cotton spinners is true of all english industrial workers quote, their trade now in plethoric prosperity 
anon extenuated into inanition and short time, is of the nature of gambling. They live by it like gamblers, now in luxurious superfluity, now in starvation. Black, mutinous discontent devours them, simply the miserablest feeling that can inhabit the heart of man. English commerce, with its world-wide convulsive fluctuations, with its immeasurable proteasteem demon, makes all paths uncertain for them, all life a bewilderment. Society, steadfastness, peaceable continuance, the first blessings of man, are not theirs. This world is for them no home, but a dingy prison-house, of reckless unthrift, rebellion, rancor, indignation against themselves and against all men. Is it a green, flowerly world, with azure everlasting sky stretched over it, the work and government of a god, or a murky, simmering toffet of copperous fumes, cotton fuzz, gin riot, wrath and toil, created by a demon, governed by a demon? End quote. And elsewhere, quote, injustice, infidelity to truth and fact and nature's order, being properly the one evil under the sun, and the feeling of injustice, the one intolerable pain under the sun, our grand question as to the condition of these working men would be, is it just? And first of all, what belief have they themselves formed about the justice of it? The words they promulgate are notable by way of answer. Their actions are still more notable. Revolt, sullen, revengeful humour of revolt against the upper classes, decreasing respect for what their temporal superiors command, decreasing faith for what their spiritual superiors teach, is more and more the universal spirit of the lower classes. Such spirit may be blamed, may be vindicated, but all men must recognize it as extant there. All may know that it is mournful, that unless altered it will be fatal." Carlyle is perfectly right as to the facts, and wrong only in censuring the wild rage of the workers against the higher classes. This rage, this passion, is rather the proof that the workers feel the inhumanity of their position, that they refuse to be degraded to the level of brutes, and that they will one day free themselves from servitude to the bourgeoisie. This may be seen in the case of those who do not share this wrath. They either bow humbly before the fate that overtakes them, live a respectful private life as well as they can, do not concern themselves as to the course of public affairs, help the bourgeoisie to forge the chains of the workers yet more securely, and stand upon the plane of intellectual nullity that prevailed before the industrial period began, or they are tossed about by fate, lose their moral hold upon themselves as they have already lost their economic hold, live along from day to day, drink and fall into licentiousness, and in both cases they are brutes. The last-named class contributes chiefly to the rapid increase of vice at which the bourgeoisie is so horrified after itself setting in motion the causes which give rise to it. Another source of demoralization among the workers is their being condemned to work. As voluntary, productive activity is the highest enjoyment known to us, so is compulsory toil the most cruel, degrading punishment. Nothing is more terrible than being constrained to do some one thing every day from morning until night against one's will. And the more a man the worker feels himself, the more hateful must his work be to him, because he feels the constraint, the aimlessness of it for himself. Why does he work? For love of work? From a natural impulse? Not at all. He works for money, for a thing which has nothing whatsoever to do with the work itself and he works so long, moreover, and in such unbroken monotony, that this alone must make his work a torture in the first weeks, if he has the least human feeling left. The division of labor has multiplied the brutalizing influences of forced work. In most branches, the worker's activity is reduced to some paltry, purely mechanical manipulation, repeated minute after minute, unchanged year after year. How much human feeling, what abilities can a man retain in his thirtieth year, who has made needle-points or filed toothed wheels twelve hours every day from his early childhood, living all the time under the conditions forced upon the English proletarian? It is still the same thing since the introduction of steam. The worker's activity is made easy, 
muscular effort is saved, but the work itself becomes unmeaning and monotonous to the last degree. It offers no field for mental activity, and claims just enough of his attention to keep him from thinking of anything else. And a sentence to such work, to work which takes his whole time for itself, leaving him scarcely time to eat and sleep, none for physical exercise in the open air or the enjoyment of nature, much less for mental activity, how can such a sentence help degrading a human being to the level of a brute? Once more the worker must choose, must either surrender himself to his fate, become a good workman, heed faithfully the interest of the bourgeoisie, in which case he most certainly becomes a brute, or else he must rebel, fight for his manhood to the last, and this he can only do in the fight against the bourgeoisie. And when all these conditions have engendered vast demoralization among the workers, a new influence is added to the old, to spread this degradation more widely and carry it to the extremest point. This influence is the centralization of the population. The writers of the English bourgeoisie are crying murder at the demoralizing tendency of the great cities, like perverted Jeremiah's, they sing dirges, not over the destruction, but the growth of the cities. Sheriff Allison attributes almost everything, and Dr. Vaughan, author of The Age of Great Cities, still more to this influence. And this is natural, for the propertied class has too direct an interest in the other conditions, which tend to destroy the worker, body and soul. If they should admit that, quote, poverty, insecurity, overwork, forced work, are the chief ruinous influences, end quote, they would have to draw the conclusion, quote, then let us give the poor property, guarantee their subsistence, make laws against overwork, end quote, and this the bourgeoisie dare not formulate. But the great cities have grown up so spontaneously, the population has moved into them so wholly of its own motion, and the inference that manufacture and the middle class which profits from it alone have created the cities is so remote, that it is extremely convenient for the ruling class to ascribe all the evil to this apparently unavoidable source. Whereas the great cities really only secure a more rapid and certain development for evils already existing in the germ. Allison is humane enough to admit this. He is no thoroughbred liberal manufacturer, but only a half-developed Tory bourgeois, and he has, therefore, an open eye now and then, where the full-fledged bourgeois is still stone-blind. Let us hear him. Quote, it is in the great cities that vice has spread her temptations, and pleasure her seductions, and folly her allurements, that guilt is encouraged by the hope of impunity, and idleness fostered by the frequency of example. It is to these great marts of human corruption that the base and the profligate resort from the simplicity of country life. It is here that they find victims whereon to practice their iniquity, and gains to reward the dangers that attend them. Virtue is here depressed from the obscurity in which it is involved. Guilt is matured from the difficulty of its detection. Licentiousness is rewarded by the immediate enjoyment which it promises. If any person will walk through St. Giles's, the crowded alleys of Dublin, or the poorer quarters of Glasgow by night, he will meet with ample proof of these observations. He will no longer wonder at the disorderly habits and profligate enjoyments of the lower orders. His astonishment will be not that there is so much, but that there is so little crime in the world. The great cause of human corruption in these crowded situations is the contagious nature of bad example and the extreme difficulty of avoiding the seductions of vice when they are brought into close and daily proximity with the younger part of the people. Whatever we may think of the strength of virtue, experience proves that the higher orders are indebted for their exemption from atrocious crime or disorderly habits chiefly to their fortunate removal from the scene of temptation and that where they are exposed to the seductions which assail their inferiors, they are no ways behind them in yielding to their influence. It is the peculiar misfortune of the poor in great cities that they cannot fly from these irresistible temptations, but that turn where they will, they are met by the alluring forms of vice, or the seductions of guilty enjoyment. It is the experienced impossibility of concealing the attractions of vice from the younger part of the poor in great cities, which exposes them to so many causes of demoralization. 
all this proceeds not from any unwanted or extraordinary depravity in the character of these victims of licentiousness but from the almost irresistible nature of the temptations to which the poor are exposed the rich who censure their conduct would in all probability yield as rapidly as they have done to the influence of similar causes there is a certain degree of misery a certain proximity to sin which virtue is rarely able to withstand and which the young in particular are generally unable to resist the progress of vice in such circumstances is almost as certain and often nearly as rapid as that of physical contagion End quote. and elsewhere quote, when the higher orders for their own profit have drawn the labouring classes in great numbers into a small space the contagion of guilt becomes rapid and unavoidable the lower orders situated as they are in so far as regards moral and religious instruction are frequently hardly more to be blamed for yielding to the temptations which surround them than for falling victims to the typhus fever enough the half-bourgeois allison betrays to us however narrow his manner of expressing himself the evil effect of the great cities upon the moral development of the workers another a bourgeois pur saint a man after the heart of the anti-corn law league dr andrew Ur, betrays the other side he tells us that life in great cities facilitates cabals among the workers and confers power on the plebs if here the workers are not educated that is to obedience to the bourgeoisie they may view matters one-sidedly from the standpoint of a sinister selfishness and may readily permit themselves to be hoodwinked by sly demagogues nay they might even be capable of viewing their greatest benefactors the frugal and enterprising capitalists with a jealous and hostile eye here proper training alone can avail or national bankruptcy and other horrors must follow since a revolution of the workers could hardly fail to occur and our bourgeois is perfectly justified in his fears if the centralization of population stimulates and develops the property-holding class it forces the development of the workers yet more rapidly the workers begin to feel as a class as a whole they begin to perceive that though feeble as individuals they form a power united their separation from the bourgeoisie the development of views peculiar to the workers and corresponding to their position in life is fostered the consciousness of oppression awakes and the workers attain social and political importance the great cities are the birthplaces of labor movements in them the workers first began to reflect upon their own condition and to struggle against it in them the opposition between proletariat and bourgeoisie first made itself manifest from them proceeded the trades unions chartism and socialism the great cities have transformed the disease of the social body which appears in chronic form in the country into an acute one and so made manifest its real nature and the means of curing it without the great cities and their forcing influence upon the popular intelligence the working class would be far less advanced than it is moreover they have destroyed the last remnant of the patriarchal relation between working men and employers a result to which manufacture on a large scale has contributed by multiplying the employees dependent upon a single employer the bourgeoisie deplores all this it is true and has good reason to do so for under the old conditions the bourgeois was comparatively secure against a revolt on the part of his hands he could tyrannize over them and plunder them to his heart's content and yet receive obedience gratitude and assent from these stupid people by bestowing a trifle of patronizing friendliness which cost him nothing and perhaps some paltry present all apparently out of pure self-sacrificing uncalled-for goodness of heart but really not one-tenth part of his duty as an individual bourgeois placed under conditions which he had not himself created he might do his duty at least in part but as a member of the ruling class which by the mere fact of its ruling is responsible for the condition of the whole nation he did nothing of what his position involved on the contrary he plundered the whole nation for his own individual advantage in the patriarchal relation that hypocritically concealed the slavery of the worker the latter must have remained an intellectual zero totally ignorant of his own interest a mere private individual only when estranged from his employer 
when convinced that the sole bond between employer and employee is the bond of pecuniary profit, when the sentimental bond between them, which stood not the slightest test, had wholly fallen away, then only did the worker begin to recognize his own interests and develop independently. Then only did he cease to be the slave of the bourgeoisie in his thoughts, feelings, and the expression of his will. And to this end, manufacture on a grand scale and in great cities has most largely contributed. Another influence of great moment in forming the character of the English workers is the Irish immigration already referred to. On the one hand, it has, as we have seen, degraded the English workers, removed them from civilization, and aggravated the hardship of their lot. But on the other hand, it has thereby deepened the chasm between workers and bourgeoisie, and hastened the approaching crisis. For the course of the social disease from which England is suffering is the same as the course of a physical disease. It develops, according to certain laws, has its own crisis, the last and most violent of which determines the fate of the patient. And as the English nation cannot succumb under the final crises, but must go forth from it, born again, rejuvenated, we can but rejoice over everything which accelerates the course of the disease. And to this the Irish immigration further contributes by reason of the passionate, mercurial Irish temperament, which it imports into England and into the English working class. The Irish and English are to each other much as the French and the Germans, and the mixing of the more facile, excitable, fierish Irish temperament with the stable, reasoning, persevering English must, in the long run, be productive only of good for both. The rough egotism of the English bourgeoisie would have kept its hold upon the working class much more firmly if the Irish nature, generous to a fault and ruled primarily by sentiment, had not intervened, and softened the cold, rational English character in part by a mixture of the races, and in part by the ordinary contact of life. In view of all this, it is not surprising that the working class has gradually become a race wholly apart from the English bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie has more in common with every other nation of the earth than with the workers in whose midst it lives. The workers speak other dialects, have other thoughts and ideals, other customs and moral principles, a different religion and other politics than those of the bourgeoisie. Thus they are two radically dissimilar nations, as unlike as difference of race could make them, of whom we on the continent have known but one, the bourgeoisie. Yet it is precisely the other, the people, the proletariat, which is by far the more important for the future of England. Of the public character of the English working man, as it finds expression in associations and political principles, we shall have occasion to speak later. Let us here consider the results of the influences cited above, as they affect the private character of the worker. The workman is far more humane in ordinary life than the bourgeois. I have already mentioned the fact that the beggars are accustomed to turn almost exclusively to the workers, and that in general more is done by the workers than by the bourgeoisie for the maintenance of the poor. This fact, which any one may prove for himself any day, is confirmed, among others, by Dr. Parkinson, canon of Manchester, who says, quote, the poor give one another more than the rich give the poor. I can confirm my statement by the testimony of one of our eldest, most skilful, most observant and humane physicians, Dr. Bardsley, who has often declared that the total sum which the poor yearly bestow upon one another surpasses that which the rich contribute in the same time. In other ways, too, the humanity of the workers is constantly manifesting itself pleasantly. They have experienced hard times themselves, and can therefore feel for those in trouble, whence they are more approachable, friendlier, and less greedy for money, though they need it far more, than the property-holding class. For them money is worth only what it will buy, whereas for the bourgeois it has an especial inherent value, the value of a god, and makes the bourgeois the mean, low money-grabber that he is. The working-man who knows nothing of this feeling of reverence for money is therefore less grasping than the bourgeois, whose whole activity is for the purpose of gain, who sees in the accumulations of his money-bags the end and aim of life. Hence the workman is much less prejudiced, has a clearer eye for facts as they are than the bourgeois, and does not look at everything through the spectacles of personal selfishness. 
His faulty education saves him from religious prepossessions. He does not understand religious questions, does not trouble himself about them, knows nothing of the fanaticism that holds the bourgeoisie bound, and if he chances to have any religion, he has it only in name, not even in theory. Practically, he lives for this world, and strives to make himself at home in it. All the writers of the bourgeoisie are unanimous on this point, that the workers are not religious, and do not attend church. From the general statement are to be accepted the Irish, a few elderly people, and the half-bourgeois, the overlookers, foremen, and the like. But among the masses there prevails almost universally a total indifference to religion, or at the utmost some trace of deism too undeveloped to amount to more than mere words, or a vague dread of the words infidel, atheist, etc. The clergy of all sects is in very bad odour with the working men, though the loss of its influence is recent. At present, however, the mere cry, he's a parson, is often enough to drive one of the clergy from the platform of a public meeting. And like the rest of the conditions under which he lives, his want of religious and other culture contributes to keep the working man more unconstrained, freer from inherited stable tenets and cut-and-dried opinions than the bourgeois who is saturated with the class prejudices poured into him from his earliest youth. There is nothing to be done with the bourgeois. He is essentially conservative in however liberal a guise. His interest is bound up with that of the property-holding class. He is dead to all active movement. He is losing his position in the forefront of England's historical development. The workers are taking his place, in rightful claim first, then in fact. All this, together with the correspondent public action of the workers, with which we shall deal later, forms the favourable side of the character of this class. The unfavourable one may be quite as briefly summed up, and follows quite as naturally out of the given causes. Drunkenness, sexual irregularities, brutality, and disregard for the rights of property are the chief points with which the bourgeois charges them. That they drink heavily is to be expected. Sheriff Allison asserts that in Glasgow some thirty thousand working men get drunk every Saturday night, and the estimate is certainly not exaggerated. And that in that city in 1830 one house in twelve, and in 1840 one house in ten was a public house, that in Scotland in 1823 excise was paid upon two million three hundred thousand gallons, and in 1837 upon six million six hundred and twenty thousand gallons, in England in 1823 upon one million nine hundred and seventy six thousand gallons, and in 1837 upon seven million eight hundred and seventy five thousand gallons of spirits. The Beer Act of 1830, which facilitated the opening of beer houses, jerry shops, whose keepers are licensed to sell beer to be drunk on the premises, facilitated the spread of intemperance by bringing a beer house, so to say, to everybody's door. In nearly every street there are several such beer houses, and among two or three neighboring houses in the country one is sure to be a jerry shop. Besides these, there are hush shops in multitudes, that is, secret drinking places which are not licensed, and quite as many secret distilleries which produce great quantities of spirits in retired spots, rarely visited by the police in the great cities. Gaskell estimates these secret distilleries in Manchester alone at more than a hundred, and their product at 156,000 gallons at the least. In Manchester there are, besides, more than a thousand public houses selling all sorts of alcoholic drinks, or quite as many in proportion to the number of inhabitants as in Glasgow. In all other great towns, the state of things is the same, and when one considers, apart from the usual consequences of intemperance, that men and women, even children, often mothers with babies in their arms, come into contact in these places with the most degraded victims of the bourgeois regime, with thieves, swindlers, and prostitutes, when one reflects that many a mother gives the baby on her arm gin to drink, the demoralizing effects of frequenting such places cannot be denied. On Saturday evenings, especially when wages are paid and work stops somewhat earlier than usual, when the whole working class pours from its own poor quarters into the main thoroughfares, intemperance may be seen in all its brutality. I have rarely come out of Manchester on such an evening without meeting numbers of people staggering and seeing others lying in the gutter. 
on sunday evening the same scene is usually repeated only less noisily and when their money is spent the drunkards go to the nearest pawn-shop of which there are plenty in every city over sixty in manchester and ten or twelve in a single street of salford chapel street and pawn whatever they possess furniture sunday clothes where such exist kitchen utensils in masses are fetched from the pawnbrokers on saturday night only to wander back almost without fail before the next wednesday until at last some accident makes the final redemption impossible and one article after another falls into the clutches of the usurer or until he refuses to give a single farthing more upon the battered used-up pledge when one has seen the extent of intemperance among the workers in england one readily believes lord ashley's statement that this class annually expends something like twenty five million pounds sterling upon intoxicating liquor and the deterioration in external conditions the frightful shattering of mental and physical health the ruin of all domestic relations which follow may readily be imagined true the temperance societies have done much but what are a few thousand teetotalers among the millions of workers when father matthew the irish apostle of temperance passes through the english cities from thirty to sixty thousand workers take the pledge but most of them break it again within a month if one counts up the immense numbers who have taken the pledge in the last three or four years in manchester the total is greater than the whole population of the town and still it is by no means evident that intemperance is diminishing next to intemperance in the enjoyment of intoxicating liquors one of the principal faults of english workingmen is sexual license but this too follows with relentless logic with inevitable necessity out of the position of a class left to itself with no means of making fitting use of its freedom the bourgeoisie has left the working class only these two pleasures while imposing upon it a multitude of labours and hardships and the consequence is that the working men in order to get something from life concentrate their whole energy upon these two enjoyments carry them to excess surrender to them in the most unbridled manner when people are placed under conditions which appeal to the brute only what remains to them but to rebel or to succumb to utter brutality and when moreover the bourgeoisie does its full share in maintaining prostitution and how many of the forty thousand prostitutes who fill the streets of london every evening live upon the virtuous bourgeoisie how many of them owe it to the seduction of a bourgeois that they must offer their bodies to the passers-by in order to live surely it has least of all a right to reproach the workers with their sexual brutality the failings of the worker in general may be traced to an unbridled thirst for pleasure to want of providence and of flexibility in fitting into the social order to the general inability to sacrifice the pleasure of the moment to a remoter advantage but is that to be wondered at when the class can purchase few and only the most sensual pleasures by its wearying toil must it not give itself over blindly and madly to those pleasures a class about whose education no one troubles himself which is a play-ball to a thousand chances knows no security in life what incentives has such a class to providence to respectability to sacrifice the pleasure of the moment for a remoter enjoyment most uncertain precisely by reason of the perpetually varying shifting conditions under which the proletariat lives a class which bears all the disadvantages of the social order without enjoying its advantages one to which the social system appears in purely hostile aspects who can demand that such a class respect this social order verily that is asking much but the working man cannot escape the present arrangement of society so long as it exists and when the individual worker resists it the greatest injury falls upon himself thus the social order makes family life almost impossible for the worker in a comfortless filthy house hardly good enough for mere nightly shelter ill furnished often neither rain-tight nor warm a foul atmosphere filling rooms overcrowded with human beings no domestic comfort is possible the husband works the whole day through perhaps the wife also and the elder children all in different places they meet night and morning only all under perpetual temptation to drink what family life is possible under such conditions yet the working-man cannot escape from the family 
must live in the family, and the consequence is a perpetual succession of family troubles, domestic quarrels, most demoralizing for parents and children alike. Neglect of all domestic duties, neglect of the children especially, is only too common among the English working people, and only too vigorously fostered by the existing institutions of society. And children growing up in this savage way, amidst these demoralizing influences, are expected to turn out goody-goody and moral in the end. Verily the requirements are naive, which the self-satisfied bourgeois makes upon the working man. The contempt for the existing social order is most conspicuous in its extreme form, that of offences against the law. If the influences demoralizing to the working man act more powerfully, more concentratedly than usual, he becomes an offender as certainly as water abandons the fluid for the vaporous state at eighty degrees, Réaumur. Under the brutal and brutalizing treatment of the bourgeoisie, the working man becomes precisely as much a thing without volition as water, and is subject to the laws of nature with precisely the same necessity. At a certain point all freedom ceases. Hence, with the extension of the proletariat, crime has increased in England, and the British nation has become the most criminal in the world. From the annual criminal tables of the Home Secretary, it is evident that the increase of crime in England has proceeded with incomprehensible rapidity. The numbers of arrests for criminal offences reached in the years 1805, 4,605, 1810, 5,146, 1815, 7,898, 1820, 13,710, 1825, 14,437, 1830, 18,107, 1835, 20,731, 1840, 27,187, 1841, 27,760, 1842, 31,309, in England and Wales alone. That is to say, they increased sevenfold in thirty-seven years. Of these arrests, in 1842, 4,497 were made in Lancashire alone, or more than 14% of the whole, and 4,094 in Middlesex, including London, or more than 13%, so that two districts which include great cities with large proletarian populations produced one-fourth of the total amount of crime, though their population is far from forming one-fourth of the whole. Moreover, the criminal tables prove directly that nearly all crime arises within the proletariat, for in 1842, taking the average, out of 100 criminals, 32.35 could neither read nor write, 58.32 read and wrote imperfectly, 6.77 could read and write well, 0.22 had enjoyed a higher education, while the degree of education of 2.34 could not be ascertained. In Scotland, crime has increased yet more rapidly. There were but 89 arrests for criminal offences in 1819, and as early as 1837 the number had risen to 3,176, and in 1842 to 4,189. In Lanarkshire, where Sheriff Allison himself made out the official report, population has doubled once in thirty years, and crime once in five and a half, or six times more rapidly than the population. The offences, as in all civilized countries, are in the great majority of cases against property, and have therefore arisen from want in some form, for what a man has he does not steal. The proportion of offences against persons to the population is, in the Netherlands, one in twenty eight thousand nine hundred and four in france one in seventeen thousand five hundred and seventy three in england one in twenty three thousand three hundred and ninety five that of crimes in general to the population in the agricultural districts as one in one thousand and forty three in the manufacturing districts as one in eight hundred and forty in the whole of england to-day the proportion is one in six hundred and sixty though it is scarcely ten years since Gaskell's book appeared. These facts are certainly more than sufficient to bring anyone, even a bourgeois, to pause and reflect upon the consequences of such a state of things. If demoralization and crime multiply twenty years longer in this proportion, and if English manufacture in these twenty years should be less prosperous than heretofore, 
the progressive multiplication of crime can only continue the more rapidly. What will the result be? Society is already in a state of visible dissolution. It is impossible to pick up a newspaper without seeing the most striking evidence of the giving way of all social ties. I look at random into a heap of English journals lying before me. There is the Manchester Guardian for October 30, 1844, which reports for three days. It no longer takes the trouble to give exact details as to Manchester, and merely relates the most interesting cases, that the workers in a mill have struck for higher wages without giving notice, and been condemned by a justice of the peace to resume work, that in Salford a couple of boys had been caught stealing, and a bankrupt tradesman tried to cheat his creditors. From the neighbouring towns the reports are more detailed. In Ashton, two thefts, one burglary, one suicide. In Bury, one theft. In Bolton, two thefts, one revenue fraud. In Lee, one theft. In Oldham, one strike for wages, one theft, one fight between Irish women, one non-union hatter assaulted by union men, one mother beaten by her son, one attack upon the police, one robbery of a church. In Stockport, discontent of working men with wages, one theft, one fraud, one fight, one wife beaten by her husband. In Warrington, one theft, one fight. In Wigan, one theft and one robbery of a church. The reports of the London papers are much worse. Frauds, thefts, assaults, family quarrels crowd one another. A Times of September 12, 1844, falls into my hand, which gives a report of a single day including a theft, an attack upon the police, a sentence upon a father requiring him to support his illegitimate son, the abandonment of a child by its parents, and the poisoning of a man by his wife. Similar reports are to be found in all the English papers. In this country, social war is under full headway. Everyone stands for himself and fights for himself against all comers, and whether or not he shall injure all the others who are his declared foes, depends upon a cynical calculation as to what is most advantageous for him. It no longer occurs to any one to come to a peaceful understanding with his fellow man. All differences are settled by threats, violence, or in a law court. In short, every one sees in his neighbour an enemy to be got out of the way, or at best a tool to be used for his own advantage. And this war grows from year to year, as the criminal tables show, more violent, passionate, irreconcilable. The enemies are dividing gradually into two great camps, the bourgeoisie on the one hand, the workers on the other. This war of each against all, of the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, need cause us no surprise, for it is only the logical sequel of the principle involved in free competition. But it may very well surprise us that the bourgeoisie remains so quiet and composed in the face of the rapidly gathering storm-clouds, that it can read all these things daily in the papers, without, we will not say indignation at such a social condition, but fear of its consequences, of a universal outburst of that which manifests itself symptomatically from day to day in the form of crime. But then it is the bourgeoisie, and from its standpoint cannot even see the facts, much less perceive their consequences. One thing only is astounding, that class prejudice and preconceived opinions can hold a whole class of human beings in such perfect, I might almost say, such mad blindness. Meanwhile, the development of the nation goes its way whether the bourgeoisie has eyes for it or not, and will surprise the property-holding class one day with things not dreamed of in its philosophy. End of chapter 5《Chapter VI of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. — Chapter VI. Single Branches of Industry. Factory Hands. Part I. In dealing now with the more important branches of the English manufacturing proletariat, we shall begin, according to the principle already laid down, with the factory workers, that is, those who are comprised under the Factory Act. This law regulates the length of the working day in mills in which wool, silk, cotton, and flax 
are spun or woven by means of water or steam power, and embraces, therefore, the more important branches of English manufacture. The class employed by them is the most intelligent and energetic of all the English workers, and therefore the most restless and most hated by the bourgeoisie. It stands as a whole, and the cotton workers preeminently stand, at the head of the labour movement, as their masters, the manufacturers, especially those of Lancashire, take the lead of the bourgeois agitation. We have already seen in the introduction how the population employed in working up the textile materials were first torn from their former way of life. It is therefore not surprising that the progress of mechanical invention in later years also affected precisely these workers most deeply and permanently. The history of cotton manufacture, as related by Ur, Baines, and others, is the story of improvements in every direction, most of which have become domesticated in the other branches of industry as well. Handwork is superseded by machine work almost universally. Nearly all manipulations are conducted by the aid of steam or water, and every year is bringing further improvements. In a well-ordered state of society, such improvements could only be a source of rejoicing. In a war of all against all, individuals seize the benefit for themselves, and so deprive the majority of the means of subsistence. Every improvement in machinery throws workers out of employment, and the greater the advance, the more numerous the unemployed. Each great improvement produces, therefore, upon a number of workers, the effect of a commercial crisis, creates want, wretchedness, and crime. Take a few examples. The very first invention, the jenny, worked by one man, produced at least sixfold what the spinning wheel had yielded in the same time. Thus every new jenny threw five spinners out of employment. The throstle, which in turn produced much more than the jenny, and like it was worked by one man, threw still more people out of employment. The mule, which required yet fewer hands in proportion to the product, had the same effect, and every improvement in the mule, every multiplication of its spindles, diminished still further the number of workers employed. But this increase of the number of spindles in the mule is so great that whole armies of workers have been thrown out of employment by it. For whereas one spinner, with a couple of children for piecers, formerly set six hundred spindles in motion, he could now manage fourteen hundred to two thousand spindles upon two mules so that two adult spinners and a part of the piecers whom they employed were thrown out. And since self-acting mules have been introduced into a very large number of spinning mills, the spinner's work is wholly performed by the machine. There lies before me a book from the pen of James Leach, one of the recognized leaders of the Chartists in Manchester. The author has worked for years in various branches of industry, in mills and coal mines, and is known to me personally as an honest, trustworthy and capable man. In consequence of his political position, he had at command extensive detailed information as to the different factories, collected by the workers themselves, and he publishes tables from which it is clear that in 1841, in thirty-five factories, one thousand sixty fewer mule spinners were employed than in 1829, though the number of spindles in these thirty-five factories had increased by ninety-nine thousand two hundred and thirty-nine. He cites five factories in which no spinners whatever are employed, self-actors only being used. While the number of spindles increased by ten per cent, the number of spinners diminished more than sixty per cent. And Leach adds that since 1841, so many improvements have been introduced by double-decking and other means, that in some of the factories named, half the operatives have been discharged. In one factory alone, where eighty spinners were employed a short time ago, there are now but twenty left, the others having been discharged or set at children's work for children's wages. Of Stockport, Leach tells a similar story, that in 1835 eight hundred spinners were employed, and in 1840 but one hundred and forty, though the manufacture of Stockport has greatly increased during the last eight or nine years. Similar improvements have now been made in carding frames, by which one half the operatives have been thrown out of employment. In one factory, improved frames have been set up, which have thrown four hands out of eight out of work, besides which the employer reduced the wages of the four retained from eight shillings to seven. The same process has gone on in the weaving industry. The power loom has taken possession of one branch of hand-weaving after another, 
and since it produces much more than the hand-loom, while one weaver can work two looms, it has superseded a multitude of working people. And in all sorts of manufacture, in flax and wool spinning, in silk twisting, the case is the same. The power-loom, too, is beginning to appropriate one branch after another of wool and linen weaving. In Rockdale alone there are more power than hand-looms in flannel and other wool-weaving branches. The bourgeoisie usually replies to this that improvements in machinery, by decreasing the cost of production, supply finished goods at lower prices, and that these reduced prices cause such an increase in consumption that the unemployed operatives soon find full employment in newly founded factories. The bourgeoisie is so far correct that under certain conditions favorable for the general development of manufacture, every reduction in price of goods in which the raw material is cheap greatly increases consumption and gives rise to the building of new factories. But every further word of the assertion is a lie. The bourgeoisie ignores the fact that it takes years for these results of the decrease in price to follow and for new factories to be built. It is silent upon the point that every improvement in machinery throws the real work, the expenditure of force, more and more upon the machine, and so transforms the work of full-grown men into mere supervision, which a feeble woman or even a child can do quite as well, and does for half or two-thirds wages, that therefore grown men are constantly more and more supplanted and not re-employed by the increase in manufacture. It conceals the fact that whole branches of industry fall away, or are so changed that they must be learned afresh, and it takes good care not to confess what it usually harps upon whenever the question of forbidding the work of children is broached, that factory work must be learned in earliest youth in order to be learned properly. It does not mention the fact that the process of improvement goes steadily on, and that as soon as the operative has succeeded in making himself at home in a new branch, if he actually does succeed in so doing, this too is taken from him, and with it the last remnant of security which remained to him for winning his bread. But the bourgeoisie gets the benefit of the improvements in machinery. It has a capital opportunity for piling up money during the first years while many old machines are still in use, and the improvement not yet universally introduced. And it would be too much to ask that it should have an open eye for the disadvantages inseparable from these improvements. The fact that improved machinery reduces wages has also been as violently disputed by the bourgeoisie as it is constantly reiterated by the working men. The bourgeoisie insists that although the price of piecework has been reduced, yet the total wages for the week's work has rather risen than fallen, and the condition of the operatives rather improved than deteriorated. It is hard to get to the bottom of the matter for the operatives usually dwell upon the price of piecework. But it is certain that the weekly wage also has, in many branches of work, been reduced by the improvement of machinery. The so-called fine spinners, who spin fine mule yarn, for instance, do receive high wages, thirty to forty shillings a week, because they have a powerful association for keeping wages up, and their craft requires long training. But the coarse spinners, who have to compete against self-actors, which are not as yet adapted for fine spinning, and whose association was broken down by the introduction of these machines, receive very low wages. A mule spinner told me that he does not earn more than fourteen shillings a week, and his statement agrees with that of Leach, that in various factories the coarse spinners earn less than sixteen shillings and sixpence a week, and that a spinner, who years ago earned thirty shillings, can now hardly scrape up twelve and a half, and had not earned more on an average in the past year. The wages of women and children may perhaps have fallen less, but only because they were not high from the beginning. I know several women, widows with children, who have trouble enough to earn eight to nine shillings a week, and that they and their families cannot live decently upon that sum, every one must admit who knows the price of the barest necessaries of life in England. That wages in general have been reduced by the improvement of machinery is the unanimous testimony of the operatives. The bourgeois assertion that the condition of the working class has been improved by machinery is most vigorously proclaimed a falsehood in every meeting of working men in the factory districts. And even if it were true that the relative wage, the price of piecework only, has fallen, while the absolute wage, the sum to be earned in the week, remained unchanged, what would follow? 
that the operatives have had quietly to look on while the manufacturers filled their purses from every improvement without giving the hands the smallest share in the gain. The bourgeois forgets, in fighting the working man, the most ordinary principles of his own political economy. He who at other times swears by Malthus, cries out in his anxiety before the workers, quote, where could the millions by which the population of England has increased find work without the improvements in machinery? End quote. As though the bourgeois did not know well enough that without machinery and the expansion of industry which it produced, these millions would never have been brought into the world and grown up. The service which machinery has rendered the workers is simply this, that it has brought home to their minds the necessity of a social reform by means of which machinery shall no longer work against but for them. Let the wise bourgeois ask the people who sweep the streets in Manchester and elsewhere, though even this is past now, since machines for the purpose have been invented and introduced, or sell salt, matches, oranges, and shoestrings on the streets, or even beg what they were formerly, and he will see how many will answer, quote, mill hands thrown out of work by machinery, end quote. The consequences of improvement in machinery under our present social conditions are, for the working man, solely injurious, and often in the highest degree oppressive. Every new advance brings with it loss of employment, want, and suffering, and in a country like England, where without that there is usually a surplus population, to be discharged from work is the worst that can befall the operative. And what a dispiriting, unnerving influence this uncertainty of his position in life consequent on the unceasing progress of machinery, must exercise upon the worker whose lot is precarious enough without it. To escape despair there are but two ways open to him, either inward and outward revolt against the bourgeoisie, or drunkenness and general demoralization. And the English operatives are accustomed to take refuge in both. The history of the English proletariat relates hundreds of uprisings against machinery and the bourgeoisie. We have already spoken of the moral dissolution which, in itself, is only another form of despair. The worst situation is that of those workers who have to compete against a machine that is making its way. The price of the goods which they produce adapts itself to the price of the kindred product of the machine, and as the latter works more cheaply, its human competitor has but the lowest wages. The same thing happens to every operative employed upon an old machine in competition with later improvements and who else is there to bear the hardship? The manufacturer will not throw out his old apparatus, nor will he sustain the loss upon it. Out of the dead mechanism he can make nothing, so he fastens upon the living worker, the universal scapegoat of society. Of all the workers in competition with machinery, the most ill-used are the hand-loom cotton-weavers. They receive the most trifling wages, and with full work are not in a position to earn more than ten shillings a week. One class of woven goods after another is annexed by the power-loom, and hand-weaving is the last refuge of workers thrown out of employment in other branches, so that the trade is always overcrowded. Hence it comes that, in average seasons, the hand-weaver counts himself fortunate if he can earn six or seven shillings a week, while to reach this sum he must sit at his loom fourteen to eighteen hours a day. Most woven goods require, moreover, a damp weaving-room to keep the weft from snapping, and in part for this reason, in part because of their poverty, which prevents them from paying for better dwellings, the workrooms of these weavers are usually without wooden or paved floors. I have been in many dwellings of such weavers, in remote, vile courts and alleys, usually in cellars. Often half a dozen of these hand-loom weavers, several of them married, live together in a cottage with one or two workrooms and one large sleeping-room. Their food consists almost exclusively of potatoes, with perhaps oatmeal porridge, rarely milk, and scarcely ever meat. Great numbers of them are Irish or of Irish descent, and these poor hand-loom weavers, first to suffer from every crisis and last to be relieved from it, must serve the bourgeoisie as a handle in meeting attacks upon the factory system. Quote, See, cries the bourgeois triumphantly, see how these poor creatures must famish while the mill operatives are thriving, and then judge the factory system. End quote. As though it were not precisely the factory system and the machinery belonging to it which had so shamefully crushed the hand loom weavers, and as though the bourgeoisie did not know this quite as well as ourselves. 
but the bourgeoisie has interests at stake, and so a falsehood or two and a bit of hypocrisy won't matter much. Let us examine somewhat more closely the fact that machinery more and more supersedes the work of men. The human labor, involved in both spinning and weaving, consists chiefly in piecing broken threads, as the machine does all the rest. This work requires no muscular strength, but only flexibility of finger. Men are therefore not only not needed for it, but actually, by reason of the greater muscular development of the hand, less fit for it than women and children and are therefore naturally almost superseded by them. Hence, the more the use of the arms, the expenditure of strength, can be transferred to steam or water power, the fewer men need be employed. And as women and children work more cheaply, and in these branches better than men, they take their places. In the spinning mills women and girls are to be found in almost exclusive possession of the throstles. Among the mules one man, an adult spinner, with self-actors he too becomes superfluous, and several piecers for tying the threads, usually children or women, sometimes young men of from eighteen to twenty years, here and there an old spinner thrown out of other employment. At the power looms women from fifteen to twenty years are chiefly employed, and a few men. These, however, rarely remain at this trade after their twenty-first year. Among the preparatory machinery, too, women alone are to be found, with here and there a man to clean and sharpen the carding frames. Besides all these, the factories employ numbers of children, doffers, for mounting and taking down bobbins, and a few men as overlookers, a mechanic and an engineer for the steam engines, carpenters, porters, etc., but the actual work of the mills is done by women and children. This the manufacturers deny. They published last year elaborate tables to prove that machinery does not supersede adult male operatives. According to these tables, rather more than half of all the factory workers employed, that is, 52%, were females and 48% males, and of those operatives more than half were over 18 years old. So far, so good. But the manufacturers are very careful not to tell us how many of the adults were men and how many women. And this is just the point. Besides this, they have evidently counted the mechanics, engineers, carpenters, all the men employed in any way in the factories, perhaps even the clerks, and still they have not the courage to tell the whole truth. These publications teem generally with falsehoods, perversions, crooked statements, with calculations of averages that prove a great deal for the uninitiated reader and nothing for the initiated, and with suppressions of facts bearing on the most important points and they prove only the selfish blindness and want of uprightness of the manufacturers concerned. Let us take some of the statements of a speech with which Lord Ashley introduced the Ten Hours' Bill, March 15, 1844, into the House of Commons. Here he gives some data as to the relations of sex and age of the operatives, not yet refuted by the manufacturers, whose statements, as quoted above, cover moreover only a part of the manufacturing industry of England. Of 419,560 factory operatives of the British Empire in 1839, 192,887, or nearly half, were under 18 years of age, and 242,296 of the female sex, of whom 112,192 were less than 18 years old. There remain, therefore, 80,695 male operatives under 18 years and 96,569 adult male operatives, or not one full quarter of the whole number. In the cotton factories, 56 and a quarter percent, in the woolen mills, 69 and a half percent, in the silk mills, 70 and a half percent, in the flax spinning mills, 70 and a half percent of all operatives are of the female sex. These numbers suffice to prove the crowding out of adult males but you have only to go into the nearest mill to see the fact confirmed. Hence follows of necessity that inversion of the existing social order which, being forced upon them, has the most ruinous consequences for the workers. The employment of women at once breaks up the family, for when the wife spends twelve or thirteen hours every day in the mill, and the husband works the same length of time there or elsewhere, what becomes of the children? They grow up like wild weeds, they are put out to nurse for a shilling or eighteen pence a week, and how they are treated may be imagined. 
hence the accidents to which little children fall victims multiply in the factory districts to a terrible extent the lists of the coroner of manchester showed for nine months sixty-nine deaths from burning fifty-six from drowning twenty-three from falling seventy-seven from other causes or a total of two hundred and twenty-five deaths from accidents while in non-manufacturing liverpool during twelve months there were but one hundred and forty-six fatal accidents the mining accidents are excluded in both cases and since the coroner of manchester has no authority in salford the population of both places mentioned in the comparison is about the same the manchester guardian reports one or more deaths by burning in almost every number that the general mortality among young children must be increased by the employment of the mothers is self-evident and is placed beyond all doubt by notorious facts women often return to the mill three or four days after confinement leaving the baby of course in the dinner hour they must hurry home to feed the child and eat something and what sort of suckling that can be is also evident lord ashley repeats the testimony of several workwomen quote, m h twenty years old has two children the youngest a baby that is tended by the other a little older the mother goes to the mill shortly after five o'clock in the morning and comes home at eight at night all day the milk pours from her breasts so that her clothing drips with it quote, h w has three children goes away monday morning at five o'clock and comes back saturday evening has so much to do for the children then that she cannot get to bed before three o'clock in the morning often wet through to the skin and obliged to work in that state end quote. she said quote, my breasts have given me the most frightful pain, and I have been dripping wet with milk. End quote. The use of narcotics to keep the children still is fostered by this infamous system, and has reached a great extent in the factory districts. Dr. Johns, registrar in chief for Manchester, is of opinion that this custom is the chief source of the many deaths from convulsions. The employment of the wife dissolves the family utterly, and of necessity, and this dissolution in our present society which is based upon the family brings the most demoralizing consequences for parents as well as children a mother who has no time to trouble herself about her child to perform the most ordinary loving services for it during its first year who scarcely indeed sees it can be no real mother to the child must inevitably grow indifferent to it treat it unlovingly like a stranger the children who grow up under such conditions are utterly ruined for later family life can never feel at home in the family which they themselves found because they have always been accustomed to isolation and they contribute therefore to the already general undermining of the family in the working class a similar dissolution of the family is brought about by the employment of children when they get on far enough to earn more than they cost their parents from week to week they begin to pay the parents a fixed sum for board and lodging and keep the rest for themselves this often happens from the fourteenth or fifteenth year in a word the children emancipate themselves and regard the paternal dwelling as a lodging-house which they often exchange for another as suits them in many cases the family is not wholly dissolved by the employment of the wife but turned upside down the wife supports the family the husband sits at home tends the children sweeps the room and cooks this case happens very frequently. In Manchester alone many hundred such men could be cited, condemned to domestic occupations. It is easy to imagine the wrath aroused among the working men by this reversal of all relations within the family, while the other social conditions remain unchanged. There lies before me a letter from an English working man, Robert Pounder, Baron's Buildings, Woodhouse, Moorside, and Leeds. The bourgeoisie may hunt him up there. I give the exact address for the purpose, written by him to Osler. He relates how another working man, being on tramp, came to St. Helens in Lancashire, and there looked up an old friend. He found him in a miserable, damp cellar, scarcely furnished, and when my poor friend went in, there sat poor Jack near the fire. And what did he think you? Why, he sat and mended his wife's stockings with the bodkin, and as soon as he saw his old friend at the doorpost, he tried to hide them. But Joe, that is my friend's name, had seen it and said, quote, Jack, what the devil art thou doing? Where is the missus? Why, is that thy work? End quote. And poor Jack was ashamed and said, quote, 
No, I know this is not my work, but my poor missus is in the factory. She has to leave at half-past five and works till eight at night, and then she is so knocked up that she cannot do aught when she gets home, so I have to do everything for her what I can, for I have no work, nor had any for more nor three years, and I shall never have any more work while I live." And then he wept a big tear. Jack again said, quote, There is work enough for women folks and children hereabouts, but none for men. Thou mayst sooner find a hundred pound on the road than work for men. But I should never have believed that either thou or any one else would have seen me mending my wife's stockings, for it is bad work. But she can hardly stand on her feet. I am afraid she will be laid up, and then I don't know what is to become of us, for it's a good bit that she has been the man in the house, and I the woman. It is bad work, Joe. End quote. And he cried bitterly and said, quote, It has not been always so. Quote, no, said Joe, but when thou hadn't no work, how hast thou not shifted? Quote, I'll tell thee, Joe, as well as I can, but it was bad enough. Thou knowest when I got married I had work plenty, and thou knows I was not lazy. Quote, no, that thou wert not. Quote, and we had a good furnished house, and Mary need not go to work. I could work for the two of us, but now the world is upside down. Mary has to work, and I have to stop at home, mind the children sweep and wash, bake and mend, and when the poor woman comes home at night she is knocked up. Thou knows, Joe, it's hard for one that was used different. Quote, yes, boy, it is hard. End quote. And then Jack began to cry again, and he wished he had never married, and that he had never been born but that he had never thought, when he wed Mary, that it would come to this. Quote, I have often cried over it, said Jack. Now when Joe heard this, he told me that he had cursed and damned the factories, and the masters and the government, with all the curses that he had learned while he was in the factory from a child. Can any one imagine a more insane state of things than that described in this letter? And yet this condition, which unsexes the man, and takes from the woman all womanliness, without being able to bestow upon the man true womanliness, or the woman true manliness, this condition which degrades, in the most shameful way, both sexes, and through them humanity, is the last result of our much-praised civilization, the final achievement of all the efforts and struggles of hundreds of generations to improve their own situation and that of their posterity. We must either despair of mankind and its aims and efforts when we see all our labor and toil result in such a mockery, or we must admit that human society has hitherto sought salvation in a false direction. We must admit that so total a reversal of the position of the sexes can have come to pass only because the sexes have been placed in a false position from the beginning. If the reign of the wife over the husband, as inevitably brought about by the factory system, is inhuman, the pristine rule of the husband over the wife must have been inhuman too. If the wife can now base her supremacy upon the fact that she supplies the greater part, nay, the whole of the common possession, the necessary influence is that this community of possession is no true and rational one, since one member of the family boasts offensively of contributing the greater share. If the family of our present society is being thus dissolved, this dissolution merely shows that at bottom the binding tie of this family was not family affection, but private interest lurking under the cloak of a pretended community of possessions. The same relation exists on the part of those children who support unemployed parents when they do not directly pay board as already referred to. Dr. Hawkins testified in the Factories Inquiry Commission's report that this relation is common enough, and in Manchester it is notorious. In this case the children are the masters in the house, as the wife was in the former case, and Lord Ashley gives an example of this in his speech. A man berated his two daughters for going to the public house, and they answered that they were tired of being ordered about, saying, quote, Damn you, we have to keep you. End quote. Determined to keep the proceeds of their work for themselves, they left the family dwelling and abandoned their parents to their fate. The unmarried women who have grown up in mills are no better off than the married ones. It is self-evident that a girl who has worked in a mill from her ninth year is in no position to understand domestic work, whence it follows that female operatives prove wholly inexperienced and unfit as housekeepers. They cannot knit or sew, cook or wash, 
are unacquainted with the most ordinary duties of a housekeeper, and when they have young children to take care of, have not the vaguest idea how to set about it. The Factories Inquiries Commission's report gives dozens of examples of this, and Dr. Hawkins, Commissioner for Lancashire, expresses his opinion as follows, quote, The girls marry early and recklessly. They have neither means, time, nor opportunity to learn the ordinary duties of household life. But if they had them all, they would find no time in married life for the performance of these duties. The mother is more than twelve hours away from her child daily. The baby is cared for by a young girl or an old woman, to whom it is given to nurse. Besides this, the dwelling of the mill-hands is too often no home but a cellar, which contains no cooking or washing utensils, no sewing or mending materials, nothing which makes life agreeable and civilized, or the domestic hearth attractive. For these and other reasons, and especially for the sake of the better chances of life for the little children, I can but wish and hope that a time may come in which married women will be shut out of the factories." But that is the least of the evil. The moral consequences of the employment of women in factories are even worse. The collecting of persons of both sexes and all ages in a single workroom, the inevitable contact, the crowding into a small space of people to whom neither mental nor moral education has been given, is not calculated for the favourable development of the female character. The manufacturer, if he pays any attention to the matter, can interfere only when something scandalous actually happens. The permanent, less conspicuous influence of persons of dissolute character upon the more moral, and especially upon the younger ones, he cannot ascertain, and consequently cannot prevent. But precisely this influence is the most injurious. The language used in the mills is characterized by many witnesses in the report of 1833 as indecent, bad, filthy, etc. It is the same process upon a small scale which we have already witnessed upon a large one in the great cities. The centralization of population has the same influence upon the same persons, whether it affects them in a great city or a small factory. The smaller the mill, the closer the packing, and the more unavoidable the contact, and the consequences are not wanting. A witness in Leicester said that he would rather let his daughter beg than go into a factory, that they are perfect gates of hell, that most of the prostitutes of the town had their employment in the mills to thank for their present situation. Another in Manchester, quote, did not hesitate to assert that three-fourths of the young factory employees, from fourteen to twenty years of age, were unchaste, end quote. Commissioner Cowell expresses it as his opinion that the morality of the factory operatives is somewhat below the average of that of the working class in general, and Dr. Hawkins says, quote, an estimate of sexual morality cannot readily be reduced to figures, but if I may trust my own observations and the general opinion of those with whom I have spoken, as well as the whole tenor of the testimony furnished me, the aspect of the influence of factory life upon the morality of the youthful female population is most depressing." End quote. It is besides a matter of course that factory servitude, like any other, and to an even higher degree, confers the just primae noctis upon the master. In this respect also the employer is sovereign over the persons and charms of his employees. The threat of discharge suffices to overcome all resistance in nine cases out of ten, if not in ninety-nine out of a hundred, in girls who, in any case, have no strong inducements to chastity. If the master is mean enough, and the official report mentions several such cases, his mill is also his harem, and the fact that not all manufacturers use their power does not in the least change the position of the girls. In the beginning of manufacturing industry, when most of the employers were upstarts without education or consideration for the hypocrisy of society, they let nothing interfere with the exercise of their vested rights. To form a correct judgment of the influence of factory work upon the health of the female sex, it is necessary first to consider the work of children, and then the nature of the work itself. From the beginning of manufacturing industry, children have been employed in mills, at first almost exclusively by reason of the smallness of the machines, which were later enlarged. Even children from the workhouses were employed in multitudes, being rented out for a number of years to the manufacturers as apprentices. 
they were lodged fed and clothed in common and were of course completely the slaves of their masters by whom they were treated with the utmost recklessness and barbarity as early as seventeen ninety six the public objection to this revolting system found such vigorous expression through dr percival and sir robert peel father of the cabinet minister and himself a cotton manufacturer that in eighteen o two parliament passed an apprentices bill by which the most crying evils were removed gradually the increasing competition of free work people crowded out the whole apprentice system factories were built in cities machinery was constructed on a larger scale and workrooms were made more airy and wholesome gradually too more work was found for adults and young persons the number of children in the mills diminished somewhat and the age at which they began to work rose a little few children under eight or nine years were now employed later as we shall see the power of the state intervened several times to protect them from the money greed of the bourgeoisie the great mortality among children of the working class and especially among those of the factory operatives is proof enough of the unwholesome conditions under which they pass their first year these influences are at work of course among the children who survive but not quite so powerfully as upon those who succumb the result in the most favourable case is a tendency to disease or some check in development and consequent less than normal vigour of the constitution a nine years old child of a factory operative that has grown up in want privation and changing conditions in cold and damp with insufficient clothing and unwholesome dwellings is far from having the working force of a child brought up under healthier conditions at nine years of age it is sent into the mill to work six and a half hours formerly eight earlier still twelve to fourteen even sixteen hours daily until the thirteenth year then twelve hours until the eighteenth year. The old enfeebling influences continue, while the work is added to them. It is not to be denied that a child of nine years, even an operative child, can hold out through six and a half hours daily work, without any one being able to trace visible bad results in its development directly to this cause. But in no case can its presence in the damp, heavy air of the factory, often at once warm and wet, contribute to good health and in any case it is unpardonable to sacrifice to the greed of an unfeeling bourgeoisie the time of children which should be devoted solely to their physical and mental development withdraw them from school and the fresh air in order to wear them out for the benefit of the manufacturers the bourgeoisie says quote, if we do not employ the children in the mills they only remain under conditions unfavourable to their development end quote and this is true on the whole. But what does this mean if it is not a confession that the bourgeoisie first places the children of the working class under unfavourable conditions, and then exploits these bad conditions for its own benefit, appeals to that which is as much its own fault as the factory system, excuses the sin of today with the sin of yesterday? And if the Factory Act did not in some measure fetter their hands, how this humane, this benevolent bourgeoisie, which has built its factories solely for the good of the working class, would take care of the interests of these workers. Let us hear how they acted before the factory inspector was at their heels. Their own admitted testimony shall convict them in the report of the Factories Inquiry Commission of 1833. End of chapter 6, part 1《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
One case is related of a Scotch manufacturer who rode after a sixteen years old runaway, forced him to return running after the employer as fast as the master's horse trotted, and beat him the whole way with a long whip. In the large towns where the operatives resisted more vigorously, such things naturally happened less often. But even this long working day failed to satisfy the greed of the capitalists. Their aim was to make the capital invested in the building and machinery produce the highest return, by every available means, to make it work as actively as possible. Hence the manufacturers introduced the shameful system of night work. Some of them employed two sets of operatives, each numerous enough to fill the whole mill, and let one set work the twelve hours of the day, and the other twelve hours of the night. It is needless to picture the effect upon the frames of young children, and even upon the health of young persons and adults, produced by permanent loss of sleep at night, which cannot be made good by any amount of sleep during the day. Irritation of the whole nervous system, with general lassitude and enfeeblement of the entire frame were the inevitable results, with the fostering of temptation to drunkenness and unbridled sexual indulgence. One manufacturer testifies that during the two years in which night work was carried on in his factory, the number of illegitimate children born was doubled, and such general demoralization prevailed that he was obliged to give up night work. Other manufacturers were yet more barbarous, requiring many hands to work thirty to forty hours at a stretch, several times a week, letting them get a couple of hours sleep only, because the night shift was not complete, but calculated to replace a part of the operatives only. The reports of the Commission touching this barbarism surpass everything that is known to me in this line. Such infamies as are here related are nowhere else to be found, yet we shall see that the bourgeoisie constantly appeals to the testimony of the commission as being in its own favour. The consequences of these cruelties became evident quickly enough. The commissioners mention a crowd of cripples who appeared before them, who clearly owed their distortion to the long working hours. This distortion usually consists of a curving of the spinal column and legs, and is described as follows by Francis Sharp, MRCS of Leeds. Quote, I never saw the peculiar bending of the lower ends of the thigh bones before I came to Leeds. At first I thought it was rachitis, but I was soon led to change my opinion in consequence of the mass of patients who presented themselves at the hospital and the appearances of the disease at an age, from the fourteenth to the eighteenth year, in which children are usually not subject to rachitis as well as by the circumstance that the malady had first appeared after children began to work in the mills. Thus far I have seen about a hundred such cases, and can most decidedly express the opinion that they are the consequences of overwork. So far as I know, they are all mill children, and themselves attributed the evil to this cause. The number of cases of curvature of the spine which have fallen under my observation and which were evidently consequent upon too protracted standing, was not less than three hundred. Precisely similar is the testimony of Dr. Ray, for eighteen years physician in the hospital in Leeds. Quote, Malformations of the spine are very frequent among mill hands, some of them consequent upon mere overwork, others the effect of long work upon constitutions originally feeble or weakened by bad food. Deformities seem even more frequent than these diseases. The knees were bent inward, the ligaments very often relaxed and enfeebled, and the long bones of the legs bent. The thick ends of these long bones were especially apt to be bent and disproportionately developed, and these patients came from the factories in which long work hours were of frequent occurrence. End quote. Surgeons Beaumont and Sharp of Bradford bear the same testimony. The reports of Drinkwater, Power, and Dr. Loudon contain a multitude of examples of such distortions, and those of Tufnell and Sir David Barry, which are less directed to this point, give single examples. The commissioners for Lancashire, Cowell, Tufnell, and Hawkins have almost wholly neglected this aspect of the physiological results of the factory system, though this district rivals Yorkshire in the number of cripples. 
I have seldom traversed Manchester without meeting three or four of them, suffering from precisely the same distortions of the spinal columns and legs as that described, and I have often been able to observe them closely. I know one personally who corresponds exactly with the foregoing description of Dr. Ray, and who got into this condition in Mr. Douglas's factory in Pendleton, an establishment which enjoys an unenviable notoriety among the operatives, by reason of the former long working periods continued night after night. It is evident at a glance whence the distortions of these cripples come. They all look exactly alike. The knees are bent inward and backwards, the ankles deformed and thick, and the spinal column often bent forwards or to one side. But the crown belongs to the philanthropic manufacturers of the Macclesfield Silk District. They employed the youngest children of all, even from five to six years of age. In the supplementary testimony of Commissioner Tufnell, I find the statement of a certain factory manager right, both of whose sisters were most shamefully crippled, and who had once counted the cripples in several streets, some of them the cleanest and neatest streets of Macclesfield. He found in Townley Street ten, George Street five, Charlotte Street four, Watercots fifteen, Bank Top three, Lord Street seven, Mill Lane twelve, Great George Street two, in the workhouse two, Park Green one, Peckford Street two, whose families all unanimously declared that the cripples had become such in consequence of overwork in the silk twisting mills. One boy is mentioned so crippled as not to be able to go upstairs, and girls deformed in back and hips. Other deformities also have proceeded from this overwork, especially flattening of the foot, which Sir D. Barry frequently observed, as did the physicians and surgeons in Leeds. In cases in which a stronger constitution, better food, and other more favorable circumstances enabled the young operative to resist this effect of a barbarous exploitation, we find at least pain in the back, hips, and legs, swollen joints, varicose veins, and large, persistent ulcers in the thighs and calves. These affections are almost universal among the operatives. The reports of Stuart, Mackintosh, and Sir D. Barry contain hundreds of examples. Indeed, they know almost no operative who did not suffer from some of these affections. And in the remaining reports, the occurrence of the same phenomena is attested by many physicians. The reports covering Scotland place it beyond all doubt that a working day of thirteen hours, even for men and women from eighteen to twenty-two years of age, produces at least these consequences, both in the flax spinning mills of Dundee and Dunfermline, and in the cotton mills of Glasgow and Lanark. All these affections are easily explained by the nature of factory work, which is, as the manufacturers say, very light, and precisely by reason of its lightness, more enervating than any other. The operatives have little to do, but must stand the whole time. Anyone who sits down, say upon a window ledge or a basket, is fined, and this perpetual upright position, this constant mechanical pressure of the upper portions of the body upon spinal column, hips, and legs, inevitably produces the results mentioned. This standing is not required by the work itself, and at Nottingham chairs have been introduced, with the result that these affections disappeared, and the operative ceased to object to the length of the working day. But in a factory where the operative works solely for the bourgeois, and has small interest in doing his work well, he would probably use the seats more than would be agreeable and profitable to the manufacturer, and in order that somewhat less raw material may be spoiled for the bourgeois, the operative must sacrifice health and strength. This long protracted upright position, with the bad atmosphere prevalent in the mills, entails, besides the deformities mentioned, a marked relaxation of all vital energies, and in consequence all sorts of other affections general rather than local. The atmosphere of the factories is, as a rule, at once damp and warm, and usually warmer than is necessary, and when the ventilation is not very good, impure, heavy, deficient in oxygen, filled with dust and the smell of the machine oil, which almost everywhere smears the floor, sinks into it, and becomes rancid. 
the operatives are lightly clad by reason of the warmth and would readily take cold in case of irregularity of the temperature a draught is distasteful to them the general enervation which gradually takes possession of all the physical functions diminishes the animal warmth this must be replaced from without and nothing is therefore more agreeable to the operative than to have all the doors and windows closed and to stay in his warm factory air then comes the sudden change of temperature on going out into the cold and wet or frosty atmosphere without the means of protection from the rain or of changing wet clothing for dry a circumstance which perpetually produces colds and when one reflects that with all this not one single muscle of the body is really exercised really called into activity except perhaps those of the legs that nothing whatsoever counteracts the enervating, relaxing tendency of all these conditions, that every influence is wanting which might give the muscles strength, the fibres elasticity and consistency, that from youth up the operative is deprived of all fresh air recreation, it is impossible to wonder at the almost unanimous testimony of the physicians in the factory's report, that they find a great lack of ability to resist disease a general depression in vital activity, a constant relaxation of the mental and physical powers. Let us hear Sir D. Barry first. Quote, the unfavorable influences of millwork upon the hands are the following. 1. The inevitable necessity of forcing their mental and bodily effort to keep pace with a machine moved by a uniform and unceasing motive power. 2 continuance in an upright position during unnaturally long and quickly recurring periods three loss of sleep in consequence of too long working hours pain in the legs and general physical derangement to these are often added low crowded dusty or damp workrooms impure air a high temperature and constant perspiration hence the boys especially very soon and with but few exceptions lose the rosy freshness of childhood and become paler and thinner than other boys even the hand-weaver's bound boy who sits before his loom with his bare feet resting upon the clay floor retains a fresher appearance because he occasionally goes into the fresh air for a time but the mill-child has not a moment free except for meals and never goes into the fresh air except on its way to them all adult male spinners are pale and thin suffer from capricious appetite and indigestion, and as they are all trained in the mills from their youth up, and there are very few tall, athletic men among them, the conclusion is justified that their occupation is very unfavorable for the development of the male constitution. Females bear this work far better. End quote. Very naturally, but we shall see that they have their own diseases. So to power, quote, I can bear witness that the factory system in Bradford has engendered a multitude of cripples, and that the effect of long continued labor upon the physique is apparent, not alone in actual deformity, but also, and much more generally, in stunted growth, relaxation of the muscles, and delicacy of the whole frame. End quote. So too, F. Sharp in Leeds, the surgeon already quoted. Quote, when I moved from Scarborough to Leeds, I was at once struck by the fact that the general appearance of the children was much paler, and their fibre less vigorous here than in Scarborough and its environs. I saw, too, that many children were exceptionally small for their age. I have met with numberless cases of scrofula, lung trouble, mesenteric affections, and indigestion, concerning which I, as a medical man, have no doubt that they arose from millwork. I believe that the nervous energy of the body is weakened by the long hours, and the foundation of many diseases laid. If people from the country were not constantly coming in, the race of mill-hands would soon be wholly degenerate." End quote. So to Beaumont, surgeon in Bradford, quote, To my thinking, the system, according to which work is done in the mills here, produces a peculiar relaxation of the whole organism, and thereby makes children in the highest degree susceptible to epidemic as well as to incidental illness. I regard the absence of all appropriate regulations for ventilation and cleanliness in the mills 
very decidedly as the chief cause of that peculiar tendency or susceptibility to morbid affections which I have so frequently met in my practice. End quote. Similar testimony is borne by Dr. Ray. Quote, One, I have had opportunity of observing the effects of the factory system upon the health of children under the most favorable circumstances. Note, in Woods Mill, in Bradford, the best arranged of the district, in which he was factory surgeon. End of note. Two, these effects are decidedly, and to a very great extent, injurious, even under these most favorable circumstances. Three, in the year 1842, three-fifths of all the children employed in Woods Mill were treated by me. Four, the worst effect is not the predominance of deformities, but of enfeebled and morbid constitutions. Five, all this is greatly improved since the working hours of children have been reduced at Woods to ten. End quote. The commissioner, Dr. Loudon himself, who cites these witnesses, says, quote, In conclusion, I think it has been clearly proved that children have been worked a most unreasonable and cruel length of time daily, and that even adults have been expected to do a certain quantity of labor which scarcely any human being is able to endure. The consequence is that many have died prematurely, and others are afflicted for life with defective constitutions, and the fear of a posterity enfeebled by the shattered constitution of the survivors is but too well founded from a physiological point of view. End quote. And finally, Dr. Hawkins, in speaking of Manchester, quote, I believe that most travellers are struck by the lowness of stature the leanness and the paleness which present themselves so commonly to the eye at Manchester, and above all among the factory classes. I have never been in any town in Great Britain, nor in Europe, in which degeneracy of form and colour from the national standard has been so obvious. Among the married women all the characteristic peculiarities of the English wife are conspicuously wanting. I must confess that all the boys and girls brought before me from the Manchester mills had a depressed appearance and were very pale. In the expression of their faces lay nothing of the usual mobility, liveliness, and cheeriness of youth. Many of them told me that they felt not the slightest inclination to play out of doors on Saturday and Sunday, but preferred to be quiet at home." End quote. I add at once another passage of Hawkins' report which only half belongs here, but may be quoted here as well as anywhere else. Quote, Intemperance, excess, and want of providence are the chief faults of the factory population, and these evils may be readily traced to the habits which are formed under the present system, and almost inevitably arise from it. It is universally admitted that indigestion, hypochondria, and general debility affect this class to a very great extent. After twelve hours of monotonous toil, it is but natural to look about for a stimulant of one sort or another. But when the above-mentioned diseased conditions are added to the customary weariness, people will quickly and repeatedly take refuge in spirituous liquors." For all this testimony of the physicians and commissioners, the report itself offers hundreds of cases of proof. That the growth of young operatives is stunted by their work hundreds of statements testify. Among others, Cowell gives the way to forty-six youths of seventeen years of age, from one Sunday school, of whom twenty-six employed in mills, averaged one hundred and four point five pounds, and twenty not employed in mills, one hundred and seventeen point seven pounds. One of the largest manufacturers of Manchester, leader of the opposition against the working men, I think Robert Hyde Gregg himself said, on one occasion, that if things went on as at present, the operatives of Lancashire would soon be a race of pygmies. A recruiting officer testified that operatives are little adapted for military service, looked thin and nervous, and were frequently rejected by the surgeons as unfit. In Manchester he could hardly get men of five feet eight inches. They were usually only five feet six to seven, whereas in the agricultural districts most of the recruits were five feet eight. The men wear out very early in consequence of the conditions under which they live and work. Most of them are unfit for work at forty years, a few hold out to forty-five, almost none to fifty years of age. 
This is caused not only by the general enfeeblement of the frame, but also very often by a failure of the sight, which is a result of mule-spinning, in which the operative is obliged to fix his gaze upon a long row of fine, parallel threads, and so greatly to strain the sight. Of 1,600 operatives employed in several factories in Harper and Lanark, but ten were over 45 years of age. Of 22,094 operatives in diverse factories in Stockport and Manchester, but 143 were over 45 years old. Of these 143, 16 were retained as a special favour, and one was doing the work of a child. A list of 131 spinners contained but seven over 45 years, and yet the whole 131 were rejected by the manufacturers to whom they applied for work as too old, and were without means of support by reason of old age. Mr. Ashworth, a large manufacturer, admits in a letter to Lord Ashley that towards the fortieth year the spinners can no longer prepare the required quantity of yarn, and are therefore sometimes discharged. He calls operatives forty years of age old people. Commissioner Mackintosh expresses himself in the same way in the report of 1833. Quote, Although I was prepared for it from the way the children are employed, I still found it difficult to believe the statements of the older hands as to their ages. They age so very early. End quote. Surgeon Smelly of Glasgow, who treated operatives chiefly, says that forty years is old age for them. And similar evidence may be found elsewhere. In Manchester, this premature old age among the operatives is so universal that almost every man of forty would be taken for ten to fifteen years older, while the prosperous classes, men as well as women, preserve their appearance exceedingly well if they do not drink too heavily. The influence of factory work upon the female physique is also marked and peculiar. The deformities entailed by long hours of work are much more serious among women. Protracted work frequently causes deformities of the pelvis, partly in the shape of abnormal position and development of the hip bones, partly of malformation of the lower portion of the spinal column. Quote, Although, says Dr. Loudon in his report, no example of malformation of the pelvis and of some other affections came under my notice, these things are nevertheless so common that every physician must regard them as probable consequences of such working hours and as vouched for besides by men of the highest medical credibility." That factory operatives undergo more difficult confinement than other women is testified to by several midwives and accoucheurs, and also that they are more liable to miscarriage. Moreover, they suffer from the general enfeeblement common to all operatives, and when pregnant continue to work in the factory up to the hour of delivery, because otherwise they lose their wages and are made to fear that they may be replaced if they stop away too soon. It frequently happens that women are at work one evening and delivered the next morning, and the case is none too rare of their being delivered in the factory, among the machinery. And if the gentlemen of the bourgeoisie find nothing particularly shocking in this, their wives will perhaps admit that it is a piece of cruelty, an infamous act of barbarism, indirectly to force a pregnant woman to work twelve or thirteen hours daily, formerly still longer, up to the day of her delivery, in a standing position, with frequent stoopings. But this is not all. If these women are not obliged to resume work within two weeks, they are thankful and count themselves fortunate. Many come back to the factory after eight, and even after three to four days, to resume full work. I once heard a manufacturer ask an overlooker, quote, Is so-and-so not back yet? Quote, no. Quote, How long since she was confined? Quote, a week. Quote, she might surely have been back long ago. That one over there only stays three days. End quote. Naturally, fear of being discharged, dread of starvation, drives her to the factory in spite of her weakness, in defiance of her pain. The interest of the manufacturer will not brook that his employees stay at home by reason of illness. They must not be ill, they must not venture to lie still through a long confinement, or he must stop his machinery or trouble his supreme head with a temporary change of arrangements, 
and rather than do this he discharges his people when they begin to be ill. Listen. Quote, a girl feels very ill, can scarcely do her work. Why does she not ask permission to go home? Ah, the master is very particular, and if we are away half a day, we risk being sent away altogether. End quote. Or Sir D. Barry, quote, Thomas McDirt, workman, has slight fever, cannot stay at home longer than four days, because he would fear of losing his place. End quote. And so it goes on in almost all the factories. The employment of young girls produces all sorts of irregularities during the period of development. In some, especially those who are better fed, the heat of the factories hastens this process, so that in single cases girls of thirteen and fourteen are wholly mature. Robertson, whom I have already cited, mentioned in the Factories Inquiry Commission's report as the eminent gynecologist of Manchester, relates in the North of England Medical and Surgical Journal that he had seen a girl of eleven years who was not only a wholly developed woman, but pregnant, and that it was by no means rare in Manchester for women to be confined at fifteen years of age. In such cases the influence of the warmth of the factories is the same as that of a tropical climate, and as in such climates the abnormally early development revenges itself by correspondingly premature age and debility. On the other hand, retarded development of the female constitution occurs, the breasts mature late or not at all. Menstruation first appears in the seventeenth or eighteenth, sometimes in the twentieth year, and is often wholly wanting. Irregular menstruation, coupled with great pain and numerous affections, especially with anemia, is very frequent, as the medical reports unanimously state. Children of such mothers, particularly of those who are obliged to work during pregnancy, cannot be vigorous. They are, on the contrary, described in the report, especially in Manchester, as very feeble. And Barry alone asserts that they are healthy, but says further that in Scotland, where his inspection lay, almost no married women worked in factories. Moreover, most of the factories there are in the country, with the exception of Glasgow, a circumstance which contributes greatly to the invigoration of the children. The operative children in the neighbourhood of Manchester are nearly all thriving and rosy, while those within the city look pale and scrofulous. But with the ninth year the colour vanishes suddenly, because all are then sent into the factories, when it soon becomes impossible to distinguish the country from the city children. But besides all this, there are some branches of factory work which have an especially injurious effect. In many rooms of the cotton and flax spinning mills, the air is filled with fibrous dust, which produces chest affections, especially among workers in the carding and combing rooms. Some constitutions can bear it, some cannot. But the operative has no choice. He must take the room in which he finds work, whether his chest is sound or not. The most common effects of this breathing of dust are blood spitting, hard, noisy breathing, pains in the chest, coughs, sleeplessness, in short, all the symptoms of asthma ending in the worst cases in consumption. Especially unwholesome is the wet spinning of linen yarn which is carried on by young girls and boys. The water spurts over them from the spindle so that the front of their clothing is constantly wet through to the skin and there is always water standing on the floor. This is the case to a less degree in the doubling rooms of the cotton mills, and the result is a constant succession of colds and affections of the chest. A hoarse, rough voice is common to all operatives, but especially to wet spinners and doublers. Stewart, Mackintosh, and Sir D. Barry expressed themselves in the most vigorous terms as to the unwholesomeness of this work, and the small consideration shown by most of the manufacturers for the health of the girls who do it. Another effect of flax spinning is a peculiar deformity of the shoulder, especially a projection of the right shoulder blade, consequent upon the nature of the work. This sort of spinning, and the throstle spinning of cotton, frequently produce diseases of the knee-pan, which is used to check the spindle during the joining of broken threads. The frequent stooping and the bending to the low machines common to both these branches of work have in general a stunting effect upon the growth of the operative. 
in the throstle room of the cotton mill at manchester in which i was employed i do not remember to have seen one single tall well-built girl they were all short dumpy and badly formed decidedly ugly in the whole development of the figure but apart from all these diseases and malformations the limbs of the operatives suffer in still another way the work between the machinery gives rise to multitudes of accidents of more or less serious nature which have for the operative the secondary effect of unfitting him for his work more or less completely the most common accident is the squeezing off of a single joint of a finger somewhat less common the loss of the whole finger half or a whole hand an arm etc in the machinery lockjaw very often follows even upon the lesser among these injuries and brings death with it besides the deformed persons a great number of maimed ones may be seen going about in manchester this one has lost an arm or a part of one that one a foot the third half a leg it is like living in the midst of an army just returned from a campaign but the most dangerous portion of the machinery is the strapping which conveys motive power from the shaft to the separate machines especially if it contains buckles which however are rarely used now whoever is seized by the strap is carried up with lightning speed thrown against the ceiling above and floor below with such force that there is rarely a whole bone left in the body and death follows instantly between june twelfth and august third eighteen forty three the manchester guardian reported the following serious accidents the trifling ones it does not notice june twelfth a boy died in manchester of lockjaw caused by his hand being crushed between wheels june sixteenth a youth in saddleworth seized by a wheel and carried away with it died utterly mangled june twenty ninth a young man at greenacres moor near manchester at work in a machine shop fell under the grindstone which broke two of his ribs and lacerated him terribly july twenty fourth a girl in oldham died carried around fifty times by a strap no bone unbroken july twenty seventh a girl in manchester seized by the blower that is the first machine that receives the raw cotton and died of injuries received august third a bobbins turner died in dukenfield caught in a strap every rib broken in the year eighteen forty three the manchester infirmary treated nine hundred sixty two cases of wounds and mutilations caused by machinery while the number of all other accidents within the district of the hospital was two thousand four hundred twenty six so that for five accidents from all other causes two were caused by machinery the accidents which happen in salford are not included here nor are those treated by surgeons in private practice in such cases whether or not the accident unfits the victim for further work the employer at best pays the doctor or in very exceptional cases he may pay wages during treatment what becomes of the operative afterwards in case he cannot work is no concern of the employer the factory report says on this subject that employers must be made responsible for all cases since children cannot take care and adults will take care in their own interest but the gentlemen who write the report are bourgeois and so they must contradict themselves and bring up later all sorts of bosh on the subject of the culpable temerity of the operatives the state of the case is this if children cannot take care the employment of children must be forbidden if adults are reckless they must be mere overgrown children on a plane of intelligence which does not enable them to appreciate the danger in its full scope and who is to blame for this but the bourgeoisie which keeps them in a condition in which their intelligence cannot develop or the machinery is ill-arranged and must be surrounded with fencing to supply which falls to the share of the bourgeoisie or the operative is under inducements which outweigh the threatened danger he must work rapidly to earn his wages has no time to take care and for this too the bourgeoisie is to blame many accidents happen for instance while the operatives are cleaning machinery in motion why because the bourgeois would otherwise oblige the worker to clean the machinery during the free hours while it is not going and the worker naturally is not disposed to sacrifice any part of his free time 
every free hour is so precious to the worker that he often risks his life twice a week rather than sacrifice one of them to the bourgeois. Let the employer take from working hours the time required for cleaning the machinery, and it will never again occur to an operative to clean machinery in motion. In short, from whatever point of view, the blame falls ultimately on the manufacturer, and of him should be required at the very least lifelong support of the incapacitated operative, and support of the victim's family in case death follows the accident. In the earliest period of manufacture, the accidents were much more numerous in proportion than now, for the machinery was inferior, smaller, more crowded, and almost never fenced. But the number is still large enough, as the foregoing cases prove, to arouse grave question as to a state of things which permits so many deformities and mutilations for the benefit of a single class, and plunges so many industrious working people into want and starvation by reason of injuries undergone in the service and through the fault of the bourgeoisie. A pretty list of diseases engendered purely by the hateful money-greed of the manufacturers. Women made unfit for childbearing, children deformed, men enfeebled, limbs crushed, whole generations wrecked, afflicted with disease and infirmity, purely to fill the purses of the bourgeoisie. And when one reads of the barbarism of single cases, how children are seized naked in bed by the overlookers, and driven with blows and kicks to the factory, their clothing over their arms, how their sleepiness is driven off with blows, how they fall asleep over their work nevertheless, how one poor child sprang up still asleep at the call of the overlooker, and mechanically went through the operations of its work after its machine was stopped, when one reads how children, too tired to go home, hide away in the wool in the drawing-room to sleep there, and could only be driven out of the factory with straps, how many hundreds came home so tired every night that they could eat no supper for sleepiness and want of appetite, that their parents found them kneeling by the bedside where they had fallen asleep during their prayers, when one reads all this, and a hundred other villainies and infamies in this one report, all testified to on oath, confirmed by several witnesses, deposed by men whom the commissioners themselves declare trustworthy, when one reflects that this is a liberal report, a bourgeois report, made for the purpose of reversing the previous Tory report, and rehabilitating the pureness of heart of the manufacturers, that the commissioners themselves are on the side of the bourgeoisie, and report all these things against their own will, how can one be otherwise than filled with wrath and resentment against a class which boasts of philanthropy and self-sacrifice, while its own object is to fill its purse à tout prix? Meanwhile, let us listen to the bourgeoisie speaking through the mouth of its chosen apostle, Dr. Ur, who relates in his Philosophy of Manufacturers that the workers have been told that their wages bore no proportion to their sacrifices, the good understanding between masters and men being thus disturbed. Instead of this, the working men should have striven to recommend themselves by attention and industry, and should have rejoiced in the prosperity of their masters. They would then become overseers, superintendents, and finally partners, and would thus, O oh, wisdom, thou speakest as the dove, quote, have increased at the same time the demand for their companions' labor in the market. Quote, Had it not been for the violent collisions and interruptions resulting from erroneous views among the operatives, the factory system would have been developed still more rapidly and beneficially. End quote. Hereupon follows a long jeremiad upon the spirit of resistance of the operatives, and on the occasion of a strike of the best paid workers the fine spinners, the following naive observation, quote, In fact, it was their high wages which enabled them to maintain a stipendiary committee in affluence, and to pamper themselves into nervous ailments by a diet too rich and exciting for their indoor employments, end quote. Let us hear how the bourgeois describes the work of children, quote, I have visited many factories, both in Manchester and in the surrounding districts, during a period of several months, entering the spinning-rooms unexpectedly, and often alone, at different times of the day, and I never saw a single instance of corporal chastisement inflicted on a child. 
nor indeed did I ever see children in ill humour. They seemed to be always cheerful and alert, taking pleasure in the light play of their muscles, enjoying the mobility natural to their age. The scene of industry, so far from exciting sad emotions, in my mind, was always exhilarating. It was delightful to observe the nimbleness with which they pieced broken ends, as the mule carriage began to recede from the fixed roller beam, and to see them at leisure, after a few seconds' exercise of their tiny fingers, to amuse themselves in any attitude they chose, till the stretch and winding on were once more completed. The work of these lively elves seemed to resemble a sport, in which habit gave them a pleasing dexterity. Conscious of their skill, they were delighted to show it off to any stranger. As to exhaustion by the day's work, they evinced no trace of it on emerging from the mill in the evening, for they immediately began to skip about any neighboring playground, and to commence their little games with the same alacrity as boys issuing from a school." End quote naturally, as though the immediate movement of every muscle were not an urgent necessity for frames grown at once stiff and relaxed. But Ur should have waited to see whether this momentary excitement had not subsided after a couple of minutes. And besides, Ur could see this whole performance only in the afternoon, after five or six hours' work, but not in the evening. As to the health of the operatives, the bourgeois has the boundless impudence to cite the report of 1833, just quoted in a thousand places, as testimony for the excellent health of these people, to try to prove by detached and garbled quotations that no trace of scrofula can be found among them, and what is quite true, that the factory system frees them from all acute diseases, that they have every variety of chronic affection instead he naturally conceals. To explain the impudence with which our friend Ur palms off the grossest falsehoods upon the English public, it must be known that the report consists of three large folio volumes, which it never occurs to a well-fed English bourgeois to study through. Let us hear further how he expresses himself as to the Factory Act of 1834, passed by the liberal bourgeoisie and imposing only the most meagre limitations upon the manufacturers, as we shall see. This law, especially its compulsory education clause, he calls an absurd and despotic measure directed against the manufacturers, through which all children under twelve years of age have been thrown out of employment. And with what results? The children thus discharged from their light and useful occupation receive no education whatsoever. Cast out from the warm spinning-room into a cold world, they subsist only by begging and stealing, a life in sad contrast with their steadily improving condition in the factory and in Sunday school. Under the mask of philanthropy, this law intensifies the sufferings of the poor, and will greatly restrict the conscientious manufacturer in his useful work, if indeed it does not wholly stop him. End of chapter 6, part 2